Good morning. Thank you very much uh, for having me. Turn on your mic oh. and speak into it. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and um, thank you for the opportunity to talk about our program. And um, uh, Mr. Uh, Markill has given me a detailed list of questions, so I have tried to address all of them. Uh, if you have questions or comments during the course of this presentation, please feel free to ask, and I'll try to answer them as best I can. I have tried to make this presentation as uh, interesting and informative as I could, so I hope that you will find it to be the case. So I titled it Everything You Wanted to Know About the Lawyer Assistance Program, but we're always afraid to ask, and I hope that won't be the case, at least during this presentation. So, I'm gonna focus. <clears throat> so I will be talking about, in broad outline form, uh, what is mental illness, why it's relevant to you in your particular work, why it's so important for the state bar to address these particular issues, I'll be talking about the LAP function itself, and I'll be talking about attorney impairment and the types of impairment that we typically see with law students and then with attorneys. So uh, I don't have the time to cover everything, but I've tried to address the most pertinent and the most likely scenarios that we encounter and what we think you encounter as well. Uh, so just a very, very brief uh, background. <clears throat> When we're talking about mental illness and we're talking about functions, we're really talking about the brain. And the brain is essentially what you are as an individual, what you are as a person. And it's this three pound organ that is immensely complex and is also immensely sensitive to various kinds of things that can affect it, such as substance abuse, which we'll be talking about in just a little bit. And essentially it is everything that you are. It's um, uh, who you are as a person, it's understanding music, it's your ability to see colors, uh, getting a, uh, a job, all those things, what makes you uh, is really that part of the brain. And a lot of the times people make decisions that they often are not aware of. And I wanted to give uh, a very quick example and hopefully this will set us up. <clears throat> This is an awareness test. <clears throat> How many passes does the team in white make? Please watch. The answer is 13. How do you got that right? Okay, very good, okay. Did you see the moonwalking bear? <laughs> How many people saw the moonwalking bear by show of hands? Okay, oh, we got a couple of people. Excellent, okay. Uh, that's, that's very good. That's, uh, uh, in fact, everyone saw the moon walking there, but not everyone was aware of it because your attention was very much focused on the task at hand. So I give that as a very quick illustration of how uh, easy it is to sometimes miss what is in front of you and uh, to be aware of all the things that uh, can occur when you're not paying attention or you're focusing on something very, very quickly. And also to really demonstrate how that unconscious process works. Okay. Uh, I just want to give another quick example. Uh, this is a great study. By the way, all the studies I'm citing today are real and I'm not making anything up. Uh, this is a great study that was done. Uh, they wanted to take a look at people that um, do job selection. And it turns out, if your name is Dennis or Denise, you are statistically more likely to become a dentist. <laughs> and uh, you can actually check this out for yourself. If you have any free time, you can go to any board in any state and see what the names are. And you will see there is a statistical effect for people who are Dennis and Denise. And of course, if you ask them, 
uh, dentist of the who became a dentist. Why did you become a dentist? And they'll give you a narrative about they like teeth and they like working with teeth. Uh, and none of them will say it's because of my name. But there is an inherent kind of component to it that people select for this kind of thing. So that's a, or just a quick fun illustration of how these things work. Okay, so um, when we're talking about mental illness, and uh, I've been given a list of questions about it, the way we look at and how we determine whether somebody is mentally ill is using the DSM-5. The DSM-5 is a diagnostic and statistic manual that all psychologists and psychiatrists use in order to determine whether or not someone has a mental illness. All of the elements that are listed have to be included. What does it mean? When we're looking at mental syndrome, so it's a clinically significant disturbance in cognition, emotion, uh, uh, regulation, or behavior that reflects dysfunction in either psychological, biological, or developmental processes. What does that uh, really mean? It means that a person is experiencing a cluster of symptoms that are listed in for the various disorders. And I'll give an example of that just a little bit later. The other component is, even if the person is exhibiting these kinds of symptoms, it doesn't necessarily mean that the person can be diagnosed with a particular mental illness or substance use. There also has to be a very important secondary component, which has to do with impairment and distress. In other words, the symptoms have to rise to the level where you can demonstrate clinically significant distress. So there's an impairment in actual functioning that occurs. And of course, there is a proviso in the DSM that talks about um, uh, behavior which is political, religious, and sexual, and so forth, the conflicts between individual and society. Those are not mental disorders, so we want to be very careful that we take in contextual cultural factors. Uh, for example, in certain populations, uh, it is quite common to speak with the dead or to commune with the dead. That's not a mental illness. That's really a cultural phenomenon. So we have to be very careful when we're assessing people that we address those cultural uh, factors that are present and not to pathologize them. The way I remember is this this, uh, this character. If you've, ever, if you've not seen this cartoon, it's really great to remember. It's uh, That character name is Syndrome. So if you're thinking about how do you remember a cluster of symptoms, this is how I do it. I just remember that cartoon character. OK, so why is this particularly relevant to the function that we serve and, of course, the very, very important function that, that you serve? Um, it has been demonstrated fairly consistently now over time that lawyers as a group are more unhappy, they are depressed, unhealthy, and generally score lower on well-being than other professional groups. Uh, that includes a number of robust studies at this point that includes other professions as well. And it's pretty uh, statistically significant. And the other, of course, important correlation and the reason that your function is so, so important is that the majority of disciplinary problems and malpractice complaints have to do with attorney impairment, that is substance abuse and or mental health treatment that goes untreated. And in most cases that we've seen where people are coming in, the disciplinary issue related is this underlying substance abuse and or mental health issue. At the LAP, generally our statistics break down into three categories. We have people that are coming in for straight substance use disorders. We have people coming in for straight mental health disorders, such as depression, anxiety, uh, other times more serious illnesses. People are coming in for mood disorders, such as bipolar illness, or a person alternates between manic phases and depressive phases. And those are coming in for both. So there is approximately one third of the people that are coming in, and this includes uh, law students, and those that are referred by the Committee of Bar Examiners to us, where people are coming in with a substance use disorder, that is that they have alcohol issues or drug issues, in addition to another mental illness, such as depression or bipolar illness. So people are coming in who uh, do require extensive uh, treatment and monitoring and support. Uh, this is a study that was taken from a bunch of insurance carriers who end up paying out large sums of money, and they keep track of when they have to do that. And 40 to 70 percent discipline cases, 80 percent of client protection fund cases, and malpractice actions have to do with substance abuse and/or mental health treatment. So, what is it about attorneys that makes us a little different? And there is, there are some differences between attorneys that work in this profession and other professional groups. 
So I've got this letter, this is a form letter that actually uh, is sent out, um, this is one of our complaint analysts. I'm not sure it's sent out right now, at least when I got this letter, they were still sending this out. And oftentimes when a complaint is made about an attorney, one of the issues is communication. That is, the problem has a difficulty with returning phone calls or not responding appropriately. So this is an actual letter that was sent out, and I thought it was kind of quite interesting. So uh, this is a response to a particular complaint where, dear Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so, we have reviewed your complaint, and you have alleged, and then we put in a description of a particular conduct that's causing the issue. And then, all the state bar does not condone this conduct you've described. We are unable to prosecute, even if it's questionable. And there's a actual provision, uh, in, and there's a, a court case on this issue, where they're talking about that we cannot discipline attorneys for the mere offensive personality, which is kind of interesting. Uh, what, what does that actually mean? So I took the uh, liberty of looking at the court case, and uh, this is the Supreme Court decision language about it. Uh, and uh, it was actually in the California Business and Professions Code at one time before it was amended. And it says, clearly offensive personality is an unconscionably vague term. It could refer to any number of behaviors that many attorneys regularly engage in during the course of their zealous representation of their clients. So this was removed because uh, nobody could live up to this particular standard, so now it's amended. But what is it about attorneys that makes us different? And there's actually research about this. Um, and it really starts with law school. So this, this is a real article, and uh, the title is Neuroscience Reveals How Brain Cells Die from Law School Stress and How Neural Self-Hacking Can Optimize Cognitive Performance. This is a real article. And this is a real issue. So um, she did this really great, very elegant study by taking a number of law students, and she, said, she looked at uh, when they enter law school and when they leave law school. So depression among law students is 8 or 9% prior to matriculation, 27% after one semester, 34% after two semesters, and 40% after three years. So that's a very, very high number. Stress among law students is 96% compared to 70% in medical students and 43% in graduate students. And then entering law school, law students have a psychological profile similar to that of the general public. And after law school, people report 20-40% psychological dysfunction. So clearly, there is something that is happening there. Mm -hmm. um, and we know that the role of stress, uh, there are a number of articles about this as well. This is from uh, a study that was done in San Francisco, that stressful events, including what you encounter in law school, profoundly influences the use of alcohol and drugs. So it's a contributor, an initiator, and a something that is continuing to influence whether or not people use substance abuse, and also, of course, contributing to relapse. <laughs> so there is um, a study that uh, happened in, in 1990, and it was done by Dr. Seligman. He is a uh, very famous psychologist. You may have heard of him because uh, he developed this idea of learned helplessness. Has anybody heard the term learned helplessness? OK, I see some nodding people there. Um, so. Um, what he did was he developed this theory that's currently applied in, in legal practice, for example, to explain why battered spouses do not leave an abusive relationship. And this idea that people can learn to be helpless when they're exposed to negative consequences over a period of time. So he did all this research, and he was sitting in front of the computer one day, and he said, there's so much work about depression, anxiety, substance abuse, and there's very little about what makes people happy. So he's actually the founder of positive psychology movement. And he said, you know what, I'm going to study law students. And that's what, exactly what he did. So he went to the Virginia Law School, and he tested people on a variety of characters. And the only finding that was statistically significant is that law students tend to be pessimistic, much more so than any other professional demographic group. So he tested the other uh, graduate students, and then the only ones that came across were optimistic and uh, uh, an optimistic pessimism test. And law students came across to be more pessimistic. And if you think about it, it sort of intuitively makes sense. Because in law school, where you're always taught, look at the worst case scenario, right? You're always thinking, what is the worst case scenario? And interestingly, he found that the more pessimistic you are, the better you did in law school. And uh, the, the higher you scored on a pessimism range, the traditional measures such as grade point average and law journal success, you actually did much better than the optimistic lawyers. Although this is not true when people graduate. 
There was a corollary to that. Hostile cynical law students were four times more likely to die prematurely as cardiovascular. <laughs> so there, there is a strong negative correlation of remaining uh, cynical and pessimistic after you graduate from law school. Uh, we don't have time to go into it, but there is a couple of studies now that really indicate that optimistic lawyers not only do much more successfully in life, but also in their professional practice. Uh, in fact, there's one study that uh, showed that optimistic lawyers end up making more money over the course of their career than their other colleagues. So there is a, a great benefit that's reversed after people graduate law school. This is a study that was done with uh, Yale Law School, and uh, it just shows the significance of the problem. Students described a range of symptoms and conditions. The most common were severe anxiety, depression, and panic attacks, and recurrent insomnia. Some of the students came in with uh, bipolar disorder and depression with suicidal uh, ideation. Because the worst case scenario when these things go untreated is the person ends up taking their own life. And I will talk about that in just a little bit. So you can see the breakdown in 1L, 2L, and 3Ls in law school. Uh, this is a study that came out with uh, Yale Law School and the publication of the Mental Health Alliance. So this is from December 2014. And um, women, actually, which was a very interesting finding, were more likely than men to face mental health challenges. They had bigger problems in law school. However, they were more likely to seek treatment, which is a very, very positive indicator. I think for some reason, uh, women felt more comfortable coming in and asking for help, whereas male law students had that kind of, no, I'm going to handle it by myself kind of mentality. And that is something we're trying very hard to breach when we do outreach, and now we have uh, new leadership and new direction, we're trying to really go out to the law schools and to really educate them about these various issues so that we can address them early on. And the state bar, through the Lawyer Assistance Program, really has an opportunity to help law students uh, transition into becoming effective lawyers. And the programs that we have to offer are now being geared specifically to addressing concerns of law students. Um, as, a, as early as um, really the beginning of this year when the statute uh, was changed in order to help us work with uh, law students. So this is again from the study, about 80% of students who were experiencing mental health challenges considered seeking treatment, but only 50% of this group ultimately did so. So there is a tremendous amount of stigma that is still very much attached to seeking and obtaining mental health services. The American Bar Association had actually put together this mental health toolkit, which I'm going to pass around. Uh, and um, it's for law school students and those who care about them. So this encompasses a great deal of information about substance abuse, mental health treatment, uh, signs and symptoms, and what people can do in order to get help. Uh, if you'd like a copy of this, I'm more than happy to forward it to you. At the end, I will email this to anybody who is interested in this. So I'm just going to pass it around so you can see it. 20% of students who experience mental health challenges decided not to seek treatment. And this is only particular to Yale, but my suspicion that it's going to be generally acceptable throughout the various law schools. Um, the uh, issue was quality of service, uh, excessive wait times, and confidentiality policies. So people, of course, were very much concerned how this is going to affect their future <coughs> licensing, what's going to be reported, and if they are going to be treated differently as a result of reporting, excuse me, to their administration, the fact that they do have a substance abuse or a mental health issue that requires treatment. Uh, an additional 10% tried but were unable to seek uh, treatment for a number of reasons. Um, and then uh, the two groups, it was 30% at Yale Law School, who experienced mental health challenges but were falling through the, cra uh, through the cra uh, cracks and were not able to get the help they needed. <clears throat> Um, this is again from a 2040 survey of law school uh, student well-being. This is throughout the country. This is not just Yale. So 89.6% of respondents have a drink of alcohol in the last 30 days. 21 reported binge drinking at least twice in the past two weeks. And 20.4 thought seriously about suicide sometimes in their life. So there's clearly a very significant proportion of law students throughout this country and certainly within the state that require treatment and intervention and um, uh, are being underserved at this particular point. 
Uh, again, 56% uh, responded uh, in the survey that their mental health needs have impaired in social relationships, their academic performance, their clerkship search process, their job and internship process, and uh, their other pre-professional activities. So it's, again, quite a very high number. This is uh, an example. Uh, this happened in San Francisco just last year. Uh, this is a student who had taken his own life after he had actually failed the bar exam. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, another law student who had taken his own life. This is from Harvard. And there's actually a website now devoted to this issue because it is quite serious. And I'm going to show that to you. Uh, this is Dave Nee Foundation. And uh, this is a website and a foundation that is devoted solely to the uh, mental health needs of law students. Uh, this is um, the parents of this law student who had taken his own life. They started this uh, organization in order to promote and educate people in the community about these issues. So people go onto this website, they can see um, depression, they can see helpful tips, there are sources in there, so there's lots of helpful information for law students. Um, so there's uh, some creative ways of uh, dealing with stresses. Uh, this is Josie. Uh, he is a uh, library therapy dog. This is from Yale. So if you are in Yale Law School, you can actually check him out for 30 minutes, uh, only during the finals uh, and uh, during midterms. And you have to return him back because he is a library dog. And then the other students can check him out. So this is a kind of an upcoming trend about how to address the stress levels with law school students, in addition to, of course, expanding law school programs through related to mental health issues. Uh, this is a kind of creative way of doing that. It's become quite popular. Uh, this is Barbell. That's the name of the dog, is Barbell. And uh, so this one also at Capital University Law School, where the dog can be checked out by students. And we know that pets reduce people's blood pressure, and they make them feel better, and of course, reduce overall stress. So that's kind of a creative way of addressing these uh, very, very serious issues. Um, when we're talking about substance abuse, I really recommend this book. Uh, it is written by Brian Cuban. You can uh, buy it or download it uh, from Amazon if you like. It's a great airplane reading for those of you who travel a lot. Uh, it is written by the brother of uh, Mark Cuban, who we might know from um, uh, Shark Tank. And uh, if you watch that show, I watch that show. Too much information. And um, uh, but he is Brian Cuban. He is a very he was a very uh, high powered attorney. And uh, he actually had a number of very negative consequences in his life as a result of untreated substance abuse and mental health issues. So he wrote this book from a first person perspective. It is really written very well. It's a great read and I recommend it from, if you really want to see what that looks like from the inside. What is substance abuse? And I've been asked to specifically address this issue in some detail. So we know it's a disease of the brain, it is chronic, uh, it is progressive, and it's potentially and oftentimes fatal. In the 13 years or so that I have worked with attorneys in the Lawyer Assistance Program, uh, approximately nine lawyers in the course of working with us have lost their lives. And some of the, some of the illnesses I had uh, were there as a result of substance abuse and the health consequences that resulted from untreated substance abuse. So it's quite, quite serious. And the idea of trying to work, of course, with law students is that we're trying to address these risk factors early on so that not only are people able to uh, practice law successfully, but they avoid those underlying issues that ultimately lead to disciplinary issues or malpractice complaints. It is chronic, meaning it is continuous. Uh, it's progressive. It gets worse without treatment. And in the worst case scenario, uh, the person has very, very serious uh, psychological and health consequences. How do you know that a person has substance abuse? Uh, oftentimes, people think it is the amount that the person drinks or the frequency that the person drinks. And that's not necessarily the case, although it's part of it. And I'll give you the exact uh, DSM definition in just a minute. What is really telling about whether or not a person has a substance use problem is by the negative consequences that the drug or the substance abuse has in that person's life. In other words, you have recurrent social, interpersonal, psychological problems that continue, and the person is aware that the substance abuse is causing those kinds of problems, but continues to use that substance despite the negative consequences. 
that is really the hallmark of addiction and the hallmark of substance use, where you know that the drug or alcohol is destroying some part of your life or some function of your life, but you continue to use that substance despite the negative consequences. And for example, um, oftentimes we see individuals who have a DUI, one DUI, or a second DUI, and they continue to use the alcohol or substance abuse despite having multiple negative consequences. That's something that needs to be closely looked at and evaluated. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, this is very small. Um, and again, I will have uh, a copy of those PowerPoints for everyone uh, who would like it so you can look at it in more detail and ask any questions you have uh, at any point as well. So, this is for stimulant use disorder, but the criteria are essentially the same uh, regardless of which substance. So, whether it's opioid or alcohol use, so um, the stimulant or the alcohol is clinically significant impairment or distress, and the diagnosis has to be within 12 months in order to be rendered uh, relevant. So a person could have past diagnosis more than 12 months, but for our purposes, when we're looking at LAP, we're really looking what is the drinking or use pattern of the individual within the 12 months prior to which they came to see us. So the stimulant is taken or the alcohol is taken larger amounts, there's a persistent effort to cut down, which is unsuccessful. There's craving. There's a great deal of time that's spent in pursuing these activities. There's a failure in major role obligations, either at work, school, or home. When the problems become a little bit more severe, what we typically see with law students is the inability to complete assignments. Sometimes they're placed in academic probation. Uh, other times they have disciplinary issues within the school itself. Uh, those kinds of issues start to surface when substance abuse is an issue or mental health that's an issue that's not being properly addressed. That's when we typically start to see it. They're unable to complete assignments, so they have other kinds of problems. Um, there's, if they're working, they're unable to uh, continue that job or not be successful at it. And again, stimulant use is continued despite uh, knowledge of having persistent or recurring physical or psychological problems. Oftentimes, when law students come to us, they know the negative effects of alcohol use or substance use. And what we're seeing more frequently now, uh, even more so than alcohol, is cocaine and meth. Now, methamphetamine in particular is making a resurgence in the law school population. And that is a very, very serious and highly potent and addictive drug. So people will know that they're unable to meet certain legal or uh, school obligations, but continue using that substance. And it often begins uh, as a very uh, sporadic use, but without treatment, people that become addicted start to increase it over time, and then at the end, when they come to see us, uh, they will report daily use of that substance. Okay, so that's the, I'm not gonna go through the entire list, uh, but it is available, uh, and I will be happy to give you a, a full uh, list on the PowerPoints. This is a very, very quick primer so that you are um, aware of how basically it works. Uh, and all drugs work exactly on the same basic principle, whether it's a stimulant or uh, opioid or alcohol. The brain works uh, by releasing a neurotransmitter, which is associated with different kinds of behavior. The one that drugs particularly affect is called dopamine. Dopamine is released when people are doing things that they enjoy. For example, um, playing sports, or reading, or taking a walk, anything that people enjoy doing. Um, people will, uh, the neurochemical that is released in the brain is called dopamine. When a person takes a drug, any drug, uh, this is done with, uh, this is an example of rats, for example, the dopamine level spikes up. And what happens is, whether it's cocaine, meth, alcohol, or heroin, uh, the dopamine is flooding the brain. What does that mean? It means that the uh, receptors that um, take in the dopamine take in much more that is normally associated with everyday activity. And the drug sabotages that reward system in the nucleus accumbens and ventral tegmental area of the brain, which is in the, uh, the central part of the brain, and the person is no longer able to obtain the same levels of dopamine or pleasure from everyday activities, which is what makes this particularly hard to break, because now the drug is supplying that sense of pleasure or euphoria, and the person is no longer able to obtain that from everyday activities. From some of the drugs, the challenge is that the damage becomes permanent. 
And uh, the dopamine receptors, especially with prolonged methamphetamine abuse, for example, do not get replaced. So the actual amount of dopamine that is able to be released naturally in the brain is damaged and is not replaceable. So prolonged use of many of these substances uh, at this time are not reversible. We're not aware of a mechanism that allows for it. On the other hand, many other ones are. Uh, alcohol and cocaine in particular, because the half-life of those substances is very short, uh, the damage is less than, for example, with meth. Uh, so because dopamine role in weighing the costs and benefits of decisions, uh, it can lead to other kinds of negative behaviors. So sometimes a law student will come in with a substance use disorder and then another co-occurring disorder, for example, gambling or overeating because of this deregulation of dopamine receptors that is directly related to the substance use. So it becomes, again, quite, quite serious. The same thing, of course, with alcohol and drinking alcohol leads to the release of endorphins in the area of the brain that produce feelings of pleasure and reward, and that's the study from San Francisco. Who has a drinking problem? So this was the study that was done in 2016, and the amazing and interesting fact is that we have always suspected, and the previous research has really demonstrated, that it seemed to be that older attorneys have the more significant problems with substance abuse and or mental health issues. But in fact, the newer research points in the exactly opposite conclusion, which is the younger attorneys, the first years and law students, seem to have this problem much more so than the older ones. So if you're seeing a clerk and paralegal and the junior associate has the highest level of reported alcohol problems. So 20% of lawyers and judges surveyed reported problematic alcohol use and 28% of responding lawyers experience symptoms of depression. So the number is quite high. And you can see the senior partner is actually less than the junior associate, which is the younger lawyer in this case. This is a study that was published in The Lancet, uh, which is a British medical journal. And they really wanted to take a look at what kind of harm do various substances cause to the individual and to the people around him or her. So they looked at uh, psychological, social, physical, and physical and psychological issues to other people around them. And this is what they found, and it was quite startling to me. The number one substance that caused the highest amount of harm to the individual and to the people around them was alcohol, by far. More so than heroin, than crack cocaine, meth. Uh, these are all the various substances that were studied that people abuse. Um, there is um, amphetamines, tobacco, of course, is listed there. Cannabis is listed there. Uh, ketamine, which is a horse tranquilizer. People do abuse that. Uh, butane, uh, it is a liquid that is found in lighter fluid. Uh, and then, of course, uh, LSD and perfumine and uh, cotton and so forth are listed there as well. Uh, what seems to cause uh, uh, very little harm to others is shrooms. <laughs> so I don't know why that's, uh, that might be a statistical anomaly, but it's not quite clear. <laughs> um, so how does the alcohol affect the body? Uh, we're looking at, and uh, those of you that are in Los Angeles, I think it's still on display. If you have the opportunity, uh, and maybe coming to your city as well, uh, at the Science Center, they have uh, the exhibit the bodies. Has anybody seen that? Uh, it's really amazing. It's a little bit disturbing, but it's very informative. And uh, what they did is that they did dissection of the various parts, and they talk about the central nervous system, they talk about uh, uh, the uh, breathing system, the skin, and so forth, and it gives a very, very clear visual depiction of what happens when a person abuses substances uh, over a period of time. So it's a very clear dissection that you can really see. Again, it's disturbing, but very informative. So you can see, uh, here's an example from stages of alcohol-induced liver damage over a period of time. And uh, the other thing, which I'll, I'll show in just a minute, is that there are health consequences to the use of alcohol in just about every part of the body. So we're talking about, of course, alcohol is a depressant. So people that have depression and they try to self-medicate with alcohol are actually making their situation much, much worse over a period of time. Um, so we're talking about um, damage to the heart, um, and of course now it is linked to cancer very strongly. So this is right from uh, 2017. This is a statement American Society for Clinical Oncology. They have now listed alcohol as an actual carcinogen. 
because it has been linked to cancer very, uh, very directly, and even at moderate levels. So there's a risk that's associated now even with moderate levels of consumption of alcohol. In other words, there's no safe thing. I know in California they always print those labels everywhere you go, the chemicals uh, in this uh, airplane, the chemicals in this uh, hotel have known to be cause cancer, uh, but now it's directly linked to uh, drinking. And of course, excessive drinking includes binge drinking, uh, which is uh, uh, defined as consumption of four or more drinks in a single location for women, or five or more drinks during a single location for men. So now uh, it's a very clear research that really demonstrates even with moderate uh, or low levels of alcohol consumption, there is some risk with uh, cancer. Um, this is just an example of how prevalent it has become and maybe one of the reasons why alcohol is such a damaging substance. You can purchase this. Uh, this is just whipping cream. Uh, you would put that on a cake. It is 33% proof. Uh, you can buy that in the store. Uh, adult chocolate milk, I don't know if you've seen that, but that's 70% vodka. It's very <laughs> popular with college students uh, and with law school students. I don't know why they call it um, uh, chocolate milk, because it's really just vodka, 70% um, vodka. And that's a uh, margarita recipe with tequila. Uh, I did find one uh, positive aspect of alcohol, less than one accuses me of being anti-drinking. <clears throat> uh, there is one study that was uh, recently published in 2017. For those of you, if you are bilingual, uh, it does improve your ability to speak a second language with a low <laughs> dose of alcohol. However, the proviso is a low dose of alcohol, and if you drink more than that, then a slight advantage that you get disappears. <clears throat> so, um, what does it look like in law students? So, what we look for in the LDP, and I'll give you an example of that. <clears throat> so, the question is asked, what do we look at? Uh, so this is a sort of a streamlined um, format for looking at different problems. And again, I'll have this available for anybody who would like a copy. It's going to pass it around. So we look for patterns of use that produce negative consequences. You regularly use alcohol to cope with something. And that is a big giveaway. When a person uses a substance, not in, in a social setting, but in order to cope with a bigger problem. So with frustration, anxiety, depression, stress, uh, the person starts to drink. The pattern that we see with law students is, of course, there is a kind of a drinking culture on campus. And then um, they call it bar review. Uh, and of course, they go to the bar instead. It's not really bar review. I, they had it when I was in law school. And uh, of course, there's a strong component of alcohol use in law schools. But then that person no longer uses alcohol in a social setting. They transition from social use to problematic use, and they use it to cope. For example, law students report, I need it in order to go to sleep, for example. That is a big giveaway. Or I need it in order to function. That's another big giveaway. Um, you regularly use alcohol to feel confident. Uh, your drinking affects relationship with other people. Um, you stop doing other things and spend more time in alcohol use. You carry on drinking, and that's the big one. Excuse me. Um, when other things become less important and the alcohol or substance abuse becomes more important in your life, and then you start hiding that from your friends and family, and then the alcohol or substance abuse makes you feel depressed, angry, suicidal, but you carry on despite having those kind of problems. In later stages, we see, of course, the more severe negative consequences where people report memory lapses, uh, they report blackouts, um, and then they have consequences. So drunken and disorderly um, issues, uh, people getting into bar fights, and uh, not surprisingly, a lot of it is associated with sporting events of various kinds. So uh, we oftentimes hear, but it only happened when this or that team was playing, and I don't know anything about any kind of sport of any kind. So they will say some team or some um, ball game of some kind, and then they will say, but it's only during the Super Bowl or the Hyper Bowl or some other bowl, and then, and then uh, they will report drinking as a result of that. And then uh, in the worst case scenario, they'll have a DUI that's associated with it as well. 
Um, the scope of the problem is, uh, as I mentioned before, 10% of adults suffer alcohol abuse, 18% of lawyers, and then 25% of lawyers practice in more than 20 years. So 10 to 20% of legal professionals will deal with addictive disorder during their career. So it is quite a serious statistic, and we often feel that the number of attorneys that experience these kinds of problems, as well as law students, are not coming forward in order to address these issues for a number of reasons. Um, and again, this is, um, this is a study that was done with cocaine, and um, uh, the knowledge that some neural changes with addiction persist despite long periods of abstinence because uh, it is really a frightening statistic. In other words, that people that use alcohol or substance abuse will experience profound, profound neurological changes that will not get better. In other words, they will have to deal with the consequences of that uh, potentially for the rest of their life. So the earlier we can get to people, the earlier we can address these issues, and the important function that all of you serve in addressing the concerns of attorneys and law students that have these issues and getting them the help that they need, the more likelihood that they will have a positive and successful outcome. Uh, I was asked to, um, one of the questions I was asked is, um, what is a typical treatment program and how it is determined? So the uh, Society for Addiction Physicians have a continuing uh, level of care. So I just want to uh, briefly mention it because I can really go in this, uh, I can just talk about this for about an hour. And what it really looks at is when a person comes in with a substance use disorder and or a mental health issue, the first um, process in the LAP is after we evaluate the, and the diagnostic issues that are involved with the individual is selecting the proper level of care. So when you refer a person to us, when you refer someone either for an evaluation or you give them an abeyance period, the process is the same. So they will meet with one of our case managers. Everyone in the LAP is a, who works with, um, with the students or with lawyers are licensed professionals. So I am licensed as a psychologist. Um, the rest are licensed as licensed clinical social workers. So everybody has extensive um, training, education, and experience in diagnosing and treating people that have substance abuse and or mental health problems. LAP is not a treatment program, and that's something we emphasize very clearly at the front end so people are not confused about this. And we actually put that in all of the documents that they sign, meaning that we provide a structured program of recovery, and we provide an assessment that allows that person to reach that recovery level and to prevent relapse. But we ourselves do not provide any kind of treatment. So we don't treat any underlying disorder and condition. And before anybody walks out of our office or cubicle, uh, they know that the individual, that we are not providing the actual treatment, and we refer those to outside providers. So the uh, level of care is very basically divided into early intervention. So these are people that can be treated safely in the community. So at the lowest level, can the person maintain stability and sobriety? So can the law student or the um, law school applicant or the uh, bar applicant, can they maintain stability and sobriety at the community level? So we will provide drug um, counseling, uh, the LEP group, which I'll mention in just a minute, but we will also put them on random laboratory drug testing. How that works is every person that we suspect has a substance use issue, if we even suspect that, we will put them on random drug testing, which means that every single day they have to call in. They can do this on the phone, they can download an app, or they can check on the computer. And every day they will receive information of whether or not they're required to test that day. And if they do, then they have to go and uh, test. So that is a requirement. And we get those lab results, and then uh, we uh, evaluate what is happening when we get a positive sample. Sometimes the, uh, the testing is observed. Uh, we've had unusual results, sometimes from non-human um, assessment that has happened. Uh, sometimes the urine that is submitted is not at the temperature of a human being. That has also happened. In those cases where we suspect there might be an issue, we require that it's observed, but not as a general rule. The next is outpatient, so a person that needs a lot more structure and they're unable to maintain stability and sobriety, so then they will participate in intensive outpatient treatment, which means that three or four times a week they will go to a facility, they will have individual counseling, they will have um, also structured groups, 
and then they will be involved in our LAP group as well and random drug testing. So it's quite extensive. Uh, and then in the more severe cases, there is hospitalization required. So sometimes people will come in at the very, very severe stages of alcohol or substance use in which they require medical detox. So we tell them under those circumstances, you actually can't stop drinking because of the level of addiction that could cause severe impairment, which means, and we've had to do this on a number of occasions, where you have to go to a hospital now. Uh, you have to actually go and we'll help facilitate that process. If they have insurance, that's great. Uh, if they don't, we'll try to find an alternative, but they need to have medically supervised detox so that they can be free of the toxic substances because they're unable to do that. And then so there's medically uh, monitored intensive inpatient services, uh, or if it's not that severe, it's still inpatient for 30 days or for 90 days or for 120 days in order to receive the treatment thing that, is, that they require. Afterwards, there's aftercare where they are treated in a community. For example, they will reside in a sober living facility. This is a place where um, it's usually divided by gender, so we don't mix the genders in those communities, but it's in the community and they live in this house and then they're drug, randomly drug tested there as well. And then they have groups, self-help groups, as well as individual and group counseling as well for the addiction. So it's a very comprehensive process and the level of care is determined where the person comes in at the time that we see them. Is there any questions about that? Okay. Uh, so what are the signs and symptoms of substance abuse? Uh, it's, uh, for the lawyer, it's interfering with clients. Uh, it's um, failing to get the work done, feeling of being alone, memory loss. It's necessary before meetings of court appearances, uh, increasing quantity. Any uh, answer to any one of those questions indicates a potential problem. So I was asked to, what kind of questions are helpful to ask? Uh, so this is a list. Um, so uh, you guys will have a copy of that, and you can utilize it uh, as you see fit. The other big issue which I want to cover very, very briefly is the most frequent, other than substance abuse, that we see is depression. Uh, what is depression? It's illness that involves the body, the mind, and the thoughts. Um, and I want to differentiate that from just feeling sad. Uh, and everyday common misery, well, that's okay. That's what we live with. That is not depression. Depression is for a six-week time period where you are unable to recover and you experience profound changes in how you think about yourself, how you think of other people, and these are the signs. It is not something to be ashamed of, it's not a sign of weakness, and it's not something you can oftentimes help by yourself. It requires professional treatment and intervention. What it looks like is uh, procrastination. That is a big hallmark, what we see with um, a community bartender and applicants. Procrastination, people are not turning in things on time. Uh, lower productivity, missing deadlines, difficulty concentrating and in case stagnation and neglect. Uh, when it's untreated, uh, they are three times more likely uh, to experience depression. And of course, the worst case scenario, which I talked about earlier, is that suicide rate among male lawyers is double that of the general population. Uh, this is how a lawyer described depression. Instead of eight hours of sleep, I was only able to get by at six and then five and four. The next thing to go were my hobbies. I didn't have time for reading. So I stopped reading for fun. I didn't have time to take off from work, so I stopped taking vacations, stopped socializing. He went through a divorce, loss of his family, and then the only thing that kept him going was being successful. Being successful, that's that kind of driven attitude. And then finally, he had nothing left to give, and he crashed and burned. Uh, the concerns are, uh, this is again from that study in 2016, uh, out of the 11,000 plus participants, um, who completed the questionnaire, the most mental common health concerns over the course of their entire career was anxiety, uh, depression, social anxiety, panic disorder, and bipolar disorder. Fortunately, the more severe illness is in small percentage, but anxiety and depression is really quite high in the legal population. So what does it look like? Um, when you find that the individual is eating more or less than normal, low energy or fatigue, excessive crying, decreased uh, activities that you people enjoy, self-critical thoughts. So by themselves, any one of these are not necessarily indicative of depression, but when you have that combination of syndrome, that is something to look for and something that needs to be evaluated and looked upon. And I want to emphasize the fact that uh, oftentimes people are coming in uh, as a referral to us that have substance use disorder, and it is quite, quite serious. But I don't want to diminish the fact that untreated mental health, such as depression and anxiety, 
are equally, equally damaging to the individual as well, not just substance use. Um, and then, of course, those are the factors for risk of suicide. Um, this is a very, very good website people can go to. Uh, it's called lawyerswithdepression.com. And um, it's written uh, and developed by an attorney who experienced severe depression. There are kind of helpful tips and so forth people can look at. The good news is with depression is that that 80% of the people who receive uh, treatment uh, show improvement within eight to 10 sessions. Uh, and of course, psychotherapy medication. So at LAP, when we see somebody that requires that treatment, we will refer them to an outside mental health professional who has experience, training, and education to work with law students and attorneys so they understand that kind of unique problem, that unique demographic, <coughs> and they will provide individual treatment. Uh, and then there's also group. So the group that we have is for lawyers and only lawyers in our program. So it is a mixture. They will have people that are uh, facing the committee bar examiner issues, and then there are also attorneys as well. So there are attorneys in the beginning part of their career, in the mid part of their career, or these are very, very experienced attorneys that are all kind of in that same group. And we have found that it's actually very helpful that uh, they really learn from the experience of other lawyers and people come out um, really um, saying that the group process that we have is something that they particularly benefit from. Uh, there's a loose of science side. Okay, the LAP. Um, I've been asked to talk just very, very briefly about the LAP, the mission statement, and what is our function. This is our mission statement. It is to support recovering attorneys and now, of course, law students in their rehabilitation and competent practice of law, enhance public protection, because that is what we're all about, ultimately about public protection, which is why we see very close ties with what you do, because you serve that very, very important function in a slightly different way, but uh, you really emphasize the idea that people that could pose, and this is something we look at very closely, the risk factors that are associated with problematic future legal behavior, and trying to address those very early on. And enhance public protection, of course, maintain the integrity of the legal profession. Uh, it was uh, developed and became law in 2001. Senator Burton authored the Senate Bill 479, and the idea was to enhance public protection, to rehabilitate attorneys who are impaired, so they are able to practice law uh, competently. And the Board of Governors uh, of the State Bar of California established the LAP to carry on this mandate. Um, so we have a number of functions. We protect the interests of clients and the general public from harm. The other issue, of course, is it's confidential. Uh, when you refer uh, committee bar examiner applicants to us, what you guys have them sign, or the committee bar examiners have them sign, is a release allowing us to communicate with the moral character analyst. So we provide information back and forth about it. And we very much value the information that you provide for us during the meeting that you have with the uh, bar applicant. It's extremely helpful to us. Um, to get your opinion and the concerns that you have so we can address them adequately in the process of this person being with us. Uh, it's confidential, so unless they waive that confidentiality, and they always do because it's a requirement of participating, so we communicate to this, the community bar examiners uh, information ongoing when they start, uh, how they're doing in the middle, and of course at the end. There's a phone intake, so when you refer uh, an, an applicant either for um, an evaluation or for an abeyance period, uh, we will talk to them on the phone and then they will meet with one of us in person. Uh, so we have a person in San Francisco that handles Northern California and then we have uh, myself and um, another person, actually we have two other people now, we hired another person to manage all the people in Southern California. So we will meet with them in person and we will do a, an assessment first. <clears throat> and I gave you a copy of what that looks like, basic kind of outline format. We will have recommendations, and then we will send them off to OEP group if they are appropriate, and then we will provide a structured program of recovery. So I gave an example of what that looks like. Uh, the first part is they sign an evaluation plan. So it includes all the criteria of that person's participation. So they are agreeing to cooperate with the intake process, they're going to attend the LAP group, which is run by licensed professionals with whom we contract. They will attend a number of self-help groups. So we provide, where, uh, we provide um, 
recommendations to uh, groups such as AA, the other bar, or Smart Recovery for those people that don't feel comfortable with AA or those um, kinds of groups. That's equally acceptable, and we often uh, find that to be as, as equally helpful. Uh, they are required, uh, in some cases, to obtain an addiction evaluation from an outside specialist. Uh, they have agreed to abstain from alcohol or drugs unless they're prescribed by a physician. Uh, they will report to us any prescriptions that they have so we can monitor them during the drug testing process. Uh, they will provide the random drug testing. Um, and then we make additional uh, conditions depending on the individual needs, such as uh, seeing an individual therapist or other kinds of support that we think the person needs. That's an example. This is what they sign initially, so I'm just going to pass that around. After they have participated with us for a period of time and completed an evaluation period, which is roughly three months. So within that three month time period, uh, it gives us the opportunity to really evaluate to see what are the underlying issues that brought this person to the forefront. Because sometimes they will report substance abuse and it turns out it could be something else. And sometimes people are not completely forthcoming or are less honest than we would like them to be. And so during this three month time process really gives us the opportunity to see if what they're saying is true. So if a person, for example, reports that they haven't used this substance and it turns out they're positive for it, then that's a clinical piece of tool that we use in order to change or modify their plans. So after they met with the, um, with the evaluation committee or restructured the process and completed the evaluation time period, they signed a participation plan. So that's roughly after three months uh, or 90 days. So it's plus or minus depending on the individual needs. And so, uh, similar, except it has other provisions such as participating in individual treatment with a therapist or medication management with a psychiatrist and other kinds of uh, requirements. So I'm just going to pass that around. The last part that I wanted, was asked to address uh, is the level of, of, of insight. So this is something that we sent out, and we require every uh, community bar examiner applicant who comes in or is referred to you, uh, to us uh, by you, is they complete a this report at the end, which is evaluated, and we assign a level of insight. So I'm going to pass that out. This actually will be sent out to the participants. So the highest level is significant, you can read that there. It's also in uh, the paperwork that I'm passing around. What does that actually mean? We evaluated on two issues. The, the second one is the easiest, which is it just has to do with compliance. Did they comply with the terms of their participation plan? Uh, did they attend the necessary requirements of meetings? Did they have a sufficient amount of time uh, to, or did they miss any drug tests? Did they ever test positive? And we communicate those findings, of course, to the community of bar examiners and in our evaluation of the levels of insight for this person. The second has to do really with, uh, it's a more subjective element, but nevertheless, I think also very important. It's the understanding of the role of the substance abuse or mental health played in that person's life. So it's insight into their substance use and mental health disorder, one's behavior, in other words, how is that, God bless you, Substance abuse affects that behavior and the need for treatment. So the insight level describes an evaluate's lack of understanding about that process, uh, the consequences of that process. So it can be as severe as complete denial or lack of awareness or professional treatment. So people that receive the highest level of insight, they have really demonstrated, number one, that they understand the role that substance abuse has played in their life, Number two, they understand that how it affected their behavior. And number three, they understand the need for treatment and they have incorporated that into their daily living. That is a significant level of insight. And then slightly less than that is moderate. And then of course, um, uh, the lowest level is minimal. So they understand there's a problem, but they haven't made the necessary steps in order to change that. And sometimes we do have none, where the person is in complete denial and doesn't want to address these issues at all. Um, so that's all the time I have. Uh, thank you very much, of course. Uh, this is my email, and I will forward my PowerPoints to Kim, and you will have that. Um, you can also, of course, email me uh, any questions at all you have about anything. Um, if you'd like any more information about anything I've talked about, I'm more than happy to talk to you on the phone or through email. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say thank you, Alex, for a wonderful presentation. I think 
that. Um, you noted something about uh, about lack, um, and I want to oh there we go. Um, just uh, tell everybody that at the last board meeting last week, um, the board uh, approved um, a rule change to lack a rule three point four four recognizing the merits of this program and what it offers to um, applicants. And so um, it formally now, um, the statute allows both uh, bar applicants and law students um, uh, participation in the LAP program. So thank you. Thank you very much. appropriate asking questions? Yeah, sure. We'll, we'll maybe give it a few minutes for questions. Um, occasionally we'll refer somebody to you and we'll send it back saying they're basically not a LAP candidate. Yes. Why would you do that? Um, it's an uh, excellent question. Um, they have to meet criteria. So they have to have a uh, diagnosis that requires treatment or intervention. And the second part is they have to be able to benefit from the program. So the first part is uh, after we make a determination whether or not the person actually meets criteria, that is they have a diagnosis that requires treatment and intervention, uh, the second part is can they benefit? Sometimes they will have a diagnosis, but they can't benefit from the program. Sometimes the people are so ill, they can't have a structured program of recovery. So uh, that's a very rare scenario, but it does happen. Most of the time, they can benefit. So the most likely reason that we would refer somebody back and saying they don't meet qualifications is because they don't have a diagnosis that requires treatment. Yes, please. Um, what percentage of the uh, candidates that... I think they think you do. I'll use the mic. Please use your mic. What percentage of the of the candidates that the Moral Character Committee sends to you for evaluation are turned away because they don't qualify? Uh, I don't have uh, a statistical number that I can give you, but my sense is approximately 10 percent. So, so my question. Thank you, Alex. Your presentation was excellent. Thank you. So, my question is: We now, and I, and I think it's great very appropriate for the board to finally really recognize the importance of LAP for law students and applicants. But my question goes from more of a historical means and, and something that may not, that I haven't seen, is to have, has LAP done the metrics on success? And by that I mean relapses, and I know that most of the population would be lawyers, in terms of lawyers that have uh, gotten through LAP successfully with uh, appropriate insight as to the, the, the relapses or the impact, because uh, that's what I'd be most interested in, is, is the success. Uh, <clears throat> that's also a, a, an excellent question. So there are a number of ways that we evaluate success. Uh, success is, um, did we reduce the risk factors that are associated with people that uh, not only relapse, but have negative consequences such as disciplinary issues going forward or um, uh, or actually malpractice complaints. So we have a whole division that is now devoted to obtaining metrics. So uh, we have some uh, indicia of, uh, of uh, success purely from uh, sort of anecdotal evidence. It has to be formally statistically analyzed at this point. Um, but we use a something called the BSI, which is an instrument that allows us to measure the symptom levels of people that are coming into the program and when they are coming out. So um, the anecdotal evidence at this point is that people report more significant symptoms in the beginning and when they complete the program they report much less. So their functioning really has been improved. And the other component that we monitor is have they made substantial changes to the way they practice law or how do they approach the legal practice to begin with. For example, um, people will report that you know, I used to take on so many clients because I just needed the money. I wasn't able to really uh, manage my office techniques very well. Or I wasn't responding to clients because I was uh, experiencing depression. So what have you learned? What kind of coping strategies did you now develop that you are able to really fundamentally challenge, uh, change how you practice law? And that's something that we monitor very, very closely. So in terms of success, when you're looking at it, we reduce the number of risk factors. Uh, in terms of relapse, unfortunately, relapse is a part of the recovery process. So people do relapse, uh, but we're looking for long-term stability. 
Uh, we do have some surveys that are going out, but we don't have uh, robust metrics at this point, but we have a whole department uh, and outreach now that is solely devoted to this issue. Thank you. If I can just follow up here, Nikki, you asked such an excellent question, and this is a, a challenge for the bar um, overall beyond lap is really looking at the efficacy of the interventions and the various um, uh, services that we provide. So as Alex mentioned, and, and you're well aware, we have our Office of Research and Institutional Accountability. That office is tasked with coming up with discipline system metrics broadly, with LAP as part of the, the discipline system for this purpose. Um, those uh, proposed metrics will be going to the board, I believe, for its March meeting. And they do include actual recidivism metrics for LAP, as well as for our Office of Probation and some other areas of the bar. So we <coughs> have uh, a the more uh, yes, please. Right. Yeah, this will be the last question. Oh, uh, um, how do you shape, you talked a little bit about socially deviant behavior, um, which uh, you know was obviously an issue, let's say, 30 years ago. It would be things like somebody who's homosexual that was could have been used as a, uh, 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 an impediment to being admitted to the bar. How do you safeguard against drifting into that territory? Uh, well, uh, all of the um, all of the case managers have continuous uh, education in cultural awareness and diagnosing for those particular issues. So, um, for example, if um, uh, the conduct that is at issue is related to a political activity of some kind, some people will get arrested because they're protesting, things like that. We don't obviously pathologize anything like that. So it's more uh, has to do with clinically significant levels of impairment in their function. So these are people that have difficulty uh, meeting deadlines or completing work on time, things like that. But we uh, strive very hard for that cultural competency to make sure that we are addressing the needs of the underserved and minority populations who are especially sensitive to those issues. Here, can I ask one more question? But it's pretty important. Okay. Uh, as we sit on the more character subcommittee, one thing I wanted to ask you for clarification is that when we refer an applicant to you, and LAP assessment is that there is nothing that you guys can do for this applicant, does that mean that specific applicant can still have abuse related issues? Uh, yes, uh, because uh, you will definitely refer someone to us because of a DUI. So something has been flagged, in other words, in that person's history. But um, that might have been a drunken disorderly when they were in college, for instance, or that might have been um, a DUI that occurred five or six years ago uh, when they were in their 20s, now this person is 27 or 28. So they don't meet the criteria for a substance use disorder that requires treatment and or intervention, but for sure they may have had an issue that is related to substance use that was problematic at one point. Thank you so much for your presentation, it's excellent. Thank you, and again, if anybody has any questions or would need any follow-up, please uh, call or email me uh, for anything. Thank you, again. And we kind of jumped into the meeting uh, without really starting the meeting. Um, so we're the Committee of Bar Examiners, and we wanted to take a uh, role. So if we could maybe start, we'll start with Jim, actually. And just, if you could just say who you are and where you're from. Joanna Mendoza with the Board of Trustees. Alex Chan, member of the Committee of the Bar Examiners from San Francisco. James Afton, member of the Committee of Bar Examiners, Sunday, California. Lisa Cummins, uh, Program Manager for Examination Services in the Office of Examination and Admissions and Examination Services. Thank you. 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 Lee Wallach, Lee, Lee, Lee Wallach, public member of the committee. Bethany Pink, um, committee member, attorney member. Uh, Greg Shen, program manager in operations and admissions, Los Angeles. Uh, Robbie Brody, committee member, Los Angeles. Dolores Heisinger, public member, Belmont. Kim Wong, committee coordinator. Larry Kaplan, committee member, Los Angeles. Mark Torres Gill, Program Manager, Moral Character Determinations. Trisha Bill Levels, Public Member. Alex Lawrence, Public Member, Los Angeles. Esther Lynn, Attorney Member of the Committee. 
I'm George Leo, Program Manager of Educational Standards. Paul Kramer, uh, Committee Member, Sacramento. Anjali Agatuck, Public Member, Los Angeles. Dean of course, Attorney Member, Vice Chair. Amy Nunez, Interim Director of the Office of Admissions. Lydia Wilson, Executive Director of the Bar. Dusty Overpeck, Office of General Counsel. And I'm Erica Garamatsu, I'm the Chair. And this is amazing. I think we have perfect attendance today. I think that everybody's here, which is amazing. Um, and then, okay, so we're ready for our next um, presentation. Um, so uh, joining us are um, Elizabeth Parker and Elise Walton. So this next discussion is uh, related to the Appendix I review. There is a handout that's going around. Um, Kim is um, providing those. So uh, during discussions last year, some questions and concerns were raised about this review process, specifically about the sources that are being used for this report, um, what is being used in the development of, of this um, report, um, who's participating or uh, being consulted um, in, in the process. So the working group uh, that uh, stems from the uh, committee bar examiners, um, along with the consultants that are here today, Elizabeth and Elise, have been working on a method to help address these concerns. Today's meeting is an attempt to address some of these and to um, provide uh, both information on um, how the uh, report is being um, developed and an opportunity to have open dialogue about that process. So with that, um, I will turn it over to Erica. Uh, yes, and I wanted to make sure um, that the public member or the public who is here today, if you have any anything that you'd like to say, um, we're open for public comment at this time. And I, we do not, so we'll move on. Um, so our working group, uh, which is which consists of three CBE members and the rest of you, <laughs> um, and um, Elise and um, actually you, you know, sorry. Uh, well, the point is there are three CBE members who are are part of it, and. Um, Larry Kramer, because he has experience with the accounting uh, board. Uh, uh, oh, sorry, Larry Kaplan. Oh, I'm sorry, Paul. <laughs> Larry Kaplan. I was told Larry's not <laughs> <laughs> um, And uh, David Torres, myself. So uh, what we did is we all got together and weekly had a, a conference call for an hour and went through each of these topics to talk about just preliminarily what ideas would maybe be worth discussing and what ideas just were not. Um, and of course, uh, at least since she's doing the study, she needs to cover all the ground. So uh, I, if we can do any of it, it is. So I'll, I'll turn it over to Elise. And if you could turn on Well, first of all, good morning, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here, and it's a real pleasure to see the faces associated with some of the folks I had the opportunity to have a good conversation with about CBE, your experience, why you serve, and some of the, the um, strengths you see, and as well as the opportunities you see ahead. Um, I want to just take a quick pause to do a check. Did, did um, Donna want to say anything, or she's not here, but is that, no? We'll go ahead. Yeah. Um, because I know some of the things that we're going to bring up kind of are interwoven with other activities that are going on at the bar, and so one of the benefits is that we're able to, to uh, sync those up and leverage some of the, the things that are happening that the bar is doing across all of its uh, sub-entities, councils, and committees. Um, and so what the goal for today was to do a little bit of a 
uh, sharing with you of what we've learned from benchmarking thus far, which is not to say that there's a right or wrong, because each state, each jurisdiction is so different, but just to give you a sense of what other, um, other jurisdictions are doing in terms of um, bar exam process. And um, then we wanted to move into what we call the design elements that we've been discussing in the working group. And what you have in front of you is the, the kind of schedule of um, what, what the tasks are and what the requirement and deliverables are that uh, this group is aiming towards, uh, um, as well as many other groups, by the way. Um, and so I, it might make sense. I'm just going to grab this one here. To walk through that for a second before I turn it over to Elizabeth to do a report. Um, and I also would welcome the working group members to jump in if there's something that I'm missing. Um, but the, the um, outline, the, the, the actual report is going to follow the outline that you see in front of you on this paper. Um, but the inter introduction and executive summary being absolutely one of the last pieces to be completed because it will rely on all the other pieces that will be used for input. But the, the report will also cover legal um, statutory framework of the sub-entity, comparisons with similar entities in other states, the history and operations, um, opportunities for modification with pros and cons, which is really what we're going to start talking about today, um, and path forward, what needs to happen to make some of those things go forward, and then sort of the synthesis and integration of the final report. So that's what the task ahead is. And uh, just to set expectations for today, our goal is really to have a valid and robust conversation and hearing as much as we can from the folks around the table. Um, based on experience and evidence and what their recommendations might be for various proposals around design or redesign. Um, and we are at the process where there may be a recommendation that seems fairly straightforward and it's very easy to get some consensus around, in which case we can kind of move it on to um, developing more a fulsome proposal and move it to writing. In other cases, it may be something that's more um, great that people would rather do a deep dive on and really um, need to examine it more and for those who move to informal conference and people who are interested in the topic and want to contribute and um, get together with some experts and understand what the issues, pros and cons are and flesh them out great, to a greater detail, uh, we'll be able to, we'll be welcome to join that informal conference. So that's how we're going to get through so many things to consider in one day, in, one, in two hours. Um, but that's, uh, we're not coming with recommendations that you're, we're anticipating you'll approve or disapprove today per se. But again, if there's something that's clearly, um, as I say, a no-brainer, then we'll, we'll move forward with it. But mostly we expect to kind of orient you to the things under consideration, get your input, and help the group move forward. And if okay. I could interject, uh, addressing the semantics, the word recommendation doesn't mean it's a recommendation that is set to go anywhere. Uh, I, I think the better word would maybe be um, uh, I, um, yeah. suggestions, guidance. guidance. Um, anyway, no, no recommendations have been made. We are here, all of you, to offer input so they can make the recommendations. So I just wanted to make that clear to everybody. Uh, all the, we'll, we'll be able to comment today and give input so that the recommendations can be made. And then uh, CD will also have uh, input before those, before the report is final. Yes, I think we phrased it suggestions for consideration. Yes. <laughs> yes. So any other quick comments before Elizabeth goes to some of her, the findings? Okay, Come on. go right ahead. So on the theme of semantics, I'll say these are not findings, but they're observations. <laughs> um, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm the junior partner of this team, and I was asked to continue some work that I had done when I served as executive director looking at other far organizations, not just in the United States, but actually internationally as well. I have to say that if you hear the reference to the bar chunky, uh, I've become kind of an organizational chunky when it comes to looking at the very diverse set of uh, organizational structures that bar licensing functions have, both in the United States, you can hear me, okay, um, and elsewhere as well. 
Um, so I thought I would just quickly summarize this, um, referring to some talking points in order to be efficient, but certainly happy to have questions. I think really the question um, that I was interested in trying to learn more about was whether the State Bar of California, which has long been a leader in its work uh, in bar licensing, has today the organizational structure that's best suited for professional licensing in the 21st century, when, as we know, the profession, uh, as well as legal education, is facing really remarkable changes as we uh, quickly enter the um, information revolution. So in the last several months, from November to January, um, I undertook, and sometimes with the lease, sometimes not, to interview a number of people who I thought might be able to provide some interesting observations that we might um, use to stimulate thinking. We talked with nine um, leaders in different bar organizations, I'll tell you who they were in a minute, as well as 12 others who were involved in professional licensing generally, as well as legal education and uh, related activities. The bars we chose were Arizona, Florida, Idaho, Michigan, New York, Oregon, Pennsylvania, Texas, and Washington State. And we chose them in part because of their proximity and also because of their size. But I might add here just to begin uh, in setting the context further that it's difficult when you're California to find anybody who really is a like-kind entity because we are so large and so unusual. That said, New York uh, is a useful jurisdiction because it is similar in size, although actually has a larger number of those that have licenses annually. And interestingly, um, of the UK and its civil service regulation authority is a similar size and doing some quite interesting things, and so I spoke with them as well. With regard to the folks who I saw as leaders in this area, we talked with uh, psychometricians who you will know, both here in the state of California, Tracy Montez, as well as Mary Petoniak, who worked with us in the uh, review of the, the bar exam uh, this past year, as well as Chad Buckendall, who of course you know is consulting psychometrician. We talked with uh, leaders within the legal education community, both uh, ABA Managing Director of Accreditation and Legal Education, Barry Courier, uh, as well as Judith Irene, who is the head of the Association of American Law Schools, and others who have expressed great interest, uh, Richard Grammy, notably from the Center of Public and <coughs> Law, and then uh, several others who are doing interesting things in looking at um, the whole licensing process, both the head of uh, the Law School Admissions Council, as well as uh, the new head, or not new head, I should say, the head of Access Lex, which has a new focus in looking deeply at bar examination and professional licensing. And then finally, uh, reach out to several who are expert in accreditation processes generally, both at the national and state level. Those being uh, Dr. Judith Eaton, who's the CEO and head of the Council of Higher Education Accreditation, as well as Dr. Elizabeth Griego, who is currently an educational consultant, but was previously the head of standards for WASC. So with all of that said, um, we took the occasion as well to, and I think you have a copy of this, to look deeply at a 2017 study that was done by um, a combination of uh, National Conference of Bar uh, Examiners and the ADA Section on Legal Education. I think it's a book. I don't know it's much of a study. It's a really very interesting review. I should say we also uh, spoke with Erica Mosher, uh, who has addressed this group. She's the now past uh, CEO long serving at the NCBE. And of course, as you know, the NCBE uh, is the source of the um, standard. Uh, format that's used not only the multiple choice but now the UCBE, the Unified Bar Exam. I'll make some, some reference to that as we go forward. Um, with all of this, then, some observations. As I've mentioned, New York is really, uh, and the UK are really the only comparable uh, entities in terms of size. Uh, California, however, has a number of unique features, which I think are just well uh, kept in mind. We have a dual oversight role of both court and legislature, quite unusual. Um, and we combine perhaps more functional areas in one organization than is true for many of our counterparts, even though now with the separation of the sections that's been reduced slightly. Uh, we're unique in having a fully professionalized discipline system, but like our sister bar organizations as well as the UK, 
um, we rely heavily on volunteers in the admissions process. Notably, only New York uses a structure that relies on five half-time paid employees to oversee admissions. I thought that was kind of an interesting factoid, if you will. Um, as I mentioned, I think California is seen as a leader among its sister bar organizations. Again and again, I got that kind of feedback in the conversations I had. And let me interject and say that I cannot tell you how cooperative and helpful and thoughtful those I spoke to were. Everybody was more than willing to contribute. I think everyone saw this uh, exercise that we're engaged in as something that they hope to benefit from too. They all recognize that change is coming and we all need to figure out how best to embrace it as we, as we um, I think, move into a very new kind of world for the legal profession. Um, let's see here. So again, uh, back to California and its unusual uh, circumstances. Um, as I talked with various folks, they commented and credited California for doing a remarkable job in our approach to admissions in historically being able to have sufficient staff and funding and leadership to really invest seriously in the management and design of the bar exam and licensing <coughs> functions generally. Uh, notably, this is lacking in many other smaller jurisdictions, and in a minute I'll, I'll allude to the fact that many of them have moved to the UBE because they don't have, if you will, the ability to do what California has done, and so they're looking for support, if you will. Um, now, having said all this positive about what a leadership role I think truly California has in the uh, licensing of lawyers, when we look at other professions, notably the medical profession, I think there may be some things to be learned. We may not be um, quite as advanced in some of the work we're doing as we find the medical profession doing, and perhaps some of the other professionals, professional licensing systems as well. And I think at least we'd probably be better positioned to speak about that than I. So in any event, uh, to summarize before I come into some specific observations, I think we really do have an opportunity here to look deeply at how we're structured and to make sure that we are continuing to be as creative and innovative in our leadership work as historically we have been. Um, finally, I think I'd say that the, uh, the area of psychometrics and science seems to be advancing, and I think we need to be sensitive and aware of some of the things that are happening in that field. And I there would uh, allude to some of the conversations we had with the three psychometricians who made some comments that maybe there were some things we might do a little bit differently to uh, improve uh, even on a, a fine record of that. Um, now, some, some general observations. These won't surprise you, I don't think. All U.S. bar admissions functions are part of the judicial branch, and they're all responsible to the highest judicial authority and all governed by court rules. Interestingly, a majority, however, are separately organized outside their respective bar organizations, whether a membership organization or a regulatory body, uh, and then report directly to the highest court. And I think perhaps some CBE members expressed a preference for this structure as well, although I think there are some countervailing considerations. Um, from my own and in a personal perspective here, I think a unified uh, structure of managing the whole regulatory function allows uh, the kind of cross-cutting analysis that you just heard in the presentation from LAP. I think that may not be uh, as, as easily done when you have a separate bar uh, admissions structure that is separate from its, its bar regulatory organization. Uh, the size of bar exam committees ranges from a low of five, that would be New York, to more than 20, but typically the size is somewhere between 12 and 15, with three-person review panels commonly used for the initial moral character review hearings. Uh, and again, just as with the, the California State Bar, the initial processing of applications happens at a staff level. Some of the review panels uh, are designed to represent the form of the body, whether it's called the Board of Bar Examiners or a committee, so that when they act, they act on behalf of the full board, eliminating one additional level of review. <coughs> that, uh, subsequent review in many cases is handled actually in the state court system. For us, the parallel, of course, would be the state bar court. Uh, as I mentioned, only New York pays its admissions oversight body. Uh, in fact, it's five uh, bar examiners are long-serving, they're half-time paid judicial employees with three-year renewable terms that have to reapply every three years. Um, 
Others have fixed appointment terms commonly with a limited renewal possibility. Uh, one sees that as a fairly common structure, and oftentimes I found that there's a low formulaic way in which the chair and vice chair are selected, so that there's continuity in that selection process as well. In some cases, bar examiners are responsible for actually writing their exam questions, and in those cases, they must all be lawyers. But in other states, public members uh, do participate, and in several contexts, I was interested that there is an effort to include those public, include in those public members doctors, psychologists, and financial experts to facilitate some of the licensing decisions and, and uh, uh, considerations on character and fitness. Several states separate the management of the exam from moral character and fitness reviews. I suppose that's not unlikely with the committee structure that the California State Bar has. And as I've mentioned, all use volunteers in one way or another for the moral character and fitness review process. Might uh, just for a moment here talk about uh, New York, which I think is quite an interesting and very different structure. Uh, New York uh, has a separate board of bar examiners. It has a two-step two process. You first apply to take the exam through that board, and then once you have passed, uh, you move and make a second application for moral fitness. And that is actually done in the four second-level uh, court uh, structure. So you go to the division, the appellate division, the four of them in New York, <coughs> geographically arranged. And then you actually go forward, and you have a personal interview that is managed by uh, that court staff. So quite an unusual and very different structure that uh, was just intriguing to think about uh, and why they do it that way. Uh, that's what I think they thought and also some problems. Um, as the very, very helpful uh, director said, it's confusing as a system. Uh, people don't kind of know where to go next, but uh, it's an interesting one. I would add one other point. Uh, you see some variation as to whether moral character is the first step in the process or the second step in the process. And there are rationales for both approaches. Dave, you have a question. I do. Uh, in terms of their uh, numbers, uh, are, are their numbers similar to ours uh, in terms of applicants? A little higher. 10,000 pretty standard. Mm -hmm. But interestingly, uh, they're declining a bit as ours are increasing. And also very interesting, I, I don't know if you were on yeah. this conversation, I think around 30% of their applicants are actually foreign lawyers. So that kind of pushes the number up a bit. But again, it's a comparable size. And that size is quite surprising to me that they actually have these personal interviews, how they manage that. Um, again, I digress for just a moment, but I mentioned the UK, which is all right now a very deep review, and the way they seem to be pointing the reforms that they hope to accomplish will be to include a personal interview at one point in a two-step licensing process, and they have similar numbers of applicants. I think about six thousand. Kind of an interesting, interesting. What do we say? Um, observation that stimulates one's thinking. Why, why are they doing that? And, um, Seventy percent of the states, interestingly, have rather clearly uh, articulated sets of standards for moral character and fitness reviews. California would appear not to have these. Now, I haven't done a comparison, but that at least is, was the summary of the report that I mentioned. And, and let me add here one interesting point in the conversation with Texas. Um, Susan Hendricks, the director there, pointed out that in Texas, moral character does not include considerations of substance abuse uh, and other kinds of substance dependency. They see that as a health problem, and they simply set it aside and deal with it in a different structure. You do see LAP structures, as we have, of course, part of the bar, uh, in different jurisdictions handled in a different way. So that was, I thought, an interesting observation. Um, I might add here, too, that uh, in a couple of jurisdictions, there's a limit on the number of times one may take the exam without special approval. Um, from memory, I believe it's six in Idaho, and I think it might have been three in Texas. Please don't hold me to that. But that was something one saw in a couple of the jurisdictions, which I thought was interesting. Um, moving on, uh, I found no evidence that anybody had defined a minimum 
Commons, as we are, of course, attempting to do, with the notable exception, again, of the UK Solicitor's Regulation Authority, which is working to create such a definition now and has been uh, busy at this over the last two years, doing a very extensive review and deep look um, surveying lawyers and so on as to what is it lawyers really must do to be minimally competent. Um, there appears from these conversations to be no study uh, that has seriously looked at the relationship between licensing standards and discipline, although Connecticut has done uh, some somewhat inconclusive work, and I think what they came up with was that there might be a relationship between uh, discipline and traffic violations, but not exactly the clarity of the relationship that I hope to find in these conversations. Um, unlike almost all other common law jurisdictions, only Oregon in the United States requires mal malpractice insurance. Uh, the nonprofit pooled malpractice fund in Oregon provides a very interesting way for Oregon to identify malpractice risk factors and to design its educational programs in response. Uh, that's a pattern that seems to exist in several common law jurisdictions, notably Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I'll say on my own dime, uh, I attended the International Legal Regulator Regulators Conference in Singapore in October after stepping down as executive director because I was really interested to know, you can see this junky thing is coming back at Amber, but what they're doing. And what I found was in Australia, uh, where they do require malpractice insurance, the insurance carriers have been a force to identify what the patterns are, where the problems are from a statistical perspective, and then to step in and design <coughs> educational programs that are designed to try and correct the problems they've identified, obviously, to lower their premiums. So I thought that was an intriguing bit of data. They've done some publishing on that as well. Um, now let me speak for a moment about the Unified Bar Exam. Um, by July 2018, 30 states will have adopted the UPE, which of course, as you know, I think, is a product of the National Conference of Bar Examiners. The trend is particularly evident in the Northeast, where all but Rhode Island and Delaware have adopted the UPE. So I was interested to know, well, why uh, were the pros and the cons that these states saw in adopting the Unified Bar Exam? Interestingly, most said that the UBE was either more costly or a wash. It was not a money savings uh, effort. I'll come back to that in a minute, however. Their adoption was based on improving the quality of their exam and also its portability so that applicants would be able to take one exam for use in several states. Um, now, let me just remind you that if Columbus had landed on the West Coast, we would have 41 states. And so in the East Coast, where states are much smaller and more together, and there's a much more uh, a tendency to practice across state lines, you can see why the UBE and its portability becomes quite attractive. And as I mentioned, while they say they have not saved money, it may well be that no one has spent the kind of, I should say no one, few have spent the kind of effort money that, that California has in designing a very professional exam. So these may not be apples and oranges comparisons. Um, the, U, the UBE structure, I think, as you know, is fixed. And it's my belief it would be difficult to change if other approaches to licensing were ultimately to be decided as preferable. So again, pros and, and cons there. Uh, meanwhile, New York, which adopted the exam, the UBE exam, two years ago, is studying its impact uh, there has been concern that it may have an adverse impact on some groups, but early results suggest, in fact, that passage rates in New York are actually increasing. <coughs> it may well be because fewer subjects are being tested. UBE states almost universally have a local component that they add to their, design, pardon, to their exams, typically uh, online, as a way to encourage awareness of differences in state and federal law, although not to test competence. With regard to moral character and fitness review, I mentioned already that the timing uh, tends to vary. Some uh, start with moral character and fitness, others wait until after the exam results are out. One comment that I thought was interesting uh, from one bar leader was that those who fail the exam are likely going to fail moral, moral character and fitness as well, and so they're essentially saving uh, some, some effort and time here. Um, Again, I've noted that New York is the only state identified, and I think maybe the 
here in the state where moral character interviews uh, occur in person. Um, I found that the failure to be licensed on moral character grounds is typically uh, not a permanent bar to gaining a license to practice, although uh, the need to delay may cause uh, a discouraging feature to ever applying again, because in some cases, uh, a state bar licensing body will uh, require that a person sit out for more time than what the bar exam results are valid for, and so that would require them retaking the exam with each new moral character application. Uh, I've already talked to you about the unusual approach that Texas takes, treating substance abuse not as a moral character issue, but rather as a health issue, and not considering that. Um, I found that two levels of appeal from a denial on moral character grounds um, was the typical approach. Uh, this is, of course, after staff review. A number of states raised access to justice concerns, and so I wanted to just share a couple of points uh, there for you. Everyone expressed concern about access to justice. Licensing applications uh, continue to decline in many states, suggesting that overall we'll have a lower census of lawyers, and that, of course, has its own uh, access to justice implications. New York is studying ways to improve its bar passage rates by seeking to identify causation factors uh, in poor performance on the exam. Access issues are also behind the reforms that are now underway, well underway in the UK. Um, and I've mentioned there that there's a great effort to try and look boldly at the <coughs> licensing to make sure that they have the right instrument, uh, that it is valid, uh, and that it in fact will increase rather than decrease the ability of all groups to participate uh, in uh, legal practice. I'd say that SRA is close to completing its two-year occupational analysis, and then it's something we can learn from that. Uh, it's also designing an assessment uh, process that should be, I think, of some use. Uh, SRA is copying, this I found very interesting, uh, the approach it's likely to take on how the medical uh, profession licenses with a two-part test. So the first test being on the subject matter competence, the second on a more skills-based That is exactly what the U.S. medical profession does, and the uh, SRA in England has decided they're going to adopt and embrace that, that American approach. Um, now, again, a couple of California-specific comments. As you know, the cost of legal education is certainly one major impediment to licensing more lawyers, particularly for ADA schools. It's become uh, really quite extraordinary, something like $60,000 a year for one year of instruction. And so California then may once again have a unique opportunity as almost the only jurisdiction which credits a substantial number of law schools. I only found Massachusetts is the only other state which has a state accredited law school. Uh, notably, it's not the bar that accredits the law school, but rather the regional accredited body. I also found that other states uh, commonly condition taking the bar exam on an ADA degree, with the exception that if an individual licensed in a state like California has practiced successfully for a number of years, that person may be admitted to taking the bar exam in that local jurisdiction. Uh, so to kind of summarize this, I think that California's approach to state law accreditation uh, may be an opportunity. Uh, it may, in fact, be an alternate approach <coughs> to licensing lawyers to that represented by the ABA-accredited schools. Again, increasingly, they are very costly. But again, a personal observation for me, I think that if this model is to be successful and to provide uh, something that other states might want to consider, it's going to be important to ensure <coughs> that the best accreditation practices are represented in our approaches. And currently here, I noted in conversations with the two accrediting experts that I interviewed that it's unusual to combine regulation and accreditation in one body, and the lack of a periodic audit of performance and practices in accreditation is not consistent with national and state standards. So perhaps that's um, enough to say, other than to say that, that uh, I think we, we are in a situation where after many years of relying on one format for lawyers licensing, 
uh, a variety of changes suggest that it's a wise thing to look deeply at whether uh, changes might be appropriate as we move into the 21st century. Uh, but I do think that California is in a position uh, to really show leadership to all other state bars around the country. And perhaps this is a bit of a call to action that this body consider that opportunity to continue the innovation and creativity that has characterized what California uh, has done for many years. So thank you for giving me a chance to indulge a fascinating, uh, what I say, area of inquiry, which I wish we could have more time to talk about. But that's it. Thank you, um, David. Uh, one question. Uh, the, the, uh, I understood that there are several states in the uh, union that allow attorneys after several years to uh, get practicing in that state without taking the bar exam. I think Texas is one of them. Do you know how many, uh, uh, how many uh, states allow attorneys to get practice after year? I know that it depends upon the number of years, but I there are several. It, it memory serves, I believe it was either three or five years practicing when licensed <coughs> by a non-ABA school uh, was Texas's rule, but you still had to take the bar exam. Okay. You. Actually, I think for Texas, you don't have to take part in I think it's five or seven years, and then you just have to pass the more character fitness portion of it. And if you pass that, then you're automatically admitted without examination. Well, well, we'll have to we'll have to check that because I heard something different. But Susan Hendricks is very helpful. I'm sure she'll clarify. It. And if you're ready for lunch, we're prepared to break for lunch. Observation from compares, which you've just heard a summary of, but there will probably be some more additional insights that can come up as we go along. And so the idea is just to kind of walk through this document and um, look at color commentary inputs and, and um, 
reactions. So obviously your current governance and composition is that you have uh, 19 members, 10 are lawyers, 9 are public members, appointed by the legislature, state, and court. Um, the, 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 these two are part pretty redundant though, but the one observation from the group is that the committee size makes it hard to have a quorum because to, to get a majority, a simple majority, you have to get at least 10 people. And while I understand attendance is perfect today, I gather that that has not always been the case. Um, so it makes it harder to, to uh, pull the group together. Um, there was one proposal for consideration that if the work was redesigned, consider a smaller board. You are larger than almost all the other um, jurisdiction boards, um, but you also are a larger jurisdiction. There. So again, there could be pros and cons to that. In terms of comparing to other um, licensure activities that are boards in, in California, only the medical board is as big as you are. Others, like psychology, architecture, and the like, are smaller. Accountancy is small. Um, any comments on that? Just a bit smaller. Uh, from five to seven to uh, exact numbers, uh, uh, 11, 12, but yeah, only medical is. And could you please turn on your mic before you ask the question? Yeah, so architecture is 10, psychology is 9, accountancy is, well, accountancy is 15, and so is medical. I've got a question for you. Um, would, it be, would it be harder to reach a core when you have a smaller work because all it takes is one person? So, this is a, uh, which a quorum to be a majority, a, a simple majority of the board to be able to make a decision or a recommendation or a vote? 11, 10, sorry. So what's the proposed number? For me? Do you have a proposed number? Um, no, we need to come up with a proposal, but I think that's one of the things that we would like this group to consider. And we so, did consider that it's statutorily set, set right. right now. So that would, that, and I'll change would ultimately require a change in the statutes. And we? Does it, does it affect the fact that we have these subcommittees where um, yes, we're a large board, but we need as many people to fill all this stuff. The right? To work. Does that make a difference? Yeah, I think it does. Obviously, the amount of work done um, by the volunteers is uh, a factor in figuring out how many volunteers you need, or assessing how many volunteers you need. But I think as you as we walk through this, there may be things that get reassigned or get uh, delegated, or so that maybe the exact demands will change. Um, so I think that's one of the things that well, it says pending redesign of the work, should you consider a smaller board? Lee. Um, I looked at a couple of friends of ours who were a little surprised at this one, that we don't perceive a problem, uh, because at least in my 17 years, I don't think we've ever not had a quorum. So I don't know where they got brought up that this is an issue, but we seem to do this fine. Um, and again, the, the workload moral character and other things to, uh, to mean you have to have a few more bodies to, to oversee that activity. I think the forum issue came up with um, also a smaller group, but it was something we considered either way. Larry. Yeah, uh, can I make a recommendation on approach mm -hmm. on this whole thing? For some, can you um, speak into it? Yeah, uh, if I can make a recommendation on approach on this whole thing, because it, this conversation got me thinking about it, which is, um, do we want to prioritize uh, what are the issues that we really want to hash out? So for example, the size, you know, 19, 15, how important is that in terms of we spend the next half hour having a discussion over it, or are there more important decision points that we have to go through that really have significance um, that we may want to focus on first? Well, thank you for that, because I think you're helping us get back to our process, which this one I think we can um, move on from, because I, there isn't a formal recommendation where everyone says, yeah, 15 is the magic number, so I think we, the, the group that's working on this may come back with some uh, a proposed number for consideration, but for now that's just all that's been considered. So why don't I keep moving, and we'll, I mean, uh, Larry's um, 
recommendation to highlight for yourself if you think this is a really critical issue to debate. And where we do find those, let's make sure that we flag them and put them forward for the informal conferences, right? The parking lot. Well, actually, no. The, so if you say that it's a critical issue, you may be volunteering to attend the informal conference, oh, just okay. so you know. <laughs> um, all right, so moving along. Terms. Um, that the, the public and the license both have four-year terms, and that's, but in reality, the terms haven't really been enforced in the sense that people have termed out, which in most of the other jurisdictions, there is a, a restriction of the number of terms you can serve. So the proposal for consideration was that you would um, affect actual terms and offer vacancy versus continuance of past terms. Um, and then utilize communications and recruiting skills to try to, recruiting F, uh, efforts to gain members with needed skills and expertise. So, the, um, you know, the, the, the benefits, as we have stated also in the leadership and composition, is that, you know, longer term folks have institutional knowledge and you have some stability. Um, and, uh, but the, there's a downside of that, that there's, there can be entrenchment and, and not uh, changing in of the board. And generally, I'd say in the governance field, um, the idea of terms is increasingly, has grown in popularity and uh, is increasingly being something that's uh, enforced in, especially in nonprofit and governmental environments um, and potentially in public environments eventually, um, meaning the public sector or the private sector in your terms. Um, so leadership and composition, there's annual member rotation across the committees, uh, and, but with fixed subcommittee leadership and just some of the benefits of that have been the, the back to the stable leadership and institutional knowledge and it gives members the opportunity to participate in all committees. Conversely, you don't get stuck in a committee you may not like. Um, but it does lead to some entrenchment of leaderships and, and also newer members may have a challenge participating because they're not necessarily up to speed, uh, familiar with the acronyms and the flow of the dialogue as, as some of the folks who've been around for a longer period of time. Um, so there was a, pro a proposed for consideration, three-year subcommittee chair terms, three-year committee terms, um, developing a committee skills matrix across the, the full committee, um, and then strengthen, strengthen onboarding practices to help um, allow, create a context where everybody can contribute, even newcomers. Comments, thoughts, reactions? Your next section will address it. Okay. Um, so the meeting agendas and meeting management, um, the tip practice has been agendas sent out a week prior, materials posted, um, and some of the comments that we heard from members is, and, and others is that the meetings oscillate between open and closed, and uh, the and the agendas uh, jump around, and so sometimes it can be difficult to follow, um, sort of uh, awkward. And then the acronyms and the lawyer speak may discourage public member engagement simply because you know, the, the folks who are in the field can have a field, <laughs> a club conversation that uh, folks who are not from that background will may have a challenge jumping into and offering their expertise and insight. So um, one thing here, this is where leveraging the bar comes in, but the staff is creating a uniform agenda and agenda management process for all of the sub-entities and um, committees and councils, which I think will be used here and will provide a lot more clarity for folks around the table as well as folks following um, online. <laughs> and um, that also a recommendation for consideration is to identify key policy and long-term items to be covered on a committee agenda including alignment with um, the bar five year strategic plan. So what are the critical issues that are affecting admissions in the law that this group should be thinking of that may not be the uh, traditional fair or the traditional chart of work that each of the subcommittees and the committee has? Again, comments? Yeah. Yes. Um, I think Bagley Keene is really going to screw with the um, subcommittees. Yes, to so say the least, and that's, that's coming. Um, that's what we're talking about now. Um, so what was my other point? Um, you know, I, I would, as a volunteer, I would, would frankly find it um, more convenient if the if the background materials were available a little bit more in advance of the meetings than has been our practice. And I believe that is being worked on. 
That's going to be the uniform standards that the bar is coming up with for all the subcommittees. Yes. I was wondering, uh, what if we had public members or the non-lawyers write down words or terms or abbreviations that were unfamiliar <coughs> and um, perhaps we can create maybe a, a glossary page and include that with our training materials so that's what can be referred to? Another um, idea that I'm um, stealing from the Board of Accountancy is they have, um, for every new board member and, and other board students as well, have a mentor for the new member who sort of sits next to that person during the first meeting that they attend and where they, they might have a question they want to whisper to a neighbor and not you know, raise their hand on, they can help them with some of the, the questions and some of the uh, interpretations and history and the like. Um, so I think it's sort of on to designing a, a more fulsome onboarding process. Um, yes? Um, yeah, the, the, the last bit I, I, I agree, we, you know, we do need to uh, um, make some leaps and bounds in how we get that information out, the cleanliness of it, as well as the organizational value of it. Um, and I think that, that would be, will clean up, you know, a lot of that moving forward. Um, though, again, I, I think, and while I don't see it here, I think it's mentioning that uh, some of those, uh, I think 17 years is probably referencing someone uh, specific, but. Um, there is and there has been in the history of this organization always only one or two people, you know, that have really, uh, and cycled through, uh, you know, uh, for any period of time. Uh, that kind of historical uh, knowledge and assistance has been incredibly valuable. And these have been some of the most active members of our committee, chairs, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and so I, you know, I, I don't see a, a whole lot of downside. Again, I'm looking, you know, rather than being the bull in the china shop approach, I'm looking to see where is there an issue. Uh, I'm very happy to change stuff, um, but I don't know where, uh, out of what habit, pulling some of this stuff. Um, I, I want to add one more thing to the leadership of the composition. Having a longer term does have a, 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 a negative effect as well. Where, what we've been doing for many years is trying to make sure that each member has a diverse amount of experiences and brings their experiences to a diverse amount of committees. Um, therefore, if you lock somebody in for the majority of their term in one committee, they don't have a chance to sit on moral character and they're on O&M and um, you lose their insight and valuable participation um, in, that, in, in that other committee. Um, so it, it's been very, it's been very thoughtfully um, uh, figured out. Another thing I'll use, I'll uh, use more character as another example. The division between uh, North and South were a very large state, mm -hmm. and so we try to figure out um, from the committee structure who, who's North, who's South. You know, but an equitable amount of male, females, all these types of things come into play, and if you end up having some folks fixed, it's just something to think of as you as you think about those options. So let me take that idea. I actually should have paused after D, um, one D versus one C, but um, maybe there is something that uh, we should have an informal conference about in terms of tenure, the whole governance aspect of. Um, how, what terms should be, how subcommittees should be assigned, because as you're, you're noting that we know as well that there's, there's pros and cons with the rotation model. Just quickly. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. And I believe we were in the working group also. We were um, not really at a consensus on that issue for the reasons you said. So oh. ju just quickly on um, the co committee design, you have four subcommittee design, you have four subcommittees. Um, the, the observation that was made already that, that may be challenging under Bag for Keen, the considerations we put for, forward were eliminate closed items for, and um, have it uh, done at the subcommittee where there would not be um, broadcast, and at the board level would only review or have summary reporting. So the issues of confidentiality as you currently consider them would be addressed by having closed sessions of subcommittees and then only a, a summary review at the board level. Um, and then also we said for consideration, 
pending reduction in work scope, that you could maybe combine some subcommittees. So you have three subcommittees. So I'm just popping in because we have on the agenda at the um, Operations and Management Subcommittee to talk about the subcommittee structure in light of Betty Keene. And um, a proposal is going to be made that we don't have subcommittees anymore so that um, the entire CBE members will be able to participate as opposed to having to um, you know, leave the room during a closed session, which a lot of the topics that are handled in this committee fall under more character or um, preparing examinations. And so I think that's an issue that's gonna um, maybe get resolved today. So, I, I just wanted to say, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a Brody, committee member. I, I welcome, and I think it is great that you are looking at the onboarding process for new members. That has been, I think, the biggest area of concern for me. I come from another state bar committee where there is some um, very detailed training for public and attorney new members. Before anyone goes to a meeting, I can remember my first and my second meeting just uh, really very frustrated uh, because that was it. It was just a regular meeting. So I think that your your looking in this area is uh, is, is thoughtful and something that I, that I, I would really like to see here at CBE. I should also say I come from a state bar committee where no one can be on that committee for more than three years except the chair. And um, I thought that it was very successful to have a, a new thinking process. There's always some uh, <clears throat> there's always some institutional knowledge as people stay on, and new people are always coming on, like here. So uh, thank you. I think that's 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 very thoughtful. Thanks. <coughs> um, so I think why don't we pause on whether this one gets an informal conference until we know more from <coughs> because that would be a, a dramatic change to our that would be a change in scope and nature of work um, if there were no more subcommittees. Yes. Um, okay, so I'll move on then to moral character and what, again on the left is just kind of a description of how it works now, small teams using folios on several moral character appeals. Each case is recommended to the moral character analysis and they range a uh, large range. Just quickly to note that there's, you get about 7,000 moral character appeals a year and the, the 259 went to subcommittee this year. So it's, it's a portion, the staff is able to handle the large majority of the appeals. Um, so, you know, some of the, the things that people mention is the significant reading demand on volunteers and that there's some sense of varied outcomes that um, it's not, while there's Rule 440, it's not that specific and that you might not have consistency while you do calibration in the session, if there's not as much consistency year to year, case to case. Um, and the staff has been very helpful in providing calibration and, and very, very helpful in informing what they need to consider. Um, and many thought it was very valuable to have public or an eclectic perspective on the moral character issues. Um, and that um, there was also a, some discussion that reviewing the individual cases really allows CB to, to be current on policy and interpretation issues and they identify where the policy is unclear. So it's in, in those individual cases where you're learning some of the, the latest things you need to be progressed of. Um, so the, for consideration was ensuring that the moral character review has clear guidelines and document specific guidance for decision beyond the existing high-level description, which currently exists in 440. And you could even include, what, like, what about if then, if you see this, like, for instance, as um, Elizabeth said, there may be a different approach to um, substance use disorder, or there may be a different approach to things that would qualify as diseases, <laughs> and, um, depending on how you classify them. And those could be, for instance, shunted to a different process. So. Um, that there might be things that you said, well, we've got this, but we think that it actually more appropriately belongs in, not with the LIP, but with the equivalent. Um, 
So, and then uh, reinforce Rule 440 and extend and clarify. So there's also a discussion in the group. Um, as Elizabeth said, many jurisdictions do have not, uh, moral characters of separate um, entity that, that reviews it or a separate process that, that does that review. So the working group considered that, but it wasn't something they really thought would be uh, actionable or desired in this situation. And so comments from the working group? Oh. <laughs> and, and I also wanted to clarify, in, in our informal conferences for moral character, we always make sure there's at least one public member of the committee participating uh, to ensure that participation and also one. Okay. I, I would add, I, I like that part about trying to pull together some kind of code and, and being a little bit more thoughtful and putting that together. I actually think it's there. I, I think we have that. I think we have that in the sense of, of uh, how we bring that group together and then how we bring that group, that, that, that committee, that subcommittee's recommendations to the full committee. And we've had some extensive conversations uh, and debates uh, at the committee level uh, regarding moral character determinations. That being said, it's not as formal as it probably could be. And so I think you're right on here uh, when you're trying to say, let's, uh, I use the word formal, but formalize that a little bit. There still needs to be some human, uh, some human yes. factor there, and that's why Derek is doing it. Um, but uh, but yeah, I think that's, I think you're on the right track there. Maybe if I could, um, what I say, uh, build out a little bit more on what you just said from what I've learned. I suspect what happens in some jurisdictions is with clear codification and something like 70 percent seem to have very precise standards and have to study these. Is that that allows the first level of review by a three-person board to pretty much make a decision, and then the full, the full, mostly called board of bar exam, which doesn't look at it, goes directly to whatever the appropriate form of review would be. So it eliminates that one step that is quite time-consuming, and I think we have to have because there may not be as much clarity. So that's something I would suggest might be worth looking at. Probably it's my first project, but to see how those how those differences might impact the level of the number of reviews. Well, I think Mark's staff kind of is that process. You know, they uh, you know at, at least in my uh, you know understanding. Um, you know, they have kind of that laundry list. Maybe it's not written down. Maybe it's not codified as much as we should make it. But um, they are that entity that really goes through there and says, "Okay, here's all the ones that don't rise to the level." And so they, it, it's, just, it's very similar to structure differently, but I think it's very similar. Well, I'm sensitive to comments. I think that Larry has made frequently in our small group meetings, and that is, you want to be sure that you're giving all the process that is due to those who are applying. It is interesting that in other jurisdictions, they don't have as many steps as we do. And I'm, I'm positing that maybe it's because they have charity and they, they understand how the policies are applied. Or they haven't been sued as much as we have. I also had an idea, and that was that uh, maybe incorporate into the structure of the informal conference have one new member so that that, work, that new member can observe and perhaps learn, uh, get a better sense of how the other uh, committee members are uh, are evaluating the applicants. Maybe that's something we want to incorporate. Yes, Paul. Um, I guess I, I would be against um, <laughs> something that basically took those decisions out of the hands of the full committee. Because I think it's there's the educational aspect of seeing all of them. By and large, we will probably accept the recommendations of the you know the, the interview team because that's the current approach. But we have had occasions where somebody had a question and somebody said, "Hey, I just can't go along with that." And so I think it it, it needs to come to a vote of the full committee, um, you know, with the with the input that's you know given in a great way from from the interviewers. We also had, thank you Paul, we also had said that it's important for 
there to be a consensus, more of a consensus in, in that we have had before situations where a, a committee member not on moral character has voiced opposition and ended up changing everybody's mind. You know, so uh, it's also a better form of due process if more people are involved in that, in that, in looking at that application. Well, from a public protection standpoint, that's exactly what we want. Right. So that's why I'm saying I think it's fine the way it is. Yes. And, and, and again, Erica, I would just say I think that this process should be part of what I think should be the training process for new members, not going to the meeting for the first time, which is what I did because I was on that committee. But I don't know if you remember from Jenny, but you role play, you're, a, you're an applicant, you're an interviewer. That's That would be so valuable, and that entire step is eliminated here at CBE for new members. That's what I think is missing, certainly for moral character, for sure. So perhaps incorporating role play in orientation. Correct, yes. No. I think that's a great idea. <laughs> Training materials. So. I, I think we uh, obtained some of the uh, NCB. Anything else? Yes, Larry. Um, yeah, yeah, I completely, as, as you mentioned, Elizabeth, um, I think due process is so integral to this thing, to this aspect of our responsibilities. And, and especially when judging moral character can be so subjective. <coughs> um, did we get into, or is this the area where we thought there might be some ramifications from the North Carolina decision? You know, the whole thing about restraint of trade by, uh, by, you know, by keep, yeah, by trust, by keeping people out of the profession. That was a little bit more, I think, on the cut, the cut score and pass rate, whether that was restraining restraining antitrust. The distinction is on moral character, um, there is an ultimate appeal process to the Supreme Court, and it's an individual decision that is reviewed by the Supreme Court, so there's a sovereign overlooking what we do. Uh, we question, I'm so sorry, we question about the due process that are afforded to the applicants. My understanding is that decisions by the school committee can be appealed to the state bar board yeah. and then further up the chain all the state way to the state, 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 state bar board. Yeah. Right, all the way to the, all the way up to the right. chain. That's something we're questioning, right, in terms of due process. Because my understanding is every applicant is afforded due process. They, right. the, so the, the appeals process would still <coughs> be in effect. We're not, we don't have any, you know, nor do we want to change any part of that. Uh, it's just a matter of what do we do within our um, um, examination of those particular those, those, um, applicants. Um, there have also been situations, I should add, least, that, that the uh, investigating members are undecided, where they can't all agree. agree. So, exactly. So, in those situations, they actually ask for the entire committee to discuss it. So, in that sense, also, it's better to have the entire committee involved. Anything else? So it sounds like some additions and also with the rest we will propose later today, this, we can put this on a track to just keep working on it. No informal conference at this point. Um, I will apologize. There are two items. There's items three and four that didn't uh, make it onto the print sheet, but they are accommodations and accreditation. And if I could just read sort of quickly through those, what, we, what they was discussed. Um, uh, I'll just do that quickly. Obviously, the accommodations that staff were just all the review and the like. Um, it's re um, reviewed by the Austin Management Subcommittee in closed session, and that uh, folks said it's very important to have the experts' opinions on disabilities and the like. Um, and uh, in 2017, there were 800 applications, I think, approximately, and 100 were appealed to the CBE. Um, just pros and cons. Um, 
there's a real sense that the staff and the subject matter experts really guide the decisions that the CV subcommittee members don't have a lot to add. That's the most said, are you going to disagree with an expert psychologist on whether or not this person deserves extra time or a therapy dog in their exam? Um, it's, um, and, and there's, there's some folks said it was it's frustrating to both sides because it's very challenging and complex, and that the number one concern of this was our said due process, at least from the conversations. But the proposed for consideration was to do as much to delegate the accommodations reviews to staff, to have the staff do that. Could you talk about the comment that, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, Elizabeth made the other day with respect to NCPP? Um, so that that um, they should look, and I think that is to accreditation. That's saying that no. No. we're going to be looking more deeply into this. And Amy, I've been in touch with the uh, Texas uh, our director, who was the first person who alerted me to this. But as most of you know, the um, uh, law school admissions council has been involved in litigation on whether it's providing sufficient accommodations. It's recently evidently come to a settlement, and it's a very generous settlement. Essentially, it's kind of an open door approach. And the thought is that once they've done that, the NCBE is then going to have to follow suit, and that will quickly filter into local bar organizations as well, because the argument will be, well, I've had accommodations in other settings, therefore, also in this one. <coughs> so it could, it could change rather dramatically numbers, and Amy will be the person who will follow up on that for you and see whether I'm just throwing let's say scare tactic here, <laughs> or whether in fact there is going to be quite a difference in approach. And it may, if that approach really becomes the, the, the problem, procedure, the norm, it may actually reduce the number of, of reviews, but it will increase corresponding to the number of accommodations. So, so what I wanted to jump in and say is kind of concurrent with what happened in my list class. I had asked the general counsel to start looking at that case. So we, I think, Amy can work with the Office of the General Counsel. And I do think it's quite interesting because in some ways it will reduce the cost of the application review of the post much more of a pro forma process, um, increase the number ultimately of the accommodations granted. So so you have a general counsel would have that as well. Um, I did, and this is an important one because it is one of the largest, uh, the fastest and and and, and uh, cost increase that I think we've seen uh, in some time, and the largest change we've seen across the board in almost all the other aspects of what we're doing. Um, and we've also, I think, been at the forefront and been very, very cognizant of uh, the process and having due process in place, um, again, partially because we're in California and you know, we're a little bit more open to that, uh, partially because um, we're, you know, at risk of litigation and have been involved in litigation on these areas. Um, partly because we've had more than a fair share of calls from Washington and others who, over, who look at these issues very carefully. Um, but I think the group has had, there's been appropriate due process. And I think that's important. While we might be able to put enough stuff into place to reduce staff time and just check the box, and um, I still think that the cost in this area is going to only go up. Uh, and if anybody, if you haven't, and please don't say, if you haven't visited a special accommodations uh, testing site, please do. Um, but those costs are just going to continue to rise. And I, but I just want to make sure that we have due process and public protection in mind as we develop this new. I'm happy to, you know, I want to see something new and, and better if we can, but keep that in mind. Okay. So, so noted. Yeah. Um, so, even if we delegate to uh, staff, or there, there are policy aspects to this. Um, like it took me most of my first year to realize, I'm not going to state the policy in case it's got some confidential aspects, but one particular aspect of how we were approaching accommodations um, for learning disabilities, it, it took me half a year to, to discern the rule because nobody really stated it, but um, to the extent that the, the underlying policies require occasional review, I think that still we have to be involved in that, even if even if we're not involved in the day-to-day -day application of the policy to each case. But in my experience with government bodies, um, we've always tended to want to have a, a kind of a fail-safe 
in the form of review by something close to the governing body before um, people have to resort to the courts so that if there's a the unfortunate screw up, we can maybe um, fix it before um, we spend a lot of money on lawyers and settlements. Noted those uh, in, the, in the evolving document. Quickly on accreditation, um, the um, it's done primarily uh, by staff, and that there are site visits by the CBE, and that there's a obviously the requirements of the non-accredited schools have a certain pass rate, so there's some practices in place. Um, and as Elizabeth pointed out, uh, that <coughs> California has the most expansive qualification options for to take to take the bar and to become a lawyer of many many states. Um, that, that may be an asset that's that be something you want to build on, but uh, that is cited as one of the pros of the current approach. Um, the considerations uh, for the, the group the working group offered is that um, there could be um, a man, the, uh, more clear accreditation legislative agenda and process, and there was um, as a recommendation that the group work to understand and ensure that accreditation practices are consistent with national education standards. So the idea was you could do an audit on accreditation every three years, and that that would you know, affirm that the state is doing its accreditation consistent with best practices and consistent with the best outcomes to protect the public. Um, just as a, to note that, um, and there was some thought that the legislator would, legislature would like to see that kind of audit. It's an affirmation that you're doing the job you're, you're supposed to do. It's consistent with good practice. Um, the, the, the group also considered outsourcing um, accreditation to WASC. Uh, if it was possible to create the appropriate service quality and price commitments from them. But that was not a consideration that the working group felt was worth putting forward. So. Any comments? Question? Yeah. On the auditing, what's the criteria? Uh, Dr. Colton, can you check? He asked, what's the criteria for auditing? And so I think there's already work underway to describe what a good accreditation process is, both in California and other states. And um, you can bar look at what NCPE is doing um, on the ABA. And, uh, to just try to look at the steps and make sure that those are the, that, yeah, you want to do something? There's a, a whole structure that exists from the federal level on down to the state level where standards are in place and certain expectations. And among them are review of the accrediting body on a periodic basis according to a set of published standards that are agreed upon. So it's a several level step and accreditation and recognition are distinct. And what's unusual, I think, in our situation, not to say it's it needs to be set aside, but normally an accrediting body is not also a regulatory body. But whether it's the regulatory body you're talking about or the accrediting body, there are a whole series of uh, clearly set forth standards and expectations, and they're pretty consistent at the state and the federal level. And so the suggestion is that it would be well to make sure that our processes, even if they, even if we combine, just to combine and keep combining, I should say, regulation and accreditation, you need these kind of standards. And one standard is clearly a periodic review. Thanks. Any other comments, questions on accreditation? Um, does it seem like that's a, a reasonable recommendation so the work group can continue to flesh out? <coughs> or do, do we have any public comment on that? <coughs> <coughs> yes, I will. Thank you, Greg Gray, the Stevenson, St. Francis School of Law. I did too many things at once. Um, I wanted to say just that uh, I've spent a great deal of the time the committee has spent uh, considering matters related to individual schools, um, also with respect to the rulemaking process. Um, I served on two working groups uh, concerning the rules that will apply to the accreditation of unaccredited law schools, presently unaccredited law schools, and uh, through many individual cases with a lot of different law schools. And so I, I would comment the present process is pretty rigorous. Um, certainly it's important if indeed there are uh, auditing standards 
that those should be looked at and considered. And uh, ensure that the processes are as close as reasonably possible, given the mission that is necessary for this kind of accreditation, <coughs> excuse me, um, as close as reasonably possible. But I think, uh, frankly, to impose a set of standards that might apply to an accreditor like WASC, which has thousands of institutions of uh, any number of different kinds, is probably overkill uh, for what this particular kind of function is going to accomplish. Uh, this is, after all, intended to ensure reasonably affordable legal education uh, for citizens of the state of California, <coughs> recognizing, of course, that uh, we want rigorous education, we want high quality, and other things that go along with that. So we in the schools, of course, are in the position of trying very hard to continually provide that level of great quality, but at a very affordable price. And uh, the work that the state does to ensure that accrediting standards are appropriate for that setting is probably pretty unique. Uh, so while it's absolutely appropriate to look at some aspects of those auditing standards, I think, uh, and certainly to take an introspective look periodically at what we're doing, um, I'd be very concerned in taking a wholesale set of standards that say the Department of Ed applies to a national accreditor and imposing it upon the body here. I think certainly it's worthwhile referring to them and then conducting some kind of appropriate level internal audit uh, to it on a periodic <coughs> basis. I think the reason anybody would object to that idea um, from my perspective. Uh, but that audit should be conducted in a reasonable fashion given the very specific context we have here. So, thank you. Would you then propose <coughs> that, um, that RAC be involved in that decision making process? Yes, if I could. You know, there, there are uh, a couple of bodies that are very closely engaged with the community fire centers on a regular basis uh, that are not only representatives of the law schools who are actually accredited, but also public. They're, they're certainly involved with a wide variety of different opinions and views. Uh, and so in addition to the work that the committee does, the fine work the committee does on this, I think there's also uh, these other opportunities for folks with some real expertise who work in institutions that are accredited by these other bodies and have the experience of being through those kinds of uh, processes with those other bodies to contribute to the formation of those audit processes. So I would certainly welcome that. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Um, I, I think that we are at the forefront of, 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 of in this area. Um, you know, we we have. Uh, I think it's an area that, um, uh, and most of the schools will agree, they're uh, they have helped uh, uh, to mold and develop this process as it has gone on through the years. Uh, many times, there's a team from one school, you know, who will be on that uh, trip to uh, a school to to, to 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 dive into how they're doing. Um, I would look at and what I might just add to this, and, it, and it's good to review and to expand and to look at this stuff. I'm worried about our though our cost is very affordable, yes, and I, you know, and that's that's good for institutions in California. Um, we've looked at it. We need to continue to look at um, how we make sure that it's it's uh, it's not a burden on this body and, uh, and, and the state bar um, and. Related to that, how we can actually do more. Um, our staff in this area, I've always felt, is, is overworked and underfunded, and it does not have the ability to get out um, as quickly uh, as they need to. Uh, and when we added uh, the historical, when we've added the uncredited, that, that added a significant amount of pressure uh, on that part of. Uh, the staff and the committee's work. Um, so, if we're building a better mousetrap, maybe we need to try and figure out how we. What the workload impact is. Yeah, the workload, how we can effectively change that. Um, so, I <coughs> so kind of, yeah, make, make sure the resources are commensurate with the increase. Okay. Please introduce yourself. Yes. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. 
Uh, I'm Dean Barbieri. I serve as, in the capacity as the Dean of the Law School at John F. Kennedy University, uh, which is one of the Calabar accredited schools. Uh, we are also WASC accredited, and within the last 12 months, uh, the university and the College of Law have gone through both a WASC reaccreditation process as well as a committee of bar examination, self-study, and, um, and site visit. And in both instances, WASP gave our university eight years of continued reaccreditation, and the committee uh, gave us an additional five years. I can say, rather matter-of-factly, that the self-study and the inspection team and the report that came through by the Committee of Bar Examiners was so much more thorough and comprehensive than what we experienced with WASP. Um, having members of the Committee of Bar Examiners uh, sit in on our classes, interview our students, interview our alumni, interview our faculty is invaluable. We learned so much as a result of to performing the self-study that it made our quality of education and the experience for our students much, much better. I think a consideration of contracting out that responsibility away from the committee uh, would not be a good idea. And in particular, the site team that comes always includes another dean of another law school. And that is an amazing learning opportunity for those, for those deans. Oftentimes it might be a new dean who will be assigned to do the site inspection, review the self-study of one of our other Calabar schools. Um, and um, each of the last two reaccreditation visits at JFK uh, were performed by uh, deans who were relatively new from Southern California. Each one of them came out of that saying, I learned so much, and I'm going to be able to bring back so much to our students to make our quality of education better. It's a share, there's great camaraderie among the Calabar schools to share resources and information, and I would be uh, very disappointed to see the committee not have as active a role as it currently does in the accreditation of our schools. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Sounds like, Sounds like you would endorse the committee's thinking. I'm not moving to WASC. <laughs> um, we have seven minutes left in our agenda time. Just looking to Amy to for guidance. We we have um, just uh, a few short items that we could probably walk through. Um, yeah, that? And then, let's try that because we do have some time reserved if we needed to. But if we have two items, I think we could try to um, get through them. But um, we did uh, save some time around 4:30. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, so far, I haven't heard a compelling cry for an informal conference. With the, except for potentially on governance, which we're going to wait and see what we hear by the end of the day. Um, if someone disagrees, please speak now. So um, the next one is Board of Trustees relationship. And this sort of, I think you're familiar with it. Um, there's a report out of the board meeting from the CBE, should it be necessary. One board member is required to attend one CBE meeting. Um, the chair reports only when there's a specific recommendation or approval suggested to the, um, the CBE chair only reports to the board of trustees when there's a recommendation or approval suggested, and the liaison is appointed at the discretion of the board president. So, um, so one of the things that uh, we noticed that the reports have been done by Gail versus a CBE member, and um, they may have been intermittent or driven out by a very full board agenda, so there may not always be time on the board agenda for a report from the CBE. Um, that the board attended, uh, board member attendance at the CBE is good now, but there have been instances where it has not been good. And so if those are the primary uh, communication mechanisms, then you can identify that that might be one of the sources of a breakdown. So that what we consider, and um, we'll look for conversation on this, is that um, ensure, first of all, reporting um, 
it occurs early so that if the CV and the reporting be done by the CVE chair so that the, the, the information is not just only carried by the, the staff of admissions, but that the chair uh, does make a, a report to the programs committee. And um, that the staff would manage the agenda to ensure that this, there are CBE updates and the board is fully apprised of the, of the issues and, and things that the CB is doing. Um, that you would supplement, supplement meeting engagements with potentially more formal reports that don't need to be long, but just a, an update of what the CB is working on. Um, clarify and review the process for um, initiation, review, and recommendation in terms of the, the the recommendations that the CBE makes at the third board of trustees um, and the CBE li liaison to attend as many meetings as possible as opposed to just being required to one but really specify that it's as many if not all. Um, and that the CBE liaison to the board should uh, be, uh, the liaison, CBE liaison should be on the programs committee. Um, they decided not to, the board did not put forward for consideration to separate the CBE entirely from the board as an independent nonprofit or administrative arm of the court. So, Comments on on building a, a stronger working relationship with the board of trustees. So I'm going to talk about this. So I had my name is Karen Goodman, and I sat on the board of trustees. So I've been experienced it from both ends, and I've never felt there was a problem with any sort of communications with the board of trustees. Many of the board of trustees people are people we've known throughout our professional career. So I think that I think these suggestions are okay. But I, I'm not quite sure that there is a, a compelling problem that's been reflected in the volume of the recommendation. So, and, um, and I can just say this very confidently, every president that's been on the Board of Trustees, I have their personal cell phone, and I had the ability with Jim Fox. We started last year, which gets overlooked, by before the whole cry and hue from the legislature, and the deans about looking into the what was going on with the bar the bar exam. Jim and I sat down for breakfast in December of 2016 and talked about specifically the need for our committee to start investigating the cause of the decline of the bar exam. We didn't need to wait for the Supreme Court to tell us. We already started on that. I think it works the way it has, in large part because if we think about this, it's a big state. But most of the bar leaders know, pe know the people that are personally involved. And I'm sure the same thing with Erica now. You are a phone call away from being able to have actual access. We know these people. So, and David, David sat on the board with me as well. There's a lot of cross-pollination. So the idea that there's, there's balkanization, I think, that's, I think that is an absolute myth. So I respect this opinion, but I don't think it's formed in fact. So I will say that just from my experience. So. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments? Or? Paul. Yeah, and I was on the board just before Karen, and, and, and I don't recall any problems either. Sometimes um, not a lot of communication simply means everything is okay. I'll jump in here as well. Um, the, um, I, I think we have had a history of great representation. Um, Bot. Um, in fact, I think almost every former bot member has become chair of this committee. Um, a recommendation is we used to have two people coming, and they would come religiously. Um, that has actually tapered off now. So I see, um, um, uh, uh, thanks for our current partner uh, uh, joining us, but we had an intimate relationship for many years uh, with those liaisons, uh, they were able to report back. Having two, I think, is much more effective, uh, and I'd like to see us go back to that. Um, and I do uh, very much appreciate, and I think it's a good idea to have members of this committee accompany staff and not just have a staff report. That kind of interchange will only, again, increase uh, uh, co the relationship, the cooperation, and the communication. Um, so I think that's a wonderful, uh, a wonderful suggestion uh, as well. But I, you know, I see no crisis at the moment other than trying to maybe fix that one and, and trying to make sure that we get our current and maybe one additional bond member to actually attend every single meeting for, for the whole period. Mm -hmm. It's a tough, tough thing to get asked somebody to do, but we've had a history for years of people doing that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
Yeah, you would that's a good job here. Yes, sir. Just when I reviewed this um, these recommendations, I was concerned that they kind of missed the crux of the issue, which is not so much in my view simply about communication, but it is about the structure um, and a lack of clarity around who decides what. And so a couple of times this came up that you all seem to are in your heads, but of course there was the decision around the definition of minimum competency or who was in charge of the uh, studies that took place in 2017, who had ultimate say over how those were conducted. A more current example I think that have, be have become kind of public and somewhat problematic was the decision that was made to change how we uh, were calculating the fail rate, whether or not those who did not complete the exam were counted as, as, the, as people who failed, those who say failers. Um, that was a decision that was made by the committee that did not come to the board. So that, those are a few examples where I think this question of a lack of clarity around what decisions get made by which body and who has to review what decisions, um, that, that lack of clarity is quite problematic. And I think that is more important and more foundational and structural than whether or not uh, board members attend CBE meetings or CBE meet, meet, uh, members report out to the board. And if I could add to that, Leah, I spent enormous amounts of time in my two years as executive director dealing with a situation where the board had acted without consulting CBE in TFAR. And that was not an example of the kind of, what should we say, collaborative decision making and, and careful review that I would like to think we characterize the relationship. So certainly from my perspective, and I recognize that where you sit may depend on where you stand and so on, it, it, it was not as aligned and as collaborative through communication and talking and understanding the roles and responsibilities of both sides as I deal with it should have been. I would agree so, with, with uh, Leah's statements and, and others. I think we, this is one area we need to dive, obviously we need to dive uh, much deeper. Um, I'll, I'll give one example. That, uh, well, actually, for the example, I actually think the numbers are critical um, because we've seen uh, historically a little bit of advantage to that 17 year um, that when we have good communication and when we have liaisons going back and forth in both directions, um, we don't tend to have those other types of problems on who made what decision and who has authority to make one, you know, a, a decision because we had a problem that worked quite effectively, and it was the two-day bar exam. I'll use that as an example. Um, and we have a few folks here that were around for that. It took a lot of years. Um, I'm glad to say under my chairmanship, somehow it got squeezed through. Um, but there was a whole process that went through from the committee, uh, you know, within the committee, uh, then to uh, the board, and back, and forth, and back, and, and with the court, chiming in, it was quite effective. It, and I don't think either side felt that they, their turf or you know, their role was being asserted. Uh, they, it was very effective and as we see now, it worked. Um, so I, I, I would, as an organizational theory person, I would say yes, communication is a good precursor to alignment. Um, and Leia, the, I'm going to call it now, so maybe we'll take the time at 4.30. Yes. But we have that under um, policy change, under um, authorities, and policy changes, and, and just getting clear around who who has what decision rights. So why don't we hold that for 4.30, and we'll come back with those topics. Wonderful. Thank you. We will continue this discussion at 4.30. And with that, um, we want to get our next presenters on the panel. I'm sorry that we're just shuffling along here, but I just want to make sure that we stay on time and on track with our agenda items. So um, uh, Roger Bullis can join us. And Ron, hi, please. And 
fraud. Let me apologize. Your last name is B, not fraud. Sorry about that. So is this presentation showing up on everybody's laptops? Is that? Yeah. It is or isn't, I guess. It, it is. is. Not. I don't think so, Roger. No, it's on the monitor. The, the power okay. you're on the Purple screen monitor. and not on the laptop. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Sit here. I sit wherever they come to the sun. Well, thank you for having me back again. Um, staff had. Uh, requested uh, because I guess there's been a change in committee structure that I uh, spend a little bit of time uh, telling the group who I am and going uh, through and reviewing some of the psychometric foundations for the examination uh, so pretty much what I will do is I'll, I'll give you a minute or two of background on who I am uh, I'll tell you a little bit about psychometric standards for licensing examinations. Uh, we'll briefly go through the components of the exam and kind of the rationale for inclusion. I think sometimes we get caught up in the day-to-day -day and kind of lose track of uh, why some of these sessions are sitting on the exam. We'll get into a little bit of the weeds in terms of the uh, procedures used for uh, scoring the exam and we'll talk a little bit about scaling because that's one of those uh, kind of mythical mathematical concepts that everybody seems to uh, get uh, caught up on and I'll try to get it down to a level that uh, at least we can kind of absorb conceptually. Uh, I'd like to give you some key uh, statistical results from the uh, current and some previous administrations put it in context. And then give you, uh, we'll finish this up with uh, uh, some preliminary uh, data on the impact of the uh, two-day examination. There is a report that uh, I'm working on and should be um, available to staff uh, at the beginning of uh, February. So uh, my company is Research Solutions. And again, if you have questions as I go through this, let me know if some of this is just old path. Uh, you can raise your hand and say, we've got this, Roger, you know, just move through this. Uh, I did operate as a solo practitioner uh, in 1979, and we formally established Research Solutions Group in 2000. Uh, we provide statistical and technical uh, services in several disciplines, public, private, high stakes uh, testing. I don't think it's much more high stakes than the bar exam. Done work in healthcare education and social science research. I uh, have been working with the, uh, the committee since about 1978 uh, with Dr. Stephen Klein, who many of you uh, know. And my offices are currently located in San Diego. The, uh, the black states on the uh, map represents the uh, states that I uh, consult with annually on the bar exams. There's about a quarter of the states in the country covering about a third of the examinees. Those uh, other states are states that we've had consultancies with in terms of uh, special projects, looking at exam structures, looking at uh, issues surrounding uh, uh, cheating incidents, you name it. We've done it over the, uh, the last 35 years. So what I do do with uh, uh, committees is uh, we do technical work, put, bringing scores together from the different sections. We perform quality assurance. Uh, we do scaling. We do diagnostic uh, statistics and ratings. We do reporting. We do consult on those ad hoc issues. And for a lot of the states, we will document that the examination statistically conform to the uh, NCME, APA, and AERA testing centers. We do maintain databases for psychometric studies. So the foundation for uh, the uh, 
licensing examinations are, are, are saved and stored and have been historically studied uh, the uh, standards for educational and psychological testing. First uh, edition came out in 1954, uh, which makes it just a little bit younger than I am, and it's currently in its seventh edition. Again, it was jointly created by the APA, ADRE, and NCME, which are the uh, national societies studying uh, uh, psychometrics and statistics on testing. Uh, it is the de facto authority for high-stakes uh, license testing, and there are over 300 standards or in detail standards that have been revised over those uh, uh, into, into that seventh edition. And uh, the standards are based in uh, historic and current measurement theory and applied testing practices. It's the uh, standards have been informed quite a bit by the issues that have come up, the court cases that have come up. And they are grounded in practice as opposed to a theoretical, uh, theoretical foundation. So basically, the core domains of the testing standards fall into four categories. And I can tell you going into this is that the, uh, the job of any testing agency is basically to uh, balance those four, uh, four domains. Validity. Uh, basically is the assessment of the accuracy of an examination. And the core uh, issue in uh, validity is that the measurement process is directed toward the abilities it's per, the test is purporting uh, to assess. Those of you who are involved in all of last year's activities are well aware of the core of what validity is all about. And also uh, another concern is making sure that the examinations don't measure something else. It covers the, uh, the adequacy adequacy of the information from samples of questions. Understand every examination cannot ask every bit of information uh, for a body of knowledge that the exam is testing, so it's evaluating whether or not the coverage is, is representative and it's, a, it's appropriate. And uh, you may have read about or heard there are multiple forms of validity tied to the measurement and resulting and resulting decisions. We talk about content validity, we talk about construct validity, we talk about predictive validity. All of that is uh, validities of an examination and the interpretation of the results are established through empirical uh, investigations and through processes as the department through last year. Reliability is different than uh, uh, validity. It's an attribute that measures uh, and concerns itself with consistency and stability of the scores. It's a necessary, but it's not sufficient condition for validity. And the only way we get at a measurement of reliability is to examine multiple people over multiple time periods, over multiple observations. More is better, but the idea here as we go into the next, uh, the next few domains is you want to do it as efficiently as possible. Reliability is always measured on a, a zero to one scale, and that's what the field looks at, that's what the course look at in terms of the uh, nature of the reliability of your examinations. And again, many factors can affect reliability. Uh, the ability level of the people taking the exam. We're always looking, the more homogeneous that group is, the harder it is to establish reliability because the purpose of these examinations are to differentiate the uh, ability levels of examinees. If uh, the groups tend to be more homogeneous, the harder it is to find those discriminations. We're looking for consistency in the observers uh, and individuals doing the measuring, which is one reason why we're so concerned about our grading process and the calibration standards. Another issue of concern is fairness. Uh, basically, questions and content do not favor one group over another. We're always concerned about issues around gender uh, bias, racial ethnic bias. Uh, all, all of those issues fall under the, uh, the uh, domain of fairness. We want to make sure that when we do our examinations, 
is that there's a breadth of formats and methods using there. We do not want to introduce bias based on the methods of evaluation. We're looking for uniformity in testing conditions and standards. We want to make sure that our questions uh, uh, have different levels of difficulty in terms of their presentation. We're concerned when tests change in their uh, difficulty level over time, which is why a lot of the procedures that we have in place on the bar exam address some of those differences. And we want to make sure that pass-fail decisions that are made on one examination is not a, are consistent over time, and that the decisions that we're making are not biased because of one year over uh, differences in, in our tests. We want to make sure that we've got adequate notice when we're making changes in the te uh, testing. I was listening to Lee's comment about the uh, two-day exam, and I think back to how long that decision took. That was a decision that took well over six, seven years to, to happen. I think that was that took this standard and took it to the nth degree. Bottom line on fairness is that what we're looking to do is re reduce the impact of any other factors on the chances of passing. We want to make sure that it's strictly examining ability that's making this happen. And all of this gets balanced out with cost effectiveness considerations. There's, there's not an infinite amount of resources available to do testing. So as, as uh, and it, a group goes through the development and administration of testing, these cost effectiveness decisions are always uh, operating in the background. Also, we want to make sure that we're taking the most uh, uh, effective use of examining time. We do not want to assess uh, undue burden on the examinee, which was one of the uh, underlying uh, thoughts in moving to the uh, two-day exam. We have to be concerned with the cost of grading, the cost of scoring, and basically, from a psychometric perspective, what we're doing, we're looking to do, is to balance uh, reliability per unit time of testing. So as many of you know, there's multiple ways to assess proficiency and minimal competency. We just happen to be sitting in this room because we are uh, operating with written examinations. But don't delude yourself. Uh, evaluations and assessment of competency can be done in any of a number of different ways. But the question again is balancing reliability, validity, fairness, and, and cost effectiveness. And through many years of testing, I think the belief currently is, is that written examinations tend to meet those objectives. So in bringing in a, uh, a testing program together, there's numerous considerations uh, that need to be factored in. Uh, you're all sitting in a room uh, looking at an examination that's been in place for, for many years. The, uh, been through the battles in terms of addressing all of these uh, issues. But the one thing to take away from this is that if you've done these activities and you've gone through these activities once, it doesn't mean that it's completed. Realities are these constantly need to be reevaluated. How much testing time should be uh, allocated? Uh, how many questions should uh, remain on a session? Just because we had eight questions one year doesn't imply that there still needs to be uh, eight questions. So we change the section weighting. Why did we make those changes in the past? Are our grading practices still apropos? to what, what they were. Can we add new graders into this? Can we, uh, can we bank source? Many jurisdictions out there actually allow uh, for the uh, banking of a an, of an uh, passing MBE score. We don't do this. We're involved with company, uh, compensatory scoring. So every one of these are items that go, are in place as people consider the construction and ongoing administration of, the, of an examination. So, uh, with that in mind, I thought what we could do uh, is to briefly go uh, give you a thumbnail sketch of what the current uh, general bar examination is looking like. Uh, now, no, we're, we're operating on a one-day uh, examination session. There's five written essays, still covering 13 subject areas. 
three essays in the uh, morning and two in the afternoon. We've now reduced our examination to one performance task, basically designed to test an applicant's ability to understand and apply legal authorities in the, in the context of a factual problem. And a second day, uh, an MBE consisting of 200 items, only 175 of which are, are live. It was uh, within the last year or so, the uh, NCBE decided to start pilot testing 25 items as, as opposed to 15. And a few years back, they added a, a, a seventh topic area. So if we look at those sections, this is fundamentally the, uh, the target skills that each of those exams are, are attempting to look at. Again, thinking back to what the standards are, we're trying to get as much breadth of coverage of the content area, which is what our multiple choice allows us to do, and targets uh, legal reasoning. Sorry, Dr. Bowles, can, can you go back one? Yeah. Can you explain again what you meant by live? What's such by live? Yeah. Um, the NCBE uh, basically in their examinations have historically had 200 items uh, which they, uh, they, they administer. On any large scale multiple choice testing <coughs> program, new items are constantly required and need to uh, update their bank. The, the way that is generally done in a program such as that, ETS does the same thing in the SATs and the ACTs, there's always experimental items that are included in the test. And those tests aren't considered live, they're considered experimental. So uh, those items in and of themselves won't be factored into your score. They're just, they're there, they collect data on them, they evaluate them, they determine whether or not the question's operating the way it's supposed to. So where does the raw score come from, the 175 live? Correct. Okay. So if we, if we uh, yeah. Um, the writing aspect, I've been to calibration sessions, and they don't really seem to care about well-written answers. Um, so I'm wondering how much that really is a factor. <laughs> yeah. well, who, who's they and <laughs> the graders? The graders. Was that? The, the, the people who are grading the exams. You might want to go to a calibration session. <laughs> I've been to a few. I've been to a, a, a few. I've been to a few. They, uh, as I understand it, in the uh, in the assessment of uh, of uh, scores in there, writing is not as is considered as strongly as as content and presentation of the argument. I, I do understand that. Uh, if we look at multiples, uh, the multiple choice section, again the. The notion of having uh, many items in there is addressing breadth of coverage, which is a validity issue. There's objectivity in the scoring, which increases reliability. And the notion is, is multiple choice testing will give you higher uh, levels of reliability per unit testing time than pretty much any other type of uh, any other uh, method. Uh, another example. Uh, advantage of using multiple choices, the scores can be equated over time, which addresses the issue of, of fairness. And I'll talk a little bit about equating in a bit. And another uh, significant upside on multiple choice items is those items can be reused, uh, which basically uh, improve, improves the efficiency of the exam. If you have to write a new 200 set of items every examination, we wouldn't be having it. An MBE exam. When we think about uh, the essay portion of the examination vis-a-vis -vis the uh, the testing standards, here we're looking a little bit more about the depth of content coverage and addressing again the validity side. The concern on the concern on essay sections is one of reliability, and that is consistencies of graders. And we do whatever we can do to improve the calibration activities. Three, three calibration sessions I know from experience are uh, probably one of the uh, more rigorous uh, 
processes of all the states that I deal with in terms of ensuring ensuring consistency and scoring. The uh, scores on the written section, they can be scaled to uh, objective measures, which uh, enters in a uh, factor of fairness. There's no way we could add in raw scores to these MBE scores without scaling it. We would be subject to the critique that uh, of greater leniency and uh, some of the subjectivity in the construction of the, uh, the essay test items themselves. And a, basically a counter uh, consideration in terms of the efficiency issue is that on every examination, these essay questions need to be recrafted. So, and we have very little opportunity to basically go out and fully test these essay questions. So we're basing, basing our uh, efforts on the experience level of the, uh, of the teams doing the construction. And finally, the uh, performance test the, uh, which I know uh, public opinion it is probably the most valid of, of assessment methods uh, because it actually goes at a lot of these skills that uh, the field believes are being uh, uh, used initially in practice. It is in, uh, just like an essay question, it's subject to concerns about reliability. Uh, like the essay questions, they can be scaled for uh, uh, objectivity. And the need to recraft performance tasks is even uh, more rigorous than that of the essay questions. So the concerns about efficiency are there. And there's a belief that maybe if we had an exam with five performance tasks, it might be a wonderful examination. But coming up with uh, a uh, five um, performance tasks that could meet the balance of the domains would be a difficult task to do. So as I mentioned, uh, we currently have uh, six uh, groups of up to 15 trained graders. They're selected to grade the written questions on a 40 to 100 point scale. They do go through three calibration sections. In any, uh, each of those sections, there's empirical analysis on the, uh, on the grades that are done, and they use that analysis to uh, help for their calibration. In terms of the uh, nitty gritty of score calculations, it's pretty straightforward. Raw scores are uh, five essay questions are summed together, uh, and with one uh, weighted PT, it's given twice the weight of an essay, maxing out at 700 points. And that score is scaled uh, to the average uh, and the standard deviation of the MBE. I'll give you an example on that. Basically, as of this last July exam, each, uh, each section had uh, equivalent weighting. So uh, what, is, what is scaling and, and why is it required? We go back to the, the uh, fairness issue. Fairness criteria dictates that the examination <coughs> remain of equal difficulty over time. Just want to make sure that if you took the examination this July versus taking it three years ago, that your performance would not be uh, indirectly impacted by the difficulty of the examination. And as I said before, looking at essay questions, it's very difficult to inherently control that difficulty level. And as I also indicated before, multiple choice questions don't suffer from those same problems. There's only one correct answer. It's a lot easier to reuse items, so it's, uh, those, they can't be, uh, very hard to remember those and you can't study every item out there. They can control the difficulty of the, uh, of the MBE. This is what NCBE uh, spends a good amount of their time doing by equating. And for those of you who don't understand, fundamentally the purpose of equating is to ensure that when new items are included in an examination, uh, the difficulty level of those items get adjusted. And the way that is generally done is each examination over time has a core set of items that are repeated. And the performance of past uh, examining populations uh, are looked at on those items and compared to the performance on the current examination. 
And so if the performance of the current group on those core set of items is lower than some of the historical groups, then it, the, uh, the assumption is, is that the overall uh, level of ability of, that, of the current group is lower and vice versa. So through uh, some rather elaborate mathematical calculations, the test is adjusted or basically scaled. It's an internal form of scaling. And uh, so through that process, one can be, uh, you're fairly confident that the, a scale score earned on, on the current exam, with this, whatever that score is, is equivalent to a score on the MBE of some past examination and going forward. So basically the process of scaling is to make that adjustment and to put the scores on the written section onto the same scale of measurement as the, uh, the multi-state uh, multi examination. It's done for two reasons. One is to both control for the difficulty levels, but also uh, just simple mathematics allows you, allows you to add it. So it's similar to thinking that if you had a, a temperature in centigrade and another temperature in Fahrenheit, can't add those two together. They need to be placed on the same common scale. So this is basically how the scaling is done. Here's a, on the left here is the uh, written scale. And this just happens to be the distribution of raw written scores from the July exam. At a mean of about 430 and it's average spread of about 38. And here on the left is the MBE scale. The mean on the MBE was basically 143 and a spread of 16.8. So the, prop, uh, the scaling process basically, first of all, says if you had an average score of 429.4, that would scale directly to a 143.2. And if you went up, that 467 is basically one standard deviation above. And the 391 is one standard deviation below. That would basically scale to one standard deviation above the uh, MBE mean score at 160. And, one, and the 391 would scale to a 126. And so on and so forth. The 506 is, is uh, two standard deviations above and so on and so forth. But the thing to recall on this, this isn't just, it's not magic. We're not doing anything to the relative rankings of the applicants on the, on the raw scores. We're basically, we're maintaining the exact same position relative to other examinees. So that's really all scaling is. It's just an opportunity to create a common scale. And the mathematical properties are such that if you're going to add two numbers together, and you're going to do that effectively, you want to make sure that the score spreads on both of the distributions are equivalent. And so that's basically the rationale. So, any questions here? Yeah? How do you determine that you're measuring the same thing? That's, that's a slightly different, uh, this slightly different question. It's not necessarily related to the scaling per se. However, however, uh, there's an underlying there's an underlying assumption here is that the two sets of scores share some common grounds for measurement. And the basis for that assumption. The basis for that assumption is 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 judgment, human judgment, and the and the uh, and the composition of the examination. An evidence based judgment uh, basis for the judgment. This this is one of those areas of sub, uh, subjective interpretation. And, but we do have some empirical evidence, and I'll show you. Finally, the decision-making process, uh, again, pretty straightforward. Above 1440, it's passed below 1390. And if it's between those two, uh, between those two ranges, we go to phase two. Phase two is our regrade process. Coming out of regrade above 1440 is a pass, below is a fail. What we do in regrade is not necessarily what every other state does in regrade. Uh, we come up with a final written score based on the average of two grades. 
I've seen, I've seen uh, some states will apply the maximum score coming out of three grade. Some states will allow the graders to look at the first, first grade before they do the second grading. So the, the process, the regrades process is very widely, and I'll sh uh, let's show you a little bit about what was, goes on. And that, there's a third phase in California. And that phase is if an, uh, any, on any given question, the first grader and the second grader are, are more than uh, 10 points away, there's, yet, there's a final judgment that's made by a, a senior grader on that. So basically an examinee who's within the uh, fairly close to the passing point will get three opportunities to have their, their scores adjusted. So I, I've shown this chart before. I, I upgraded it based on my current understanding of where the, where the passing scores are located for each of the states in the United States and who's using equal weighting on their examination sections and who's using uh, a differential weighting. So as we can see, California is up at 144. Uh, Oregon used to be up there, and Oregon uh, dropped their uh, passing square this last year with some fairly disastrous uh, outcomes. Their percentage of applicants passing went up significantly more than a they thought were, uh, was going to happen, and we'll see why here in a minute. There's only, uh, I believe, about eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, only ten states now using differential, differential weighting. Most states now are using 50-50 weighting. It's the weighting that's, uh, it's the weighting that's promoted by the, uh, is being used under the uniform bar examination. And we'll see that you see that the, the modal of the most common passing scores is, is a one one thirty five. So you can figure that out per, uh, percentage wise as as about 60, 60 some odd sixty some odd percent. So there it is. There's the uh, there's your stick in your wallet thumbnail uh, understanding of how how scoring is done uh, at the bar. Behind the scenes, there's obviously a lot of activity going on uh, in terms of ensuring all the, the quality of scores, uh, the, uh, uh, everything is getting linked up correctly. So if we look at how California is functioning relative to other states, uh, there's only a couple states currently that don't use the, the multi-state bar examination. Louisiana, because it's still uh, it's under a, uh, a separate, uh, still using some of the Napoleonic code in there. And Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico uh, has its, uh, it's one of our clients, has its own examination. They started, uh, they developed their own starting about 20 some odd years ago. And uh, makes every effort that they can to uh, refresh it. It's a, it's a rather arduous task. Um, the, uh, currently, California is one of 29 states that draft their own uh, written questions. Most of the other ones are uh, other states are using the uh, NCBE's uh, multi-state essay questions. Uh, we're one of 36 states uh, that use their own or NCBE's performance task. Uh, you can see that almost every state uses the same form of scaling that California does. There's a handful of states that don't do it, and I'm, to be honest with you, I don't know how they calculate their, their total scores. Uh, and then we're one of 37 states that now uh, equally weight the exam. And we do end up weighting our uh, MPT just slightly lower in the overall calculations. Um, Multiple forms of, of regrade policies in the states. Most do basically what we're uh, doing in terms of uh, regrading the sample of uh, applicants who are within some score range uh, just below the, uh, the passing point. Uh, some states regrade applicants who fail uh, by some preset number of points uh, or fail, and I put fail in quotes because they set a, a standard, fail a certain number of, of written questions. So they have uh, kind of a compound rule in terms of 
going into regrade. Some states will regrade everybody's questions, and obviously it's, those states don't have a, many applicants, which is probably why Delaware is the only state that I'm aware of that does it. Uh, some states read uh, all of their questions twice, and they have a resolution uh, process. Uh, and that's, I know Puerto Rico does that. Uh, some states regrade every failing applicant. Uh, again, I, Minnesota, I believe, only has 400, 300, 400 applicants, so again, they can afford to do it. And some states have uh, no regrading policy at all. And at one point, I know NCBE, from a psychometric standpoint, uh, proposed that the UBE have no regrade built in. Uh, so uh, I understand that there have been significant softening on that one because the complaints were a little bit high. So just a very brief uh, representation of, the, of a scoring example. Here's an applicant uh, who ended up getting uh, five scores between 50 and 75 had a performance task score of 70. So when we simply added those together and uh, multiplied their performance task uh, by two, we ended up with a 455. So the next step after that's taken care of is we scale that raw score. And uh, that scaling equation, let's see if this is a little, oh, I'm shooting too many screens. Uh, the scaling equation basically comes out of the whole scaling process, and it essentially, it weights the raw score, and that's what that 4.3038 is. That's actually the, the weight for the uh, July 2017 exam, and then it's adjusted on the basis of a constant. That formula changes every exam based on the performance on the MBE and on, on the written questions. So that 455 that that person earned uh, resulted in a scale score of 1537. And, and in the process, the, uh, these scores are carried out to this number of decimal places. This person happened to score a 1444, uh, which just happens to be the, uh, the, our cut point. So ends up at a 1488.832 based on our 50-50 weight. So the final decision on this person is, is basically a pass. So that's, all of this boils down just to these set of calculations. By the way, that, uh, if you look at that 455, that 455 is actually basic, uh, is about the average passing score on the exam is uh, on, a, on a written question. That's basically about a, uh, a 65, 16 to 65 points uh, uh, on, on a single essay question. Now understand one thing often people ask about, in, in, if you're ever queried about this, understand our, our scale of grading doesn't start at zero. <coughs> our grading scale starts at a 40. So uh, there is no 28, there's no 34. We start at a of 40 and essentially all that is basically doing is we, if you run from 40 to 105 point increments you can basically see the size of our individual grading skill. And CBE uh, has uh, for each of their multi-state essays they promote a six point grading scale. So the grading scale of our essays actually offers uh, more uh, room for variation in assignment of scores. So in, in the few minutes I have left, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll walk you through kind of quickly so what some of the results are, and I'll try to put them into some context for you. Uh, there were 80, uh, roughly uh, 8,546 uh, uh, test takers in July, and that's uh, of, uh, let's see, the significance of that number in a second. Average raw score of 429. And having looked at these scores for years and years, it was kind of tough for me to wrap my head around a score that was so low, but I needed to recall that we were only operating with five written questions in one uh, 
the uh, MBE score of 1432. Uh, by the way, the, the normally N, uh, NCBE report stat is a 143.2. We just multiply uh, our scores by 10 uh, to help eliminate some of the issues with decimal place. And with a total scale score of 1430, the overall pass rate was 49.6%, and first timers passed their rate of 62.4%. The written score reliability was 0.79 out of 1, and I'll get, you, I'll get you some context for that in a second. And then our total score reliability was 0.92, which was, which it was very, very good. So if we take a, to get some of these numbers into context, if we take a look at the number of test takers from July 2016 to July 2017, it was the largest one-year increase that I can recall in total number of test takers. Uh, and I'm sure people in the operations department must have felt the, the pains uh, of that. Uh, but then again, if you look at the difference between 2015 to 2016, it was the uh, one uh, largest percentage decrease of, of any year that I can recall. So uh, all of the activity that was, has been going on over the last couple of years seems to have, have uh, had, its, had its effect on the uh, on a number of, of takers. Uh, so it's been fairly, not only chaotic here dealing with uh, all of the issues that have been in front of us, it's been pretty chaotic in terms of Sammy's taking the exam. This, this graph is, uh, you take this out of Statistics 101, this is that very nice bell-shaped curve. And that black line represents the passing score, and that uh, red line represents our average score. So it's, it's no surprise to anybody, our passing rate is just about, it's just about 50%. Uh, as, the, as that distribution would move right or left, basically our passing rate would, would go up. And for those of you who are interested, and this was kind of an interesting phenomenon, uh, our applicants sitting for a second and third time passed at a pretty uh, pretty decent rate relative to past exam examinations. This used to be kind of a very steady curve down if you were second time or third time, fourth time, it would descend very uh, gradually uh, down, to, uh, down to zero as you took more examinations. And I, uh, back well, to your to your question about uh, the is there empirical evidence about whether or not uh, these examinations are these sections are are covering consistent information. One way we look at that is by examining the relationship of the scores uh, on each of the respective sections. And this is another this is another graph that would come out of a. Uh, a basic statistics group. This this represents the relationship. Every dot on that uh, graph represents an applicant, and basically the relationship is is very strong. We've seen this historically. Uh, this is measured on a zero to one scale, and our correlation here is is 0 0.72, which is it's fairly happy. It doesn't imply that there aren't people who are performing high on one section and low on another section, those uh, boxes where I have the, uh, uh, this, the questions where I have the green boxes represents those, those people. There are people who actually scored as high as uh, almost 1,700 on the MBE, uh, but were basically below passing on a written score. So this, this graphic uh, presents the overall passing uh, rate on the, uh, the bar between 2007 and 2007, excuse me, 2017. And we can see that uh, back in 2008, where we did a lot of the analyses last year, uh, up to 62% had fallen all the way down to 44% last year. We saw a six, uh, basically a 6% rise uh, in the uh, passing rate over the, uh, over the time period. And this, uh, this graph basically breaks out that same information, but does it by first-timers uh, versus repeaters. And we can see between 2016 and 2017, we saw a 5% in 
increase in, in bar passage rate, which is, uh, which is pretty good. It's basically almost the same rate that we saw back between 2007 and 2008 when we had achieved our highest passing rate in, since 2000. What's of what's particular interest is what happened between 2016 and 2017 with our repeaters. Since that rate went up 11%, which is about as high as we've seen a uh, bar passage rate go up in, in a single year for repeaters. So kind of in, cl in closing up, uh, as I indicated before, I'm, kind of work I'm working on a report now looking at that input and the impact of our, of our two day exam format kind of went out at this to try to basically address three questions I knew were floating out there. First of all, was the two-day uh, format easier for applicants? Uh, did the change uh, to a two-day format have a differential impact on, uh, on some subgroups? And finally, were the psychometric characteristics of the examination compromised by going to a two-day two -day format? This chart, so I took a look at the last, last three uh, examinations, 2015 and 2017, and looked at the uh, various, the average, these sort of represent the average section scores and the uh, percent passing. And what I did is to examine the changes that had occurred uh, between 2015 and 16, which represent basically the same exam format. 15 to 16, same examination. Uh, first timers, so basically this isn't contaminated at all by uh, people, number of repeaters that we have. And then I looked at 2016 to 2017, when basically the major change, at least vis-a-vis -vis the examination itself, was just going to a two-day format. So one thing that uh, you know immediately pops out is that the improvements from 2016 to 17 for this group were higher than what they were in 2015 to 16, where there was actually uh, drops. So we did see we did see increases. We saw it in the MBE, saw it in the written score and the total score. And the passing rate, supposed to going down 3%, went up 3, 5%. So then this starts begging the question, okay, was this a function of the examination being easy or what? Not a straightforward question to answer. So the first bit of uh, evidence uh, to kind of argue against this is that uh, the red line uh, represents <coughs> California's uh, MBE mean, and the blue line represents uh, the national MBE. So what happened between 2016 and 17 is the entire country scores rose on the MBE. So it wasn't just California. And you notice how the trends between California and uh, uh, this, the uh, nation very close. As a matter of fact, these things correlate almost perfectly. We do make up a major portion of the uh, national examination. But we basically saw a 15-point uh, difference between the California and the national average, which is slightly lower. So when I projected, uh, based on historical standpoint, California average actually might have been even a little bit higher based on the historical relationship. So it's not as though we had an aberrant finding here. Our finding was pretty much consistent with the rest, rest of the country. The other thing that I decided to do is to take a look at the repeaters. And I took a look at, I took a, look at a cohort of first-time takers in 2015 and tracked them into 2016, said, what happened on your 2016 exam? And I did the same thing for people who took the exam first time in 2016, and they, and they failed, and saw what happened in their subsequent attempt. Thought maybe, well, this is another way to take a look at it, because the thing that had changed was going from a two-day, a three-day exam to a two-day exam. And what I found, lo and behold, is that the, uh, the, there was an improvement in the MBE that was significantly higher than that previous cohort in the written score and the total score, and they passed at a, a higher rate. So again, the question is, was this basically due to the change in format, 
or some other factors that are going on. There's been a lot of anecdotal evidence out there that uh, preparation for the examinations have changed as people are seeing the uh, failing rates decreasing. We, uh, Ron and I have been working with the law schools and we'll get further insights into this as we get the data, but we've been told that uh, a lot more emphasis is being placed on uh, preparation on the uh, on taking multiple choice tests. But this very intriguing result is going to require, uh, I think, some additional years of, of examination. So when we look at the question about the impact on gender, uh, our simulations suggested that there would probably not be more than a percentage or so difference in, in bar passage rates. So what we're looking at here are the average performances of males and females. And that, that last box shows the difference in performance on each of the years between men and women. So in 2015, for example, uh, women scored 31 points slower than males did. In 2016, they scored 40 points slower. And here in 2017, under a different examination structure, it's only it's a 31 point difference. Uh, and certainly for the written and the uh, total score. We saw an eight point drop uh, in uh, difference uh, versus a, a six point drop. Where did all of that end up? Uh, what effect did all of that have? Basically, uh, only a 1% change between men and women, which was basically the same rate that we saw under the three day exam. So, uh, consistent with what the simulation models showed and uh, exactly the same as uh, what happened under, th under a three-day format. And then in terms of uh, race and ethnicity, uh, these, each of these bars represent the net difference in bar passage rate uh, between uh, the three groups, the Asians and uh, purple, blacks and red, and Hispanics and green. And each bar represents the percentage difference between the passage rate of that particular group and Anglos. Then there were some operating concerns that by uh, shortening the exam and weighting the MBE uh, equal to the written section is that we would have found uh, uh, differences. One group might be impacted uh, uh, more severely than another group. And basically these, these findings suggest that, uh, that we did not discover this. Uh, we look at Asians, for example, uh, it was a 13% difference in passing rate versus 14 uh, the year before that and 13% before that, so no, no differences. Uh, similarly for the, for the uh, other groups as well. As a matter of fact, Hispanics, it was a percent, uh, percent less. I, I did subject all of these to some, uh, a little bit more uh, rigorous statistical tests that will be in report and basically found, found no differences. And finally, the last issue is, was the exam's psychometric qualities jeopardized uh, because we shortened the written section? Well, we knew when we shortened the written section, we could no longer give it the same weight that we had given in the past because we had a shorter exam that was basically less reliable. And so uh, we ended up giving the MBE more weight. And the net, the net effect of that is that, uh, again, because the MBE's reliability has been increasing over the last several years, is that the net reliability ended up being 92. The difference between 92 and 90 is, is maybe statistical dust, but the reality is uh, net net is that the uh, reliability uh, not only didn't decrease, it actually improved a little bit. And the uh, correlations are down there suggesting that the relationship between the two sections of the examination didn't change uh, either. So this, again, this will all be coming uh, to Amy in probably another week or so to draft the report. 
Anybody awake? <laughs> Wide awake. <laughs> Any questions? I do. How? I do. Is there a marriage for us? <laughs> <laughs> um, how is your analysis impacted for attorney applicants who are not required to be an MBE? This is a good question. This is all looking at just the uh, looking at just the uh, uh, general bar exam papers. I understand that. So, is are there is there a separate analysis for attorney applicants, or is it your understanding? that perhaps the statistics or analysis here also um, also applies to attorney applicants? Uh, I have to think about that a second. The, uh, it would tend to, it would generalize across, <coughs> it would tend to generalize across it because basically the only thing that the attorney applicants are gonna be impacted by is the, is the scaling. Since their examinations aren't weighted in terms of arriving at a total score, it would it would have a it wouldn't have a, a, any any effect due to the changes in the examination itself. switch over to Ron B. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about um, the job analysis. Um, there are a few points I want to highlight um, as we get into this um, next portion of the presentation. One of the, um, uh, well, there are a few issues that we are uh, learning from our last rounds of the bar exam studies. And there are some lessons that we want to apply since that time. One of the concerns that has been raised in this process has been um, inclusion. Uh, we heard on multiple uh, uh, occasions that about um, concerns about who participated in the studies and in the degree of participation. For example, should CBE members um, uh, participate as panels or group participants on panels? Um, and at what point um, the CBE was engaged in the uh, final product or in the bars exam studies. So one of the goals in this next round of analysis is to reformulate a working group that includes critical stakeholders along with research experts to help describe the methodology and findings and manage expectations as we progress throughout the study. So the idea is to get involvement very early from um, as early as um, through the um, vendor selection or the um, selection of our uh, contractor for this next task and throughout the life of the study. So um, obviously uh, we have to work on the size of the working group. We're working on the details about how that process will work. The other item is about methodology. Um, so we believe that a multidisciplinary working group will provide greater opportunity to understand the process as well as the outcomes and results, um, like I mentioned, throughout the various stages of the research. Um, and uh, the engagement of national experts, which is one of the uh, items that we are, uh, one of the things that we're striving for is to gain national expertise onto this, um, uh, by or, uh, including them in our working group, um, will uh, strengthen the quality of uh, this work product and so, um, and help address some of the concerns about um, you know who was brought to the table and um, the quality of the work that um, that that was yielded in, in the last round of studies. So, as I mentioned, we aspire to hire some national experts. Um, and one of the other concerns that was expressed was the cost of the studies. So uh, these studies um, are um, can be. Um, expensive. We, we uh, want to bring national experts um, and we want to engage a working group. There are costs associated to that, whether it's um, costs for meeting, travel, um, and for their participation. We um, are um, going to need a, a good budget for that. And some of this can carry a heavy price tag. So we are um, seeking funding opportunities and we have heard um, from organizations, an organization nationally that's expressed interest in funding this research endeavor. And they are uh, a large organization that um, has re uh, funded other legal 
education initiatives around the country. So um, a lot of it stems, and you'll hear this from Ron's presentation too, from the groundbreaking work that we are conducting here in California. The methodol you're gonna hear about the methodology and about the innovation that is going to be applied for this next round. Okay, and with that, I will let Ron take over. As you are all familiar about the process that we went through last year, conducting the two studies, uh, standard setting followed by content validation, um, in some ways the sequence of conducting these studies uh, is not strictly following the order that they are often done. And the final report that we submitted to the Supreme Court also pointed out the content validation study and other things we need to follow up with a series of additional activities. One of the things is really to conduct job analysis because if you follow the sequence of evaluating the exam, usually um, job analysis is the first thing that you do. So out of many reasons, um, that's the first the task we're going to follow up this year. And here I have listed, um, out of multiple considerations, some major uh, reasons um, uh, that call for a comprehensive and in-depth analysis of job, uh, analysis or legal practices. Uh, one is just what I mentioned is findings from last year's content validation where um, the source of information is national survey of legal practices um, for us to have better understanding about the changes in legal practice. California specifically would benefit uh, our understanding about the extent to which the exam content is in alignment uh, with legal practice in California. Statutory requirement also, uh, which was passed last year, require us to have a comprehensive analysis for the exam every seven years. And as I mentioned, the job analysis is the first step in uh, following through that process of comprehensive analysis. The third point is what Roger mentioned about the development of the professional standards for examination. And what I quoted here is from um, the standards of examination in 14.14, I think. It says the content domain to be covered by credential in test needs to be defined clearly and justified in terms of the importance of the content for credential worthy performance in an occupation and profession. So here in the definition, uh, you already see one of the key elements, which is the importance of the content. I'll go through the other uh, major points that we, in this uh, planning process, is trying to uh, clearly define what are the issues, the importance being one of the dimensions in the, the questionnaire for job analysis. Depending on the scope um, and purpose of the study, uh, Job analysis could vary a lot. And here are the things that I can think of, uh, potential application of job analysis results. It will ensure that the exam content, as I mentioned, also citing the uh, uh, professional standards of the examination. To ensure that the content in terms of breadth, and depth, and complexity is related to knowledge and skills required of entry-level attorneys. The second point, uh, I think, from a historical point of view, it's also a very important element that provides documented link uh, between exam content based on a job analysis study and the current legal practices. It also um, assess the adequacy of the exam format. This, this has to do with the, uh, the scope and purpose of the uh, job analysis. It could be used like we did last year, just as a way of assessing the validity of the content. Or it could also be used to um, assess whether the existing exam format is appropriate in tapping into the underlying knowledge and skills. So this will get into the exam format. And in the future, the results from the job analysis will provide blueprint for question development and solutions in the future administration of the exam. And the final point, which is also very important, it will inform the development of minimum competence definition as the basis for standard setting. Uh, study. You can stop me anytime if you have any questions. 
So, Rob, can I ask a question on sure. that, that subject right there? Um, and this is, I heard it last week as part of the working group, um, is this last part about informed development of minimum competence definition. I had, maybe I was misunderstood, if it's entirely possible, but I thought that, um, that the committee uh, in working with RAC was going to work on the definition of minimum competence. Did I misunderstand that? Excuse me, hi. So um, it's on uh, the RAC's goals. It's also a goal for, I think, operations and um, the O&M um, subcommittee here. So I think that um, what Braun is conveying is the fact that the job analysis will um, yield data that can help refine that definition. So I don't think that um, this study is um, circumventing the other two parts that are going on. If anything, it will supply information that can help um, with that um, definition of uh, minimum competence. Well, I think what's not clear from this, because this is certainly suggests that this is going to be the focus of the job analysis study, and that's and actually what I understood last week, was that that group, the working group, would be working on a definition of minimum competence. So I don't know who's supposed to be doing this. This kind of somewhat goes back to, I think, Leah's comments earlier, is who's, who's in charge of what? Um, and uh, I mean, we've already, we put together, um, Greg Brandis to put together a pretty good list of starting of all the research that's been done already on minimum competence. And I thought that was what we were working on. Um, so I certainly want to make sure we're not at cross cross swords. That's that's all. Um, and make sure that everybody's on the same page. Well, my understanding of the job analysis is um, there does not need to be a definition of minimum competence in order to do the job analysis. But as Amy indicated, I think the job analysis results may inform what that definition of minimum competence should be. Um, so. You know, and it depends really on the sequencing of the activities that are already planned versus the completion of the job analysis, which is going to take some time. I believe as Ron goes through these slides, you'll see. So I think it's an informative that process. From another perspective, the relevance of the minimum competence in job analysis results is that the purpose of job analysis is not to evaluate the performance of the, the um, study subjects which is in the context of the employment that there is a lot of job analysis for that purpose. For our purpose to use the information to evaluate the content validity, I think the key focus is the minimum competence. So there are different ways the concept of minimum com competence will play throughout the process. They'll probably pro provide us very rich information to have a discussion about minimum competence in a different way than just an abstract trying to come up with the bullet points of what constitutes minimum, minimum competence. So the first activity uh, throughout the process is to, to um, identify uh, testing services with <coughs> specialization in job analysis. Uh, we'll go through a request for information process. And we have to reach out to, to several potential uh, vendors, uh, including California Department of <coughs> Consumer Affairs. Uh, as Amy mentioned also, depending on uh, how we do this, uh, the co potential cost could vary significantly. Um, uh, there's an organization that already expressed the interest uh, partly because the scope of the study and far-reaching impact of the study in fun providing funding for us. So the second uh, task for us is um, in parallel uh, issuing the RFI, we'll um, move forward to request funding for this project. Also, just go into a little bit more about the research method and process of conducting the, uh, the study based on my literature search of this particular area. Um, usually the first step is to convene a focus group. Uh, the focus group, similar to all of the other focus groups, will consist of eight to ten subject matter experts. And uh, the role of the focus group is to develop um, um, questions or define the main issues 
and after some sample question questionnaires, I developed a pilot test the questionnaire, and come back to redefine some of the uh, task statements or definition of different domain knowledges. And the final product of this focus group is is a questionnaire that we'll send out to the uh, study subject who participate in uh, the survey. A focus group would ensure that the task and knowledge statements in the survey reflect the current practices in the legal profession. Sometimes in this kind of study, the laws will involve more than just a focus group in the initial stage of information gathering. They have some part of it that involves observation or interview, all for the purpose of just refining the, the questions that will uh, eventually be part of the questionnaire. Another part of the process involved um, the working group. Um, it was mentioned that the existing working group will lead the process of selecting and evaluating the, the vendor. And after the, the contractor has been selected, uh, it will transition to a new working group. And all of the details about the composition or the process of creating a new working group is still under discussion. Uh, but um, the working group for the study, I think it's uh, beneficial to have that transition is, has to do with the scope and the impact, potential impact of the study uh, requiring different kinds of a composition uh, and representation of stakeholders. And throughout this process, this new working group will play a very important role, um, similar to getting feedback from other stakeholders. And the last two parts of the process is simply just sending out the survey and getting back the response data and analyzing the data to look at the results. Uh, some of the key elements, thinking about what goes into the survey, um, these are the things um, I can think of uh, depending on how the questionnaires are constructed. You would ask about the setting or practice area of the attorney responding to the survey. And for each of the tasks, uh, this is similar to what was um, reflected in the NCB study, you will ask the frequency of performing specific tasks and the knowledge skills required to perform those tasks. And this is something in addition to what's captured in NCB study, you will ask whether the tasks being performed are needed for entry level attorneys trying to dis differentiate the level of difficulty or complexity of task performance. This is the kind of a question that will help us understand better uh, the abilities and skills in terms of what's required for minimum competence of both versus for those that experience the uh, attorneys. And also criticality, which is similar to important scale a lot of times, but in many of these surveys, it's hard to distinguish important scales depending on the underlying measures. Uh, another way of phrasing the question about criticality is to ask the risk of negative conse consequence from less than competent performance of the task. <coughs> As you could imagine, um, all of these questions related to tasks, depending on how many task statements or knowledge domains in the example of NCBE's study, it included more than 150 uh, task inventory for the general uh, practice questions. And then if you break it out into specialization, the total number of questions for survey respondents is more than 400. Um, survey response is a challenge. Uh, for any survey respondent to be able to complete the questions carefully and reliably, that's another challenge. So one of the ways of overcoming this challenge is something that's the new development in survey technology and tool. Instead of <coughs> using a online static survey asking each respondent to go through all of the questions, pages after pages, it's to use what's called either random moments or um, recently more popular is experience sampling. And using a smartphone app, you could just have the survey uh, participant download an app 
and they will get notices at random moments throughout the study period. And when they get a notice, they will tell us what they are doing in terms of the task that they are performing, in terms of the knowledge that's required to perform the task, in terms of difficulty, complexity, a series of, of questions related to what they are doing. And then when you get the random moment data from all of the participants throughout the study period, whether it's one week or two weeks, it gives you a representative sample in terms of the frequency, importance, all of the other dimensions you ask, and that gives you more reliable and complete data set, partly because each responder requires no more than two to three minutes to answer a question. And this is a method that we have tried at the bar to conduct a workload study, and to develop the smartphone app it will be part of our uh, process going forward to try to identify a programmer for this, and as well as uh, linking it to funding for, uh, for this project. I just want to make a comment that this is one of the innovations that I think California is going to bring to this work, um, as well as one of the, uh, this, an advantage that we have certainly as compared to the national conference and talking to them about some of their challenges with the job analysis um, with respect to getting attorneys to participate. So on a you know, totally independent process, many of you may be aware that we moved to online billing for the fee statements and created agency billing functionality. And we now have thousands of law firms um, um, sort of registered with us for agency billing purposes. In those, uh, in that application, we know exactly who all their lawyers are, how long they've been in practice, and we're communicating regularly with the firms through that channel. So I feel quite positive that as soon as we're ready to start um, feeding information to law firms around the state, about this, uh, the job analysis study, and we seek participants. We will be quite uh, successful, and one reaching all the attorneys in the state, I think our participation rate will be quite high. And development of the tool that's going to make it easier and more modern in terms of the way that we ask young attorneys, in particular, to engage with us, is only going to enhance our participation. The participation rate. That's all I have. Uh, any questions? Okay. Time frame? Do we have a sense of the time frame? Um, we talked about uh, the job analysis being about 18 months, right? That's usually the estimated time, uh, considering all the different components. Of course, our process has something that's slightly different than the normal process. Um, Department of Consumer Affairs, they do this throughout the year for different kind of occupational analysis. So their standard operating procedure, uh, partly because they are doing this very often uh, or having to do with the complexity of different uh, occupational analysis, their time frame usually is nine months. Um, uh, I could imagine this varies significantly from one study to another. So, Ron, I have a question in terms of budget. So, what are you estimating the budget to be for this? Certainly to cover the contractor service and another important component, um, we'll have to talk to the contractor to <coughs> what extent that they would support the use of this new survey tool and to develop a new survey tool will take time. And we'll also ask the funder to provide um, just resources for managing the project throughout the period, uh, ranging from one year to 18 months. So all of these are internal resource, contractor development of the tool. Those are the major items I could think of. Um, so, as, so if I heard that right, you, you, what you have are subject areas, but you don't yet have a budget. Right. Yeah, okay. And then Access Le uh, Lex Institute, how much would you uh, anticipate requesting that all of the funding be uh, provided in a grant from them? That's we, the... We, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you. Are you going to say something wrong? That's our goal. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to also note that uh, we have um, $150,000 in our budget for 2018 allocated for, the, uh, for this research. So it, it would be anything above $150,000. And in turn, with Access Labs Institute, so I was doing a little bit of research while you were talking, would they then have 
have access to the information so that they could use that information for their work as well. I could imagine certainly at the end of the study, the study report would be released to the public in terms That's of the data. Question. That's a different in terms question. So, so because they really are, uh, as far as what at least the research, the website indicates, they are really a uh, a group that uh, puts together kind of forward research projects for the future of practice practice of law. Mm -hmm. So, would they then, as as part of the consideration for the grant, have access to the information that? Uh, the state bars acquiring by virtue of the survey and the, and the focus groups, or however the structure is going to work. Is it not something that would be determined via a negotiation process with access? Like they haven't asked us for anything yet. I'm thinking about the um, process we just undertook with respect to the productive mindset intervention. There's requests for information. We went back and forth at the end of the day. We're providing very little information. So. I think the raw data from the survey, a lot of people will be interested in it, and that's something we need to think through in making a decision about how much of it, even though all anonymized, uh, could be shared with other researchers. Thank you. Um, I was curious about the, the institute as well. I hadn't heard up until now who that was. Um, is that the only entity you've gone to? Have you gone to far? Uh, I know I'd like to look into that entity a little bit, and, and, and I know as a committee, I think it's important that we have a sense of uh, that agreement and, and the details of, of what information is out there and what information is not. Um, so um, it, it, maybe you can describe how that relationship came to be or where that I think we have had a relationship, Leo, you had communication with them. Uh, my part of it is I went, I attended a conference that they held last year. Their conference reflects the central focus of the organization, which is to provide funding to do a lot of legal practice related studies. So part of the conference is they have sessions with the researchers that they funded uh, presenting their study results. Uh, graduate PhD students and they gather empirical data to look at different areas of legal practice. Our study will fit into the model of their the mission of the organization. As far as other potential funders is concerned, I'm not aware of. Do you have anything to add about this organization? No, other than that, this is the organization that is funding objective rights of intervention that was um, facilitated without our involvement. And that's actually how I came to learn about Access Lex. I know that um, Elizabeth is quite familiar with them. It's uh, changed uh, in recent years into more of a grant making and research entity as opposed to loan servicing. It's got out of the loan servicing business. So I'm sure there are other potential funders and that's something that we'll have to look into. This is very preliminary at this point. And then what? I'm sorry. Um, um, what what is the status of, of the other studies, um, uh, or the other study specifically, the law school study? Uh, I know I, I've told staff that I think it's important that those are all on our agenda at each time. Uh, we can't go between members of uh, uh, committee meetings and not have some kind of update. Uh, I know you said there wasn't much on that, but if we've developed a list of schools that are going to participate, I actually, I for one think that is something that does need to be reported, and I think this committee needs to know who those institutions are, uh, and that we do need to continue to have study, or, or I'm sorry, to discuss the status, the status, and, and why we don't have the cows at the table, and what, because I don't think we can move forward without them, and what we need to do to make that happen. So where are we with that study? Participation of law schools, that's been the, our focus from the beginning when we talked about this study. And as you might recall, uh, in several of the meetings, uh, the issues are related to privacy, uh, FERPA, um, and 690. We're all trying to resolve their concerns, and along with other uh, concerns about the study. 
So the potential participants varies a lot from the first time that we sent out a survey, more than 22 or 25, I recall, schools expressed an interest in participating, including ABA, CALS, and uh, registered schools. Um, I think the, the last point when uh, the interest in participating started to emerge more clearly is after the, uh, the standard setting study was completed. At that point, it appears there was no one who was interested in participating in the study. And a, a month, a, about a month later, um, there was a suggestion for us to change the focus of the study to move the cohorts from 2008 and 16 comparison to add 2017 as part of the, uh, I think this change we discussed in some of the meetings, I don't recall which one. So at the end, the study design was changed from the two comparison of 2008 and 16 to 2013, 16, and 17. So it's a three cohort study. With this design change, uh, many of the ABA schools expressed interest because they see the potential benefit of learning more about the impact of two-day exam. Um, from there, um, at the end, I think we had 12 ABA schools. There, there's also a change during this period. Uh, Cal schools earlier expressed interest, but at that point, uh, none of them had any interest in participating in the study. So we ended up with only those 12 uh, ABA schools. There's one ABA school that might still back out. Um, I haven't been able to get final, final confirmation to continue to shift. I, I actually have some more questions on this. Process. We we need to move on to in our agenda, but um, maybe two more questions. I, I, I'm just wanting to moving moving those years is a significant change. This is the first time hearing of this. Uh, the studies we've actually done. that was covered at an October um, at the October CBE meeting. Changing from. Where the cohorts had changed, yes. That was um, we. That was an agenda item. Um, Ron presented, um, and I. It's okay, okay. That, that's not. But, that's not that, that, that as relevant. Uh, what do you see? I might ask Roger the same question. As far as differences, you know, obviously the scores in two thousand eight were much different than thirteen. Um, what do we see as a significant difference in the results that we're going to be getting uh, from that from that change? And then I'll, I'll oh. end, end it at that. I think given the original uh, way the I had conceptualized the study, the notion of going from 2008 to there was basically to emphasize the, the magnitude of that difference. It's relatively large difference purposely did that from the extremes. So the capacity to answer the questions as they were originally stated, you know, maybe, uh, it's, it's gonna be more of a challenge because the amount of variation in terms of sports is gonna be smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both, Roger and Thank you. Oh, public comment? Thank you. My name is Mitch Winnick. I'm the Dean of Monterey College of Law. Currently serve as the Chair of the Law School Council. Uh, just two comments as to this. First of all, uh, thank you for pursuing this job analysis study. This is something we've needed probably for 50 years. And uh, it's great to see California doing this. This is essential and I applaud you for doing it. I would like to suggest that we not go down the same path that caused some concerns for the last two studies. Uh, and if I could just point out two that I think could be remedied early on, or at least for your consideration. Uh, we have 250,000 lawyers, I think, in California, uh, starting out with a focus group of eight to 10, who are gonna supposedly cover the scope and breadth of the practice of law in California. Doesn't seem to pass any logical analysis. Uh, we have lawyers in public, private, large firms, nonprofits. I mean, it just doesn't seem 
conceivable that a focus group of eight to ten representing all 250,000 lawyers will get there. Uh, it seems like perhaps a series of focus groups that have eight to ten clusters that would contribute to this would be a good way to start. That was one of the concerns of the other two studies, that the SME group was just too small to adequately represent the, the, rep uh, the lawyers in California. Uh, same thing, I would suggest there be more transparency and breadth in defining the working group. That becomes an essential transparency for the believability of the results. I think there's been a request that we see law schools, judges, public attorneys, private attorneys, public members, members of the CBE, and members of the Board of Trustees. Those seem to be not, I may have missed groups, but would seem to be logical participants in a study of this magnitude that's going to have such an important basis. So thank you. to our next agenda item. So we are now in uh, the subcommittee on examination. So we need to um, have committee members that are not part of the subcommittee on examination um, sit, um, take a seat that's not at the table. Please. So examination is David, Dolores, Angie, Robert, Brody, Jim, Larry Kaplan and Patty. And this is because of that we came. We're going to say no way. Anybody who I didn't call needs to go sit in the back. Does that apply to staff? Yeah. 
except for stuff. I think so, but it doesn't count. So as you may recall, in uh, at the April 2017 meeting, the CBE attempted to address a minor calculation problem with the method for calculating the bar passage rate. Um, essentially, what the CBE decided to do uh, was to remove exam takers who had not completed the exam from the denominator when calculating the passage rate. When conferring with our psychometrician, who just left the room, um, it's clear that that, that, that step to remove uh, the non-takers or non-completers from the denominator is a critical step for accuracy. What it does is it really um, uh, helps us not to treat anybody who's failed the exam the same way we treat anybody who didn't take the exam altogether. So um, the policy that you have uh, that we provided, um, or let me say the policy that was instituted in uh, February and July 2017 for these two past bar exams uh, that I mentioned removed the exam take from the exam takers anybody who did not complete an exam and that constituted approximately less than one percent of the entire bar taking population so it's a very small subpopulation that we're talking about so despite that minimal impact um, on, on our passage rate this policy um, also um, impacts the various bar result reports that stem after the uh, result, the uh, grades are reported. So the proposal that you have that was included in our, on our agenda attempts to do a few things to um, refine our definition. So first, it, it refines a definition for who completes a bar exam. And rather than t talking about a completer versus a non-completer, what we're now, um, uh, proposing is a concept of a taker and so um, that uh, document contains that it also addresses in that um, same policy how this gets reported in our various bar, uh, bar exam reports and so today Lisa and I will walk through that impact and um, and there are various items that are left for discussion that I think that we need to tackle today so with that I will let Lisa start Thank you, Amy. Um, so I just want to start with uh, the, the basic concept of um, a taker, a completer, um, and how uh, we have done it in the past, How what it was done um, for the February 2017 and July 2017 exams, and then what we propose going forward. So um, basically, what, um, how we did it um, before um, these last two exams, um, uh, February and July 2017 was that um, if you set foot in, if an applicant set foot into the test examination center um, and began to take an examination, they would be considered a taker. And those people would be included in the statistics that we provide. So, um, and, and one of the concerns that came out of that that the committee had for years was that um, some of these people who um, started an exam but for whatever reason, whether it was because they um, thought that they hadn't done well, or um, possibly some people would come just to be uh, what, um, what might be called a, an MPE harvester, which would be <laughs> coming in and uh, basically taking enough of the exam to be able to um, know what some of the MPE questions are, to memorize them, and to uh, somehow uh, financially profit from that. Hmm. And so, uh, the concern over those people coming in and doing that and then subsequently being able to uh, be uh, considered not a first-time um, first time bar picker was a concern. So the committee policy was that anybody who came into the examination uh, test center and started an exam would be considered to be a taker and that that person would be included in the statistics. So what was done with the uh, February, beginning with the February 2017, bar exam and then also done for the July 2017 bar exam was that we uh, changed the concept and, and basically um, now used what we term to be completers 
to, um, and those would be completers would be somebody who had an applicant who had a complete set of scores, including all of their written uh, answers as well as a uh, full set of MBE scores. Those people were completers, and they would be included in the statistics. But anybody who didn't fall within that definition would be taken out of the numerator, as uh, Amy was, I mean, the denominator, as Amy was explained. So what we're proposing going forward is that um, we would define what a taker was, and that is in your um, O200 attachment D. Um, a taker would be someone who was in the examination and uh, was present, not absent, for the entire exam. So every single session, they were there. And if that person uh, met that qualification, they would be considered to be a taker, and they would be included in your statistics. So, um, so that's what we propose. The effect on grading would be that anybody who is not um, a, a defined as a taker, which would mean somebody who sat through the entire exam, they, uh, their exams would not be graded. So they essentially would be taken out of the entire grading process and not appear in the statistics. They would be treated as like we treat our absentees. The absentees are people who um, we expected to be at the exam because they were registered for the examination, but they didn't show up for some reason. Um, so that's basically, I just wanted to give you uh, that uh, background and kind of um, any questions or what they question. So does anybody have any questions right now just about um, the taker definition? Uh, uh, Lisa, Lisa what, how often does that happen that someone starts and does not, they go the first day and they don't come back for the second or third day? I mean, is it just like I, five yeah, I people? Tell, I can't tell you exactly the number, but I can tell you that for the July 2017 exam, we had 72 applicants who um, were not Completers who didn't fall within the definition of completers that we were using. So that would include people who had partial, uh, uh, so didn't show up for the entire exam, but it also included people who um, perhaps were there for the entire exam, but for some reason got a zero on one or more of their answers because they didn't meet the grading requirement to get a full. So, so under your definition, under the definition of taker, then that person, their multi state wouldn't be graded either? You would not grade their multi-state exam? Um, so that's, I, I believe the multi-state would be uh, graded, but that's mainly because um, all of these scantrons that we received back from the test center would go, we don't grade the, the, the M, M, uh, MBE, that is all done by the national conference. So all of those scantron answers would be sent to the national conference and they would, they would grade they would be graded. So could someone say, well, yeah, I, I left, but I want to know how I did on the two questions that I answered. That's not fair. I paid seven hundred dollars. I want my score so I know when I go the next time where I stand. Well, they could certainly make that argument that under the policy that would be made public, everybody should know that that's not possible. that we will only grade your exam if you remain and participate in the entire exam. If you leave early then we will not grade any of your exam. That would be our policy. Any of your essays, but the NBE would be graded. I mean, now that it says you did well for non-accommodations testing, <clears throat> they would be leaving before the end of one day. Or after the one day and not go back for the day. Right. So in, in uh, 12 words or less, what, what is the basic difference between going forward, the proposal of the definition going forward, compared with before February uh, 2017, or uh, 2016, 2017? Sorry, I may have to do this with more than 12. I haven't, I can't count. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> Basically, before February of 2017, a taker was somebody who stepped foot into, who, who started the examination. You started the examination, even if you left sometime before the end, you were considered a taker and you were included in the step. 
And now, going now, forward, now would be that you would have to be, you would have to have stayed been present at the entire exam every single session in order to be considered a taker to be included in the exam. And the interim? <coughs> we used a completer definition. Definition meant that you had to have a complete set of scores. So that would be every single one of your um, essay questions had to receive a rate of at least 40. And you had to have both sessions of your MBA. So then what's the difference between the completer and the test taker language? Well, the completer would be, it's, it's kind of just a different way of looking at it in terms of who's included. So a completer could be there, could have been, could be a taker in this essence here, but they, um, they can't have, a completer cannot have a zero in their score. So in here, with this new uh, definition that we propose going forward, you can have a zero in your scores. As long as you were there for every single session, you can have a zero. Thank you. Any other question? So um, let's say I decide to bail out for the end of the test. I will not be considered a taker. I will be you're a bailer. Okay, so <laughs> I'm a bailer. Now, Still you have my data that I bail out. I don't get scored. Does the law school I come from, will they get that data that they have X number of bailers coming from their school? Well, they wouldn't be considered to be a bailer. They wouldn't be considered to be a taker. They would not be in the data that the uh, law school gets at all. Okay. Uh, so, so, one more thing. So, if that person who's left early, who is not counted as a taker, if they uh, apply to take the bar examination in the future, and they are considered a first time taker in that instance? In that instance. Correct, unless they've taken the bar exam in the past. Right. Yeah. But if they don't complete, so they're not a taker under this new definition. Well, I think this is an excellent idea because it's going to more accurately reflect who's passing the bar and who's not passing the bar, people that have completed the bar. I always thought it was a little unfair and lopsided to include the completers, and I think this definition will more accurately reflect scoring of our candidates. So I, I, I think it's a, a great idea. And I also just want to recommend um, that conceptually, like we keep referring to completers and takers, but just um, I think if we adopt this proposal, it's so much easier to just think about um, takers and we lose the whole concept. It's really measuring two different things. So I think that, um, but getting to the same point, which is uh, what you just stated right now, probably, that is that um, it's a more accurate definition of who actually um, took and completed this exam and um, who actually failed. That distinction is very important. So basically a taker is someone who sat through the entire exam regardless of whether they uh, answered all the questions, um, but necessarily they wouldn't have answer everything. They would have left something open so in in the way that they didn't complete the exam. They didn't they were missing something in that exam. If it's not complete, then and they sat through the entire thing, they're a completer. If they've completed everything, they're a completer and we don't worry about it. Does that make sense? <laughs> Yeah. So it, it, you can be, a, a completer is always a taker, but a taker isn't always a completer. And you said this only re really concerns a handful of people, right? Uh, well, the, the completer issue, yeah. For, for July 2017, for example, we had 72 applicants who fell into that category of being not a completer within the definition of you have a full set of scores and an MBA. 72 out of? 
nine thousand. Yeah, nine thousand. So it's like less than one percent. Yes. And yeah, most people, when they spend that much money, they want to actually yeah, address all the questions. Right. Might be kind of okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, Jeff, you have a motion to bring in the well, um, uh, there are other concepts that we need to uh, tackle that are in the same proposal. The other item is related to um, the law school reports. So um, that's uh, the proposal that um, uh, has been attached to this agenda also includes each of the reports that um, stem from the um, bar exam. And starting this year, in July 2018, the law schools will be getting more information about their students. Um, specifically, um, they, uh, with any candidate, any uh, bar exam taker that uh, cons consents to the release of their scores, we are going to be providing um, the grades of the unsuccessful uh, candidates on the exam. Until between now and the interim, we are going to be providing the same information that we have in the past um, to the schools. Um, and if this proposal passes, again, we talked about uh, for the pass fail list, um, the um, takers are going to be the people appearing on that pass fail list. So if you're not a taker, you will not appear as a failed, um, as somebody who failed as you have in this past report. So that is going to clarify that issue. And the question now, though, is um, are there um, other items on that report that we need to add? Before I go on, and I would be remiss, I feel I would be remiss if I don't ask this question. Um, does this have any issue? Uh, would there be any type of waivers or any issue with the uh, UCLA lawsuit? Yeah, so we have a um, um, standard of only releasing information if there's 11 or greater in the data group that we are posting um, in order to be comfortable that there is no problem with identifying an individual from that group. So that's to protect confidentiality. Okay. Uh, yeah, my concern is I understand where we're going and I understand the need to do this but I also want to make sure that the state bar is protected uh, from, from any possible waivers with that lawsuit. Are you talking, David, about releasing back to the law schools the individual score, the scores of individual students? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, thank you. Um, the statute was changed effective January okay. to allow an exemption for the, the um, regulatory information that we provide to the law schools. That is not considered something that it becomes public. Okay, great. All right, thank you. All right. Um, so, I guess with um, everybody, it, it, does anybody have any questions on the law school reports themselves? Okay. So I think we're. Wait, 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 wait. Right. Or did you have another item? I was just going to mention that there are other uh, items or points of discussion, uh, maybe for the future, um, and that were raised in that 0200 item. Um, so I don't know if we want to uh, address any today. Or there, there, the main thing I think we wanted to get done today was to uh, have the committee um, approve the draft uh, uh, guidelines, and so that we can go forward in terms of using that and applying that definition of taker, and then everything else that's in those guidelines for uh, our next examination. I'll, I'll, I'll make a motion to approve the guidelines as stated by Lisa. Second. Second. Uh, is there any discussion? <coughs> Do we have any public comment? Okay. Uh, all in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Anyone abstain? That was just a subcommittee, right? <coughs> right. Um,
were uh, adopted by the uh, subcommittee and the full committee, and there hasn't been any changes. So it's mainly there for a point of information. So we are um, done with the subcommittee on examination. And we're moving the point. So we'll just go back to where we were on, on the chair time. And uh, the we got all our friends back in? What, yeah. we, we oh, our yes, friends. I'm sorry, yes. <laughs> Please come back. Please oh, yeah. <laughs> Does anybody want to need a break? Does anybody need to take a break? We can take that. So we need a break. Recognition of resigned committee of our counter member. We're on row 100. We do not have Larry. Change the face of uh, the Committee of Bar Examiner's work in California. <coughs> I'll sit so I can get closer to this mic. Thanks, Kim. Larry has definitely changed law school admissions uh, for the better. He was an individual that cared adamantly about public protection, about making sure that the system, from moral character uh, to our budget, to especially the law schools and our relationship with the law schools um, was good, was ever growing, was ever was getting better. Um, but he was not only passionate about it, he not only affected it, but I think that uh, you know Larry left uh, a big hole in this committee, um, one that I, it will take all of us stepping up a bit to fill. Um, I know I'll miss him as well personally. Uh, he's, he was fun and um, uh, created uh, and helped me create quite quite a nice gathering for Gail. Um, he was a partner uh, and a friend in all this, and now he's going to be focusing on college basketball and a million other passions that, that he has. Uh, but he will be sorely missed, and I don't think we'll actually realize uh, the hole that he's uh, left here. Uh, until sometime down the line. And, and if I may, uh, wasn't he also the very first public member ever to be selected to sit as chair of this committee? I don't my understanding of uh, the court of Heather. Was that him? Was, yeah. was that me? Was it you or was it Larry? It was Larry first. It was Larry first. Um, but Larry really, it, it, before and after he was chair, he was still chairing a whole lot. And um, uh, it should be noted, his chairmanship. But what's amazing is that I always looked at him as a chair, no matter what seat he was sitting in. So he will be missed. Good guy around here, but I'm happy for him. So we have a proposed motion on O100. So moved. Was, would anybody like to make a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Sorry. Is there any comment from the board? Or within yourself? Let's just get out there. No. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. As you should. As you said before, Mitch Winnie. Dean of Monterey College of Law. I would second absolutely everything that Lee just said. I work very closely with Larry. 
on his act. Anyway, as Lee indicated, he, he was a wonderful colleague and partner with the law schools and a bridge between the law schools and this committee. Uh, he brought great uh, substance to our dialogue. He brought an even-handedness of fairness. And we would uh, second your recognition of him as an extremely valuable colleague and member of this group. And we will miss him as well. Are we not going into closed on these items? Are we having half of our committee meeting today and half of it tomorrow? Um, if someone can just give us a little bit of a roadmap, because I know I'm wondering, because we didn't go into closed for examinations, so we're doing the, so, yeah, all the closed at some later date. Tomorrow we're going into our closed session. So tomorrow will be all the, today's all the opens. And tomorrow's the closed, it's on the agenda. We have to follow the agenda because that was what was noticed. Uh, I always. Um, okay. can, I, can I ask a follow-up question then? Okay, so some of us who sat in the audience were, by the way, the audio was very good. <laughs> um, um, if we were to have some issue with what the subcommittee did, um, I didn't really see a place on the agenda tomorrow where the full committee is going to be ratifying those actions, right. where we would raise those questions. Great question, I think. Mm -hmm. And Jesse's supposed to do a, well, I'm doing a bag Well, the subcommittee on operations and management, we're going to talk a little bit more about bag leaking and the, um, how, how it affects how we operate, how the CBE operates, and, and perhaps ways that we can um, change the way CBE is used to operating so that it works better under the Bagley Keen rules. Um, but with respect to your question, um, I if it's not on the agenda, so the way the board does it, right? The, the each of the um, there's an opportunity for the full board to weigh in on the board committee. Um, activities because it's noticed on the full board's agenda. If that didn't happen this time, my thought is that, it, that there is not an opportunity. But I think the changes that Dusty's referencing will uh, address that problem going forward. Either because you'll retain your subcommittees, but um, provide the ability for the full committee of our examiners to weigh in on subcommittee action in your agenda, or you'll eliminate the subcommittees altogether. Well, and given that we did not um, note that for the full board agenda or for a discussion, couldn't we have um, committee members uh, make comments during the open public comment period or, or the public comment period? No. Okay. No. No. Sorry. No. So today we won't have that opportunity to comment on subcommittee actions. And therefore, subcommittee actions won't be able to be ratified if the full committee can't address it. Correct? Uh, so, my experience on the Board of Accountancy, it was all very straightforward, which is subcommittees met. You know, when you're in the audience, you're not a member of the public, so you can't that, that comment. Um, subcommittee met, met, takes an action, um, votes yes on certain things. Then it makes a recommendation to the full committee at you know the next day or whenever it's going to be presented, and that's when members of the full committee who aren't on the subcommittee can say, "I don't agree with that," you know, and I, I'm going to ask to reject the committee's recommendations. What we know, correct? <laughs> I mean, you know, that, that, that is what we normally do is have the committee meeting the next day. So I'm still confused as to how that interferes with Bagley Key. Well, the way, the way Larry described it, I don't think it does. I think that's exactly, and I would think that the subcommittee chair, whoever it is, would be presenting whatever had been the action items from that subcommittee to the committee as a whole. 
I don't think it's that complicated. I right. don't know if the agenda calls for it. To, I haven't studied that, but that's how it should work. Right. You make the right. Make the presentation, and actually, technically, also, when a committee makes a recommendation, you don't need a second. But it sounds like the only issue here is the fact that it's not on the agenda. That's all. Yeah, it doesn't have public notice, and we can't um, do it. This but we can do it where it says committee meeting. This is open to closed sessions. Yeah, I'm looking at the agenda. It says, at least I logged in. It says it's open and closed sessions right. today, 4:30 and on. Tomorrow is the closing. And it says tomorrow, 11 a.m., open and closed session. Jesse, do you want to take a look at this, look at the agenda and come back? I don't know if there's a way to move on to this agenda. Or if this is. Yeah, stop her. So, Chad, we have the time. Uh, at 4.30 and afterward to have our open and closed sessions. That's the full committee. And then tomorrow at 11 a.m. we have time to pick up again whatever uh, leftover open we might have and then finish up open or the closed sessions. So there is time on the agenda on, on the third tomorrow. 11 a.m. open and closed session. No ratification of so many actions. We have to put well, that over until the next meeting. Well, that would be part of the the full committee meeting. Yeah, that's that's, that's, that's a function. I think that's that, a function I think of the what the, I don't think that's correct. But what I, what I'm suggesting we just give Dusty a little bit of time to take a look at the agendas that have been posted. You, I think you understand what people are wanting to do. Determine if there's a way to make it work. But pending that, if maybe we can move on with whatever else we can do. It, it was just my understanding that when the full committee meets, that's when we do those votes. Peg so. McKean is a uh, headache. Yes. <laughs> no, it's a good thing. with it for years. <laughs> you think? It's a good thing. It's called transparency. It does promote transparency. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, hey, but it's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, Good so going back uh, with the minutes, uh, draft December 1 and 2 Committee of Bar Examiner's public meeting minutes, if everybody had a chance to review those, 0101. And is there a motion? I'll move to approve. Second. Second. Is there any discussion? Is this the open minutes? Yes. There was one place in there where it described, um, uh, I think it was the might have been the LAP step as taking effect for the July 2017 bar exam. And I think it was meant to say 2018, wasn't it? On LAP. Um, sorry, I didn't print it out, but um, it was maybe page two of the minutes. talking about something prospectively in minutes from a meeting in December, so I don't see how it could have been referring to July of 2017. I think it's under the Psychological Interventions Project. Yeah, yeah there you go. Okay. So with that correction, then, um, do we have an amended motion? No, move. Favor? Aye. 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 Aye.
I just want to, to give everybody the heads up. These key indicators were presented to the Board of Trustees last week. Um, the admissions department uh, uh, participated in admissions discipline day, which is an orientation to the board members on um, the functions carried out by the various units at the state bar. So admissions participated and we shared the key indicators just to demonstrate the volume of work that's carried out by our office. And so um, I just want to provide that as a highlight. And also um, it, within that, it has a comparison of 2016 to 2017. And I just want everybody to focus on the amount of um, increase in just about every single aspect. Um, the number of applicants um, has increased if you look at um, the bar or the bar exam figures as well as for our moral character applications. And I think there's a motion attached to the to um, accept the report. Okay. So moved. We have a second. Second. Okay. Um, any discussion? Any comment? Uh, do, is there any objection to dispensing with the roll call on this vote? Hearing none, uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Abstaining? And that passes. Um, the next item is a, a schedule, a copy of the uh, tentative schedule for March 23rd. That is our next um, CBE meeting. <coughs> um, it's a one day meeting because it's followed by um, a calibration session on that Saturday, the 24th. So this is just informational. And we do uh, encourage any of you who have not attended a, cal a calibration session to do please attend one. It's very informative and, and very interesting. So if you haven't gone, please do. All right. This next item is another informational item. So um, at this month, we have uh, a February 2018 bar exam coming. It's um, going to be held on February 27th and 28th. I think in the past, we have provided site passes for everyone who wants to come to the um, bar exam. And we encourage that participation, especially for all the new members. It's a wonderful opportunity to um, witness um, the work that you do. And um, for those of you who are attorneys, to be on the other side of um, the exam experience. So, um, so typically we send out um, the badges to everyone, and this year is a cost savings measure. We would like to find out who's interested before we create the badges. Um, they cost about five dollars each. So, if you are interested, can you please email me or Kim Wong, and um, excuse me, and let us know if you're interested, so we can get a badge out to you to visit the test centers. I have a question. Yes. What exactly happens when you go to visit the site during the bar? Oh, that's okay. Um, <laughs> oh, 
Hey, that's more than not by. Um, it, it's, it's an opportunity. You'll 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 go there, and um, you will pass through it a about eight dozen signs that say you can't come, you can't leave, you can't drink, you can't have a phone, you can't do everything. But it really is good for you to see the measures that are, and I say that jokingly, but it's a good opportunity for you to get a sense of the measures that are taken to make sure that the applicants were reminded of the do's and don'ts. So looking at the fiscal space, and starting from the second you walk in, is, is, is an important thing for folks to be aware of. Then um, there is a, uh, once you go uh, into the uh, exam area, um, uh, almost always there's a very obvious place where there is a table, uh, uh, with a whole bunch of staff behind it, they'll greet you. Um, hopefully, they'll check your badges. Hopefully, they'll well. They used to be able to check your state bar badge as well, just to make sure that they're it matched. Um, but uh, you'll show them uh, your 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 pass, uh, and they will take you on a tour of uh, the examination room, um, of the uh, the back room where things are sorted and organized. Uh, you'll have a chance to really walk around. Uh, that tour is dependent upon whether, uh, what you're seeing is dependent upon whether you're in a very large scale uh, examination uh, place like the, the convention center where it's just a sea of, of folks and all you hear is a little tee -tee 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 -tee. Um, to the rooms that amaze me where people are still writing. Um, those are very different from a testing accommodations uh, uh, site which I encourage folks to try and go to both. Um, also, a very important the work we do. It's very important to get a sense of those differences and what's going on in both of those. But you're really going in and you're seeing firsthand um, uh, with a staff member what's going on. Looking at proctors, looking at test taking, looking at facilities, looking at security measures, all of those types of things which we are called upon to make decisions on on a regular basis. So, I think I've. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good synopsis. I would just add that um, depending on when you show up to the test center, um, if it's oh. 10 minutes before, let's say, a uh, break announcement, the staff members might be a little bit tied up, so I would just uh, bring that up. But staff members are generally very um, happy to see visitors, and they're generally very happy to tour you around. Um, so it's entirely up to you whether you want to get a full tour or if you want to just sort of walk around and observe. Uh, it's fairly uh, informal. And everything both of you said uh, is definitely, as far as what Lee said, um, it's important when we are asked about rule uh, <coughs> exceptions, when you have a, a, somebody who says that they went to the bathroom that they didn't know they were going outside of the, the testing area. You'll be able to see how the testing area is marked and see if it's possible to not recognize that you're wa walking out of the marked area. Um, and as far as the, the staff, really there are staff that enjoy having the members, the CBE members show up and they like showing how smoothly everything's going. So, uh, and definitely the testing accommodations, please, please take a look and see how, how they do it. Yeah, I, mean, I, would I, I would also add, I, I would say, you know, I get the five bucks thing, and you know, uh, I think there might be some other places we could, we could make more significant uh, cost savings. Uh, but I think sending a badge out to everybody really encourages them to go. I think it's part of our duties here and part of our job. I, I don't see a reason for everybody to, to need to, to, to get back to you to, to be able to go there. It, it's really imperative that, that we do. This is where the sausage is made. This is, this is really what this is all about uh, to a certain respect. So I, 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 I would encourage you to just send those out to everybody. I, I would also encourage us to uh, our general badges now, we either have to turn them in or don't. And I know that I've always been asked, you know, for for years for our state bar badge. Uh, because the other badge it doesn't have a picture on it. It's, it doesn't say anything about the state bar, really. It's just type on a, on a little badge. Anybody could have typed that out and laminated it. So having both of those has been how we get into 
you know, uh, and I know that's more a later thing than an Amy thing, uh, but I, I would encourage both of those things to happen and everybody to go to a bar exam. One other thing that's important is we do have things that occur, and it has been helpful on more than one occasion on fire and flood and waiting for locusts. Uh, but we have had lots of unfortunate things happen at a test center. And when we've had a member there, uh, that has been, by chance, but that has been extremely helpful at times. All right. We have a few minutes left. And so I'm going to um, uh, just uh, give everybody the date for the law school assembly meeting. We should probably um, uh, we talked about this last year. Just want to remind everybody it's coming up on June 21st here in Los Angeles. So it's the same day as the uh, law school council and the BRAC meeting. So that meeting is from 1 to 3. I'm sorry, 11 to 1. Then um, we have law school council from 1 to 3, followed by BRAC from 3 to 5 on that same day. So um, that, again, is June 21st. And then perhaps we should take a five-minute break before we start our next session. I need more time um, because I, I have a lot to present under the admissions activities. On, on that last item, can, can we get notice of, can everybody get notice of all those meetings in addition to our notice of the committee meeting? Uh, I think that's helpful and I think it might be helpful for other members who might be inclined, uh, even though they might not be a member of that specific committee, but that they are aware of those and that they are happening. I think that's important. Is that something that we normally go to, the law school assembly oh, meeting? Um, What's they, the traditional? Gail has encouraged as many people to go as possible. So if you are able to go, then please do attend. So that's June 21st here in Los Angeles? Yes, and it's the, the day before CPE. Oh, I see. Okay. And it's an all-day thing? Or? Yes. No, it's just from 11 to 1. Oh, it's but, but if you want to, you can hang out and also attend the law school council meeting and, uh, and RAC. Okay. Oh, so right, it's always the day before. Got it. Okay. And I may add, it's the, the law school assembly, uh, all deans of all schools in California, ABA, Cal Accredited, and the Registered Unaccredited Schools. So it's, it's the broadest uh, meeting of all the deans. And then the, the uh, law school council is a subset of that. So it's, it's one of the Assembly uh, meets uh, roughly once a year. So we'll give you till 3.30 and we'll start up again. Okay. Yeah. Okay.
uh, each is therefore expected to do uh, so no later than this upcoming July 1st. Um, I want to ask George to chime in if there's anything else you want to add. Well, thank you, Alex. Um, just for context, the, this um, report and the metrics you'll see in, in the agenda memo, and I would encourage you to look at the uh, bar graphs um, in particular. It's a snapshot of a snapshot of your, uh, all the cows uh, uh, provide uh, metrics and information data confirming that they're compliant with the local community rules and guidelines. Uh, so do the unaccredited schools, and uh, we'll report, we'll have a similar report as we do every year. Um, on the undergraduate schools in March. And a couple of key interesting points from, from my perspective over time, if you look at the bar charts, um, uh, enrollments um, are, are again on the rise. Uh, total uh, uh, enrollment is um, down by 3%, but by school, a number of schools have had increases. So you're starting to see an increase in the, in the marketplace for uh, that, that more people are going to law school. Uh, of, of particular interest, and in, in I think what the panel are really proud about, and I encourage you to look at the bar chart showing that uh, I think virtually every um, Cal schools, the percentage of diverse, uh, the, the, their enrollment is becoming more diverse over time and have consistently over the last three years, they're enrolling in more diverse enrollment. Um, on a gender issue, it's surprising, not surprising, I suppose it's, uh, it's predominantly female uh, across the board within the Cal's. And if you look at the specific bar chart, there are several schools. Uh, that are significantly uh, more females attending than, uh, than, than males, uh, which, is, which is interesting as well. Uh, and the last point to, uh, that I'd like to highlight is, is the tuition. You'll see there's a minor error. We actually miscalculated uh, the total cost of earning the JD at one of the panels at Monterey College of Law. Um, we mis both gave it misread the website. Uh, but with that said, the average to earn uh, and uh, be awarded a JD at Cal's is $65,000. And that reflects, that's, that's probably uh, at least half, if not, in some, for some of the ABA schools, one third. Um, I did a report a week ago for the Board of Trustees, and um, roughly the average expense to uh, earn a JD at an ABA school is above $150,000. Uh, and some schools, the top schools, uh, is closer to $180,000. So the discrepancy or the difference between earning a JD at the CALS and the ABA is, is, is uh, significant and it's gotten bigger over time. Uh, if anybody's interested in any specific uh, Cal school, you'll see uh, we've provided a, uh, a squib or a, a brief summary of, of the school with regard to uh, enrollment, admissions, um, new faculty, um, and the, um, any major changes that they might have received from the committee in the past year. Uh, the issue about the bar path, the cumulative bar path rate, it is a little convoluted, and, and the good news is uh, now that we're back in business and able to provide all the schools, including the CALS, uh, their past fail lists of our data. Starting this July 1st, um, we will uh, again, uh, committee reactivated the guidelines that require the CALS to report uh, their minimum pass rate, their cumulative pass rate, and we'll get those reports and uh, very soon thereafter be able to update what is admittedly an out of date listing of the cumulative pass rate that is currently on the state bar website. So um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them, but I encourage anybody interested to, to take a look at the bar charts because they can really tell, I think, a component story. And just one thing I'll add that I saw from the statistics too was that uh, enrollment by minority candidates were up at all the schools. So that was like a, a noticeable trend starting to see. Any questions from the committee? So there's a recommendation that the committee, uh, it's a full committee that receive a file of the 2017 annual compliance report summaries. So is there a motion? I move. Move to that section. Any denies, notes, extensions? Okay, that will pass. So item 0401. Millen Academy of Law uh, response to notice of non-compliance. So there was a periodic inspe uh, inspection by one of our educational standards consultants uh, back in May 2017 and confirmed uh, that the school was uh, non-compliant on a number of key uh, registration requirements uh, set forth in the uncredited law school rules. Uh, a report of the inspection was created 
and uh, was then sent and received by this committee um, at its December 2017 meeting. Based on uh, the receipt of the report, uh, the committee issued uh, McMillan a notice of non-compliance, um, and you can see that in attachment A, the notice of non-compliance. McMillan uh, is, a, is a registered, unaccredited uh, law school owned and operated by Scott McMillan, he's a licensed uh, California attorney. Uh, the school first started enrolling students in 2009, and since then, its enrollment has been uh, small, uh, with its last student leaving in early 2015. Uh, since opening, only four students have completed the first year curriculum, the school's first year curriculum and been able to take the first year law school students exam. Only two eventually passed the examination, and one on uh, his or her first attempt, uh, but each student then transferred from McMillan to another law school. I'm gonna bring in George for any other context of that. Uh, thank you, Alice. Um, this is a bit of a legacy. This is one of the uh, last schools that the committee currently has jurisdiction over that was not. That was registered and founded um, by the Bureau uh, prior to uh, 2008. And, and since then, as you can see, the, the track record of the school has been poor in being able to uh, attract, enroll, and keep students. And um, among, um, it's been inspected at least twice, I think, in the last uh, eight, year, eight or nine years. Um, it's been issued, I think this is its second, perhaps third, notice not compliance. So you can see it's a bit frustrating given the time, and money, and resources we, that we in the committee have put into it. And nonetheless, um, and under our new procedures, I, Dean McMillan is here, and I, I, I assume he uh, may want to say something in response. Um, and I conferred with him during the break. Uh, the good news is the school uh, currently has two students uh, that were enrolled and started classes last month. And um, the recommendation and to follow the due, due process and the procedures uh, after notice non-compliance, the response was um, good faith. It was comprehensive. Uh, I believe Dean McMillan has done a lot to try to rectify. In essence, the program had been moribund um, or dormant for the last four or five years. So most of everything he had, when he written materials, notices, uh, the website was not compliant. Uh, he has uh, either made those changes or is making those changes. And so the recommendation uh, in the memo is to uh, send Sally Perring, our the committee's consultant, back in 60 days and conferring with, with Dean McMillan, it, it may make a little more sense um, to go in in 90 days. Um, but I'd leave that up to both the committee to decide that whether that recommendation makes sense. And if, I guess, uh, as a public comment, if, 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 the, if Dean, would you care to Uh, by way of introduction, I'm Scott McMillan. Could you speak with your mic on that? Sure, sure, certainly. Sure. By way of introduction, I'm Scott McMillan. I'm a practicing attorney in San Diego. I mostly do civil litigation. The purpose for my starting the school, when I did back in 2005, followed on the uh, tragic death of the dean of my law school that I went to, Western Sierra School of Law. I paid a total of $12,000 to go to law school. I spent another $4,000 going to uh, bar review courses. And I fortunately passed the bar on the very first try. Approximately 60% of my class also passed on the first try. Uh, Dean Eason, Fred Eason, who some of you may remember, was an avid pilot. He crashed two times before, one of them in Tahoe Lake at night, survived that. And uh, then one day he decided that he got a case of the gotta goes, and that was gotta go to Oregon. And he was flying over the clouds and flew straight into uh, the top of Iron Mountain in San Diego County. And thus ended the <coughs> stellar uh, passage rate of Western Sierra. So I had it in my mind that this system that he needed to, that he had perfected essentially that allowed an unaccredited registered law school to pass two thirds of its students, its graduating class, needed to somehow be maintained. And 
doing civil litigation, I mean, I once in a while have boluses of money that come in, and I thought it would be an appropriate thing to set up this law school and hopefully be able to keep alive his methodology. Unfortunately, for the law school, uh, the demands of my practice have intervened, but I still have that same hope that I'm able to accomplish that effort. It would be two of my students have gone over to ABA accredited schools, with the identity of which will not be mentioned, and incurred almost $200,000 in debt. And I mean, they did pass the bar on the first try, and I, I attribute that in some small part to the study skills that they learned while I was while they were in my classes, when we would have these Saturday classes and force everybody to sit down and write and go through it. I'm gonna take one last run at it, if I'm allowed to. Basically, I understand that this, the whole system of law and law legal education is changing. It's going from in-person to online. And perhaps that's, you know, that's just the way things are. Everybody watches YouTube and they we have the Khan Academy and a number of other popular websites to provide online education. In, or, in order to satisfy the, the notice of non-compliance, I did purchase, re-update my library. And it's probably about $10,000 to buy these books, to, to fill in the books that were missing. And we've also signed up for the, the Lexus Student Edition for all of our students. Yeah, right now I have two, so hopefully next time, you know, next quarter we will have <clears throat> more but uh, that's just the plan of it I don't really have great aspirations of uh, as I've never had great aspirations of making a lot of money with this but I do believe that California does has a, have an extreme shortage of lawyers that are able that are able to take on cases that will help mo people of modest means the middle the so the people that are at the higher income levels will always have their lawyers. It's the people that are modest income, middle class people, that are extremely vulnerable to price, pricing of legal services. And the only way that prices of legal services are going to go down is if the market forces them down by lawyers, the availability of lawyers that have not spent $200,000 on getting a law degree and are not in debt. So they can take on the types of cases that I take on. So that's my public comment. I appreciate you all listening to me and allowing me this opportunity. Are there any comments or any members? Um, I do, actually. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I really appreciate your comments. One thing I wanted to ask, ask is, based on the exhibits uh, that are submitted to us, it's not clear to me how many students you have currently uh, in this class. You share that information with True. Us? And um, again, I'm just looking at the information given to us. It appears to me that there are only four students uh, who had ever uh, completed your first year curriculum. Is that correct? Completed, yes. Um, have there been any students who have completed all three or four years? Of, no. In that sense, what mechanisms do you have in place to sustain the inspirations that you have to share with, with the community? Well, it was interesting what happened. The last class that I had, um, there was another school in San Diego whose identity shall not be mentioned, uh, opened up. They changed their program. Apparently they had a bond, uh, missed a bond payment or something, and they opened up the enrollment and the accompanying financing. And so I lost a big part of my class and that was just it, the first year class after that because they, they were offered the opportunity to have an ABA program so and they didn't really mind going and incurring large amounts of debt so that was you know that's that's just what happened on it as far as sustaining the vision um, I'm uh, We'll see what happens, but I think that it can be done. It's it's really essentially a marketing problem <coughs> that I have. I mean, I find it marketing my 
law practice, I have no problem with that, but it's marketing and the opportunity that I wanted to share with people. <clears throat> That's another issue. The concern that I have is I certainly see this as a chicken and egg problem. Without students, you don't really have the financial backing to continue to sustain this program. But at the same time, you certainly understand that for students, they, they can't, uh, often, oftentimes, once they start a program, it's, it's a huge interruption to the program if somehow the program ended because of financial issues. Financial issues are not a problem. I just write a check or put more, more, more of my own money into it. That's what's happened. I mean, I have this, this law school right now, it's, I have um, uh, you know, two large rooms in the library in my own building in La Mesa. I mean, I own the building, so it's not a 6,000 square foot building. The financial problems are, that's, finances are not the problem for the law school. What the problem for the law school is, is Dean McMillan being there and being on top of things and keeping everybody going. That's what the real problem is, because I, I can you know, go off and do these cases and make money and then, you know, got to keep the teachers and the students going <coughs> too. So the money is not where the problem is. Because this is running a law school, particularly this, is relatively, uh, I wouldn't say nominal costs, but it's relatively inexpensive because keep in mind the overhead um, I mean I've had my my employees my regular employees they just go substitute in as, as <coughs> doing the work over there they do the work for me you know the employees of law firm so essentially the law firm is subsidizing the uh, the business and I'm not in it to make money I'm in it to try to produce more lawyers like myself no, that idea. Being able to help people. Um, I would move that uh, uh, we accept staff's recommendation and that we continue the process. It's pretty clear. And um, uh, if there is any difficulty with not being able to get back there in 60 days, that staff come back to uh, to the committee and let us know. My only caveat. All those favor. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, was that 60 or? 60, 60 days. First mm -hmm. word, you were saying 90 days? I think it's at 90. Well, the discussion had been, again, if the committee were to adopt it, is whether or not 90 is more reasonable uh, for purposes. <coughs> but um, it could happen in 60. I'm, I, I was just reading your the written recommendation, so I don't. I don't necessarily have a horse in that race. If David, you want to go 90? I, I, I'm just being realistic here. I, I'm listening to him. I, I thought that uh, perhaps 90 might be reasonable under the circumstances just to get this thing off the ground again. Thank you. I'm friendly. So 90. Okay. Is that good? Mm -hmm. You good with that? Mm -hmm. All right. All those in favor? Aye. Mm -hmm. right. 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 No. Any opposition? Passes. Okay. <coughs> oh, 402 Monterey College of Law made your change request. That was withdrawn. Oh, 403 the report inspection of the American Institute of Law. In Tashin A, you can see the inspection of report. Uh, American Institute of Law was registered uh, with the committee in January of 2016. Oh, administrative offices in Marietta, California, but in May, this, the law school sought and received committee approval to move its administrative offices to Torrance, California. Uh, when it was registered, the committee uh, ordered the law school to be inspected within two years of enrolling students to confirm that it's operating compliantly. And to comply with that directive, a two-day inspection was conducted with the assistance and cooperation of Dean Edward Green. The inspection confirmed that the school is well organized and is operating compliantly. It's currently enrolled, has a current enrollment of 69 students, and its first students will graduate in 2018. George, do you have anything else to add to that? Well, no, just a, a very positive note. This is um, uh, Dean Green, in particular, is a, 
a good example of, of the strength of perhaps the newer schools that the committee has um, registered in the last few years. Um, he has a, a very sound program. As you can see, he went from the zero enrollment to 69, and I, I believe within within 12 months or 18 months of opening, and uh, he continues to grow. Um, his he has uh, quite a bit of experience. He's taught at other law schools. Um, he's adding faculty, and uh, I, this was an interim inspection. Uh, this is something uh, that's technically not in the rules, but uh, a few years ago, I, Gail and I discussed this and thought it was a good idea for new schools coming online that uh, instead of waiting for a full five years, with the rules require for a periodic inspection, that after the committee registered a school, that we go in uh, and do an uh, interim inspection. And so that seems to have worked out because the schools that have gone through that process uh, this school and, and, and two others have uh, been, uh, are doing well, and so it's, I'm happy to report that. And um, uh, the um, visit was comprehensive. Uh, Sally was very complimentary of Dean Green and his staff. So I'm really pleased to say that uh, the school is doing well and is entitled to um, move forward, and it will be reinspected uh, before the fifth year of its opening. Questions and discussion. So there's a recommendation <clears throat> that the law school's registration be continued and that the next inspection take place during the summer of 2021, unless the committee finds cause to conduct an early inspection. All those in favor? Those opposed? Didn't you need a I'm sorry. Is there a motion? I'll move it. I'll two points. That's <laughs> sorry. Make <laughs> sure I'm doing the right thing. Okay. Item 0404. Alex, <coughs> I want to um, just say something about that item before we get started. Um, in the interest of full disclosure, I think we need to note that George Leal has a friendship with uh, Dean Barberi outside of um, a working relationship. Um, however, uh, despite that relationship, I think um, it's important to note that all of the material that has been presented as part of this item meet the requirements for um, this um, uh, request. And so um, I just uh, wanted to make sure they noted that before we started this item. Okay. So item 0404, John F. Kennedy's College of Law major chain request to open a, camp, open a branch campus in San Jose. Again, you have the attachment, attachment A, uh, that details the change request uh, to open a branch campus in San Jose this August. And through rules 4.164, um, and make sure I have this right guidelines, 15.2, 15 15 no less than 180 days before actually opening the facility, uh, the law school must provide the committee with notice of its intent to open a, a new branch or a satellite campus. Uh, the committee uh, has the comprehensive explanation for this decision to open the campus that includes a narrative discussing the uh, any research or planning regarding the new campus, projected financial impact of the new campus on the law school, uh, proposed resources to be updated to the new campus as well. Finally, the notice must be certified uh, by the dean, uh, which has it's been done upon its opening on the new campus. Um, and there's another guideline, uh, 15.2, that requires no less than 120, day, 120 days that the proposed first day of, before the first day of class that the committee must approve or deny the law school's proposal and then a guideline 15. Uh, three, uh, the approved branch campus is considered provisionally approved until it is shown to be in full uh, compliance as well. And then guideline 15.3C, uh, within two years of operating the approved branch campus, the law school must seek confirmation from the committee that the campus is in compliance with all the accreditation standards found in the rules and guidelines. Uh, George, you want to comment? Yes, thank you, Alex. Just a little background. Um, this is, uh, for some of you uh, on the committee and subcommittee, this is old hat. This will be the third branch campus that has uh, been sought approval from the committee under uh, the new branch campus guidelines. 
the history here is going back probably five or six years when the first CALS sought approval to open a branch campus. This was San Francisco Law School opening a branch campus in San Diego. It, it was a uh, very, it was uh, new, no, it had never been asked and done before. So it was a very um, uh, detailed process. It, it took probably eight or nine months uh, and included a pre-opening inspection. Uh, it was, you know, it was drain on resources of the committee. It, it took a lot of time and effort for the school to, to do what it needed to do uh, to then get final approval and open uh, the campus. Uh, then after that, uh, through the RAC, uh, there was a relatively long and lengthy discussion um, and the development of these branch campus guidelines. And one of the uh, thoughts was it should be if a, an established CALS um, that has been found to be compliantly operating, and I'll note in this case, JFK was inspected just last September, and, and, and this now is, uh, its next inspection is five years from now. And so um, it, it shouldn't require um, the amount of time and effort that it took to find uh, or get approval for the, the San Diego Branch campus. So the process was simplified, and the timeline was much shortened. And uh, through, again, discussion through the RAC and the committee, uh, the current guidelines provide a, a relatively short six-month uh, time period where 180 <coughs> days, six months before the planned opening, uh, a school does, as uh, JFK did in this case, as Monterey has in prior cases, um, provide notice uh, to the committee. And within that notice, it's a relatively short checklist of materials and information, uh, location of the branch campus, um, uh, who would be the administrative uh, the, the administra uh, administrator of the campus? Um, the key point is, um, and this was essential in the underlying development of the guidelines, was to um, frankly trust the dean of that CALS to certify not once but twice that at the time that the branch, if approved, opened, it would be in substantial compliance with all of the uh, radial, uh, all the. Um, operational and academic requirements of the guidelines. And so the process is the notice certified by the dean comes in. This one came in just three weeks ago. Um, you'll see the date on Dean Barbieri's correspondence uh, to the committee. And then it takes uh, uh, far less time on my part, as it did, uh, to review it, um, and um, as I did, and, and, and basically see that uh, this school uh, complied with the uh, notice requirements and has made the affirmative certification uh, that it will operate this French campus compliantly. And, and this, just for detailed purposes, was, you know, JFK is a well-known school that is part of a large university, um, and they, the university has for many years, as Pete Carberry may be able to tell you, operated a branch campus. So it, it is um, inevitable, and this was the first time, although it was certainly foreseeable, uh, that one established CALS would want to open a branch uh, in closer proximity to an existing CALS. And, and that's what uh, uh, is the situation we have today. Uh, there is an existing CALS uh, in San Jose, Lincoln Law School of San Jose. And, and uh, I think you'll hear from Dean Palazzolo, uh, who uh, has her own thoughts about uh, whether the committee should approve. Uh, so that's where we are. Uh, the committee uh, uh, has until 120 days before August 13th to say yes or no. Um, and um, if it does say yes, then they can go forward and market the campus. Uh, if they decide to defer, uh, they would have to provide at least that notice to the school within 120 days. Uh, 90 days before it is open, Dean Barbieri would again be required uh, to go through and certify that um, and confirm that when they opened um, for classes and enrolled students as of August 13th, uh, the school would be compliant. So uh, that's the process, and in my opinion, they, they follow the and, and indicate that Dean Barbieri is here um, if he chooses to. Would you like to? Sure. Um, and so we'll take this as open for comments, or public comment. Committee members, public comment. So can, can any members have any questions or comments? I do. I, I'm just trying to make sure. I just wanted to. Thank you. So this is still a committee. Okay. Hey, George, I got questions for you. Yes. Um, has the State Bar previously declined um, a law school from opening a branch campus at any point in time? Um, and if so, on what basis? 
Well, no, they're, they're, I, no, the answer is simple. There they're currently are four branch campuses operating um, that I can think of. Well, the Monterey College Law has a satellite <coughs> campus, which is a little different. It's operated in Santa Cruz since 2010. Uh, it opened uh, the San um, Luis Obispo College of Law and received the approval in 2015. Um, 20 last year, and it just opened this last fall. They have Kern County College of Law, so it's a branch campus. And now um, this would be um, the uh, JFK branch would be uh, the fourth um, full four-year branch campus that the committee's considered. None have been denied, and there's been because there's been no reason to. I mean, the, the exception was the first campus that went through uh, a longer uh, process, and then with these new guidelines, the process has been simplified and. And um, uh, Dean Winnick is here, I believe, and could tell you that you know, he did his college and uh, law school did exactly what Dean Barbier was doing. And then I believe there are going to be other requests like this. And so um, it's, it's um, just a, you know, a symptom of, or not, it's an example of uh, growth uh, by certain schools moving into and uh, trying to have a broader geographic uh, coverage for their program. Uh, as you'll hear from Dean um, you know, again, it's a proximity to the home campus for JFK is in Pleasant Hill, and he's going to have his first year uh, professors commute and teach the same classes they're teaching in Pleasant Hill and San Jose. So it, it, it's, it's literally not a stretch for them to do this. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, no, no, there's been no reason for uh, the committee to, and I've never recommended it not to open branch campus. So as long as the new branch campus certifies that all standards guidelines would be Follow that there is really no legal or justification for this. The bar can be to decline or deny such a group. Well, if they, if they, from the written materials or upon a recommendation, I suppose you could, uh, and, and well, without going into details, I mean, I have been in a position to recommend to a school not to proceed with, with a branch campus because I didn't see that or didn't think that it would be, I couldn't recommend it. And so the better practice was for the school to reconsider and, and, and uh, come back later in time. Um, and so that, that's always a possibility in the way I've, I've operated. But um, the, the point um, is that, uh, you know, again, the, these schools are inspected. Uh, this branch campus would, will be inspected within two years and, and based upon, you know, any issue. I've never inspected JFK. I've, Twice it's been inspected in the last eight years, and we've had consultants do it. We um, certainly would do that again in the inspection of, of this branch. If, and, and we'll see if the guideline that inspection would be two years from now going. And that would be the key um, where, um, upon finding that they're fully compliant, um, they would go from being provisionally um, uh, approved to being fully approved. And for instance, the minutes campuses are still in that provisional approval phase. They haven't been operated in two years. So their inspections are coming up, but they haven't happened yet. If, if I may, may I add one thing? Um, sure, the committee jump in first. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, my understanding is that uh, so far, well, actually, let me even stop. I'm also a friend of uh, uh, Dean I think it's common knowledge that he worked here. Uh, anybody who's been here any length of time, it's hard not to. And, and I think we're friends with some of the, some of the deans. Uh, and as long as we hold them to the same standard, uh, which is the critical piece um, that we have, um, if uh, this particular school has gone through the, uh, the appropriate checklist that we have spent some considerable time putting together um, and is following those guidelines, I, I don't think we have a whole lot of choice in that matter uh, because we are not in the business of uh, regulating the market. Um, that's those are choices they make. We can make some suggestions, but you know that's up to them. No matter how we feel, uh, and I, I just read Dean the Ryan Act on another issue just a little while ago. So I don't always agree with you know we, we don't always agree. But as long as these schools are following the appropriate rules and regs, uh, then I think that you know we move forward. Yeah, if I could just make one other observation, if I may. If you look at the guideline, it does talk about that a school, a Cal is seeking approval to open a new branch campus, must provide some information with regard to market analysis and, and um, some dis something that supported its decision to open that new campus. And, and I think it's fair to say anybody who's in the committee members included involved in that uh, development of that guideline, it, what 
the legitimate concern of the committee is, is that when the CALS opens a new branch campus in a market or in a location, uh, a smaller uh, market, uh, that there would appear to be going in sufficient uh, growth of potential to keep that branch campus open. And that it wouldn't be a situation where if the committee were uh, okay, for approval that they would open a branch and close it in two, two or three years, and leaving those students possibly in the lurch. Uh, I think it's also fair to say that that requirement and never was intended, and frankly, I believe by law, uh, restricts the committee from deciding whether or not uh, any existing schools or any, this school itself will succeed. It's just, it's just a minimum requirement to make sure that uh, a cow is moving into a new area um, has the resources and has done some research to confirm that the future of that branch campus appears sound because it's in a large enough urban area or they have the resources uh, to, to fund it for the foreseeable future. So that, that's where that requirement came into play. It's now part of the timeline. Was there a marketing analysis conducted for or was submitted to us? And if so, is that available to us for review? Well, that's a question that Dean Barbieri, but what was submitted is you have in front of you. It, it was just a discussion, a brief discussion that, again, and, and you know, it's, it isn't required to provide. Interesting point, there, in an earlier iteration of that guideline, when I was drafting the proposed guideline, I, I had that in there. I wanted schools to provide us with that information. And after a discussion at the RAC and committee, um, by way of the way legislation gets handled, in this case a guideline, that requirement was, was taken out. So no, the answer is we don't get that kind of information other than the dean certification as here, that, that you know, they're, they're running a, a business and to the extent that they're not looking to, to fail, they're looking to succeed, and, and they've done enough to decide, and, and the dean Barbieri will tell you that they're, um, you know, they have every indication that, that, that this is a move that they should can make and, and have the ability to make. And I would be very happy to answer any questions in that regard and provide what we, the information of what we did. We already have a branch campus in San Jose. Uh, John F. Kennedy University uh, is a private, not-for-profit university, 50 years old. We have a branch campus of the university in Berkeley and a branch campus of the university in San Jose. The branch campus in San Jose has been there for over 25 years. We have a community counseling center for psychology um, uh, students, masters and doctoral uh, psychology students in, in San Jose, in Concord, in Oakland. Uh, we have prior experience with running and operating a branch campus of the law school. Uh, we, uh, when one law school, and I addressed it in the petition, failed, uh, New College of California, the students were left in the lurch. They lost their WASC accreditation. I was, coincidentally, uh, working at the State Bar in the Office of Admissions as the Director for Examinations and under my responsibility was Educational Standards. And JFK came to us on an emergency basis and said, we're in a position to take all of the new college students if you expedite the approval of the branch campus in Berkeley to accommodate these students coming from San Francisco who can't make the trek to Pleasant Hill. And JFK uh, received that approval, operated a branch campus successfully in Berkeley, but deemed it was more appropriate given the close uh, uh, proximity of the two campuses to consolidate at that time, uh, which was 2010, the Berkeley campus with the Pleasant Hill campus. So this petition is, is different. There's different guidelines and rules regarding establishment of it. Um, we, John F. Kennedy University is part of national university system, also a private not-for-profit. Uh, combined, we've got about 35,000 students. We're the second largest uh, university system in California that is a private, not-for-profit institute of higher education, uh, the largest being the University of Southern California. Uh, we, with regards to the resources, uh, have significant resources to be able to support and sustain an educational operation in the San Jose area, which is, as most people know, the third largest metropolitan area in the state of California. 
Uh, University of Santa Clara is there. We do, would not be competing again for students from Stanford and Santa Clara. Um, we regularly receive transfer students from the other Cal Bar accredited law school in San Jose because our program is very different. We're WASC accredited. Our students qualify for federal, uh, federal student loans. We offer day programs and night programs. We offer part-time programs and uh, full-time programs. We're a Hispanic-serving institution. We're a yellow ribbon institution, all of which provide amazing benefits for our students. Uh, for many years, we've been looking at opening a branch of the law school in the San Jose area where we already have a presence with ample classroom space, ample library, ample staffing, and ample parking. Um, and it was, uh, and we constantly were getting contacts from people in the San Jose area saying, do you offer classes in San Jose? And if not, why not? And so our market through National University System, of which we're an affiliate, uh, we did a lot of internal uh, marketing, market research, uh, including the ability to um, uh, work with the 90 or 100,000 graduates of National University System affiliates to be able to sustain uh, a Cal Bar accredited law school. We're very different than Lincoln San Jose. Our tuition is, a, is much higher. Um, I, you know, if someone is claiming that, that there's territorial rights to an area, I, I, I don't think that that would be supported by law. And in fact, competition aids consumer protection. And, um, and my, my request would be that you find that what we have done as far as the petition complies with the rules and guidelines and give us an opportunity to begin marketing the university and the law school for opening in San Jose in, in August. Um, oh, with regard to my, I went to law school in Georgia. <clears throat> yes, we've been friends since 1977. Uh, I worked at the State Bar from 2001 to 2010. I graded every California Bar examination and first year law students examination from 1982 to 2000 when I was named director for examinations. Uh, I have had Gail Murphy and I uh, went to many baseball games as we went around the country with National Conference of Bar Examiners matters. Uh, the fact that I believe the fact that I have a friendship relationship with Mr. Wallet, Mr. Leal, other folks. Uh, I don't believe creates a conflict of interest that would preclude any of the people sitting around this table to um, to determine that that you know you can't vote for or against uh, the, this major change request. Um, I I don't know if I think this is a good idea, but again. Um, uh, talk to me a little bit more about, I've read everything, talk to me a little bit about your staffing and, 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 yeah. and your resources that you're going to provide at San Jose area. One of the things that's very distinctive about the John F. Kennedy University College of Law is most CALs just have adjunct faculty and maybe one or two, I think San, San Joaquin has more uh, than two full-time faculty members. JFK has four. I'm five, and there's also two members of our legal studies program, which is the only ADA-approved legal studies program in Northern California. Uh, so the College of, of Law and the greater staff, we have six full-time uh, professors. The staffing would be, and one of them, or the, assist, the associate dean, Chris Canios, was the longtime dean of New College of, of California. And so the staffing plan, is to have a part-time administrator. Hopefully we'll have more than 30 students, in which case it'll be a full-time administrator. And um, Chris Canios, who teaches torts, he's only got 35 years of experience in teaching torts, and he's highly regarded, would be on campus from uh, once a week teaching torts. Audrey Smith 
who is a full-time professor at JFK who oversees our legal research and writing programs, graduate of Santa Clara, many, many connections in the, in the San Jose area, will be down there one, our classes are offered once a week, so Chris Canios would be down there once a week, Audrey Smith would be down there once a week, um, and uh, I would be down there once a week. Okay. I'm sorry. sorry. I, I just I think we need to start wrapping this sorry. up. We have another uh, public comment, I think, at this point. We have other agenda items that we need to get to and to go back to our appendix I discussion. So okay. I'm sorry to cut you off. No, no, that's no, that's fine. To the Thank next, you. Um, just as a, a point of reference, did, were you able to figure out if you're going to, the whole committee would be hearing this today or if that's tomorrow? I, I booked flights tonight, and I'm just, I'm just trying to. Oh, yeah. Um, we're going to talk about that in a second. Okay. Like, let's just wrap this up for now. But more to come on that. Thank you. Okay. There's another right. public comment. Yes, another well, public comment. And particularly on that point, because I did not Please. understand. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, on that point, I, I did not realize that there would, might be a follow up hearing, and I have a faculty meeting tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. So if there's going to be a full committee hearing on this issue, uh, I'll, I'll need to address that. I apologize, that's my inexperience not understanding the process. You know, um, unfortunately, um, we have not done this as well as we would like to have done. Um, I think that the um, points that were brought up earlier today um, are correct. We have not put under either the closed or the open sessions for the CBE committee as a whole to hear and ratify any of the subcommittee recommendations. So we're not going to be able to act on those at this meeting because they are not on the agenda. I apologize. You know this is our first Bagley Key meeting, and um, we're definitely learning. We promise to do better next time. But we will not be acting um, on the subcommittee recommendations because we don't have it on the agenda. And so I'm sorry, what does that mean? So whatever this committee subcommittee decides here, it, it can't ratify until March anyway? Yes. Yeah, either the next meeting or I, I, there could possibly be a decision that we have another meeting sooner, but we would be sure to give at least 10 days notice. And we do have perfect attendance today, and the rest of our uh, committee is sitting behind you. So if you're worried about any of the committee members not hearing you, Please don't worry about that. I'm also worried about somebody else being able to speak and me not being able to respond. They're still sitting behind you, so. No, I meant tomorrow. I mean, that oh. was what raised my concern. So if it's not going to be heard tomorrow, I won't worry it's, about it. We're not going to readdress this tomorrow. It's okay. Uh, well, with well, that introduction, I guess, let me introduce myself. My name is Laura Palazzolo. I've been the Dean of Lincoln Law School of San Jose since 2015. Um, this is my first time in front of the committee, so I feel a little bit David and Goliath. Um, and I'm probably going to read my comments because I know we have a very short period of time and I want to make sure that I say all the things. So I apologize that I'm not going to be making a lot of eye contact. Um, I, I want it to be understood that the relief that's being requested here is unprecedented. Um, I think Mr. Leal tried to sort of indicate that this is pretty standard procedure, but this is the first time that a CALS school has attempted to place itself in, a CALS in an existing CALS location. And you know, whether or not we can have a market conversation, which I'll get into, I want you to understand there is a difference and there's a distinction. Um, <clears throat> in the past, the committee has spent significant time trying to understand the implications of a major change request. So I was disturbed that staff spent less than 10 days considering this one and felt that a single paragraph was sufficient discussion. I think you've all heard the analogy of the frog in the pot. You know, you, put a frog in cold water and it's not going anywhere, you turn up the heat gradually and pretty soon that, that frog is cooked and didn't even see it coming. And I feel like in this case the cow beans are the pot and the committee is the frog and I'll explain what I mean by that. We just received this request last Friday. I did call Mr. Leal to discuss his um, recommendation and I was kind of taken aback by his response. What he said was his position, and he's repeated it here, was that there isn't much room for discussion because the guidelines require the committee to approve the request. And this is the first time that I've heard of a guideline that ties the committee's hands to such an extent. So I thought a review of the origins of the guidelines might be useful to see if 
you are comfortable with that outcome. My goal is for the committee to understand that while a single request is before you, this is not a one-off approval. Your decision here and the basis for it has far-reaching implications for the entire Cal system. The guidelines at issue relating to branch campuses were drafted by the Cal's deans, as has been discussed, in the context of their representation on the Rules Advisory Committee. I believe a public records request would show that either Mitch Winnick or Dean Barbieri were on the rack, rack members, at the time. Dean Winnick now has two branch campuses, Dean Barbieri is before you today, and I'm, I'm guessing that with respect to the marketing reports, it was one of those two who said, no, we don't want to have to go down that road. And, and I believe that there was a lot of discussion about how these would come about by interested deans. The guidelines say that as a branch campus, a dean need only give this committee notice of his intent to open a branch campus six months before the intended opening. The committee then has 60 days to approve or deny, and the only required finding is whether or not you believe the dean when he or she says the campus will substantially comply with the rules and guidelines when it opens. Interestingly, substantial compliance is not defined. That definition is on this year's task list for the Rules Advisory Committee, and Dean Barbieri is on that committee. So he will be crafting the language that can effectively set his standards. No proof of such substantial compliance need be presented until 30 days prior to the first day of class. By then, students would already be registered and their money paid, and also they will have forgone, foregone other options. There is no required site inspection for two years, so there is very little this committee can do to protect students in the branch campus context. Contrast that against the process a new CALS would have to go through to get accredited, which process includes pre-opening inspections, annual inspections, the requirement that the students have to take the first year law student examination until such time as accreditation is received. Also, it's not clear whether the branch campus gets grandfathered into the requesting campuses programs as well, whereas existing and new CALS are required to submit a major change request for each such program. Branch campuses, therefore, are given significant market advantages. Returning to the frog in the pot analogy, getting the guidelines approved, put the committee in the pot, and Dean Winnick then getting two branch campuses approved in cities where no CALS existed has turned up the heat. And now the heat is being turned up even more. As a one-off proposition, it might be easy to say yes to this request and a pox on all our students if the experiment goes bad. But let me explain why I think that approach is so dangerous. As I read Dean Barrieri's relatively sparse request, he says, without much factual support beyond his say-so, hey, listen, we've had some student inquiries, and it won't cost me anything to open them because National University has an existing campus, and I promise I'll eventually substantially comply with the guidelines. That's it. No market analysis, nothing. I understand Mr. Barbieri sat, Mr. Barbieri sat on this committee and has been the director and maybe that gives him some credibility, but let me remind you that he is here today with a very self-serving business interest. And because what you do for him, you will have to do for others regardless of intent. And by Mr. Leal's interpretation, without inquiry, you need to be careful. I will point out, since Mr. Barbieri had an opportunity to talk about his application, the Berkeley experiment failed at the San Jose campus, National University had a paralegal uh, a program that failed. He says he gets all kinds of transfer students from San Jose, but if you look at his 6061.7 report, he says zero transfer students last year, zero transfer students the year before, three transfer students from I don't know where the year before that. So I don't think that you just have to take his word for it. Somebody should look into that. And he's saying he's got full-time staff, but now they're going to be part-time at each campus, and one of the deans is going to be the deans of a failed uh, university. If you buy the interpretation of this committee must approve any request for branch campus without regard to its potential risk or success or failure or effect on the Cal system or any other factor solely on the dean's self-serving certification, <coughs> if you are going to take that recommendation of Dean Barbieri's longtime friend and you're going to approve the request on a proposed no-look basis, then what happens if Dean Barbieri shows up at the next committee meeting wanting to open a branch campus at all 43 of National University's other campuses up and down the state, many near or in the same city as an existing counts? 
on what basis could you deny that request if he certifies that they will substantially comply? Now the pot is boiling, can you still jump out or is the frog already cooked? This committee is charged with protecting consumers. Can you say as you sit here today that the Cal system is ready for 43 more canvases and has the budget and resources to properly regulate them? Let's take Dean Barbieri out of it and take a hypothetical one, one step further. Are you comfortable with some for-profit outfit like the Corinthian Schools or ITT Tech, both of which were WASC accredited before they failed? Are you comfortable with one of them affiliating with the Cal's and asking them to certify a request to open 100 branch campuses at all of their locations? And what if all of them went online? What would that do to the Cal's as a system, to its reputation, to your ability to protect consumers? And if you aren't willing to approve 100 branch campuses on a no-look basis, how do you allow this one? What you, what you do here sets the standard. As illustrated by this extreme example, my concern here is that we're heading down a dangerous road paved entirely by interested parties. There are no safeguards, as illustrated by Dean Barbieri's membership on the Rules Advisory Committee. The cooks are still in the kitchen. So unless you know their business plans and everyone else's, extreme caution is warranted here. As I read this, the recent Supreme Court administrative order directed at the State Bar, the State Bar is required to report the kinds of self-interested manipulations of the market that appear to be present here and cannot act until that Office of the Attorney General has opined. I contend that this committee should request such an opinion in this case. Finally, I also want to advise the committee of the conflict of interest. It's my understanding that Gail Murphy would not allow Dean Barbieri's uh, school to be reviewed by Mr. Leal, and in this case, it seems to me that Mr. Leal is advocating for Dean Barbieri's new campus that has been disclosed. So with all of that to think about, I would propose the following. One, deny the request outright on the basis that the request and recommendations simply don't include sufficient information for you to be able to approve such a substantial change. This committee has never seen a request like this and should not take it lightly. B, you can table the request for further research into the relationship between Mr. Leal and Mr. Barbieri so that you can gauge the weight that should be given the recommendation. C, you could decide to table the request pending clarification from the Office of the Attorney General on the antitrust implications, since we apparently see those from two different sides. I think there's a duty there, actually, under the administrative order, and I think the committee is prohibited from acting. D, if you choose to move forward, I request that you get some clarity on what you've allowed, on what you are allowed to base your decision on, including the required findings. Any official interpretation of the guidelines should be submitted for public comment. Also, if you choose to move forward, it is critical that we get some clarity on the breadth of the request. The request as submitted indicates that JFK wants to start with a part-time evening program, but the recommendation and the proposal and the motion don't restrict the approval to that. Again, I just caution about the antitrust implications of grandfathering in for branch campuses all the programming of the petitioning cows where new schools or existing schools in the area would need to petition this committee for each such programming addition and not on a no look basis. Finally, if you're going to move forward with this request, I would like to submit a written brief in response to the recommendation and to make that part of the record. And because we're only, and we only had a few days to put that together, I request permission to submit additional declarations and argument in support of our position. So to conclude, I just ask that you consider the implications of the decision and the interpretation of the guidelines. Consider how much weight should be given to the recommendation of staff. And since this is an unprecedented request, uh, not rubber stamp the recommendation under the circumstances of this case. Thank you. Thank you, please. Um, <coughs> FYI, um, I don't think there's too many people around this table that just rubber stamp. Um, we look at stuff. And one of my first questions was, I see nothing in writing that I need, and so you don't need our permission. You know, feel free to submit uh, what you feel you need to submit on this. Okay. Um, I have that with me here, so I'll do that. Okay. Because um, we do have some time to do that, and so we'll have some time to discuss this, uh, and, and it will have uh, some open-air discussion at our, at our next scheduled meeting as well. Uh, <coughs> th thank you for you know, your observations. George. If I can, just to clarify, and, and uh, uh, Team Hollisol is correct, um, there is an issue that DL and I discussed probably eight years ago with regard uh, to the fact that 
Gene and I have known each other for 40 years, and, and it wasn't, uh, at that time we agreed it would be inappropriate for me to take uh, the time that a full periodic inspection takes three, three days or so to go in and make a lot of subjective decisions with regard to compliance and the like. Uh, and so for both of the inspections that have been on my watch, uh, the consultants have gone to JFK as, as uh, 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 Heather Dredjakis did in September, along with uh, uh, Alice Lawrence was there as a member, a team member. Um, that does not mean, however, that I have been recused or did not participate in committee decisions and recommendations with other JFK uh, major chain requests, some larger and smaller. And so, it, I just since my integrity is being human, I, I want and would like everyone to know that uh, it hasn't been an issue before this, and no one has ever questioned. Uh, my ability other than in the context of a full blown period inspection. So um, I just like that to be known. Alex, last comment. Sure. Uh, it, it, again, on an objective basis, and because uh, as, as a member of this committee who really has no idea as to who knows who, um, is there any way to perform for our committee to identify themselves as to who has a, a relationship with, with the dean, just so that I know and take that into account as I consider this item on the agenda? I'll be the first. I have a relationship with every dean that I have. I've been to every Cal school, most of them twice. I know every single dean. And sure. I've, so. How about the, then just clarify, the relationship outside of the professional circle? Looking at the other committee members, I think, like what's been stated, none other had any relationships outside uh, professional. I think after years, you get to know this is not a big community. Uh, you know, um, we're ready to call the authorities if a certain deed doesn't show up at one of our meetings. Um, so um, we've all got to know them. You know, we just have to check and balance ourselves because uh, I know them all. And I would expect that anybody would, would check me if they thought that we weren't following uh, the same guidelines. Um, Mitch and I don't hardly agree on a lot of things other than today. Um, but we approved a major change and a plethora of other things you know, for this campus. So I, I think we just have to have a system where we check and balance each other. I should interject because we've attended a lot I've attended a lot of these meetings with the deans. I don't have personal relationships with any of them. So just so you know, I, I'm sh I, I don't know any other member aside from uh, George and Lee who has a personal relationship. But I, I, I'm, I'm certain the committee would appreciate the fact that the issue of conflict of interest, or at least the appearance thereof, is a great concern. I don't think anyone would dispute that. So I think for the record, at least, at the minimum, that we should at least identify for the benefit of the public as to who has what relationship. And this is, again, for our own benefit, because as we continue to compile the record in approving or denying this petition, I think the public really appreciates the information from this committee. So I think it's... And it might be, I think the record has been made. I think, right. and for the record, I think it has been made. I think George has indicated that he has a conflict of which per se because he has dealt with them in the past. But I think what you'll learn, uh, uh, Mr. Chan, is that as the years progress, you'll learn that the deans have an integral part of this organization. You'll learn that as a part of this particular committee, you will be working with the deans. You'll visit law schools. You'll uh, have an opportunity to speak to them with certain uh, regulations and see whether or not they're viable, whether or not uh, certain changes should be made with the law school. You have that interaction. It's incumbent that you have that type of interaction. But at the same time, you'll realize that uh, you'll have to deal with them at arm's length, just like anything else. That is not a conflict of interest, at least in our point of view. But uh, as far as anything else, I don't think from a legal standpoint, we have a conflict of interest with these individuals. What I wish you might suggest is we do have a process of governing conflicts on the discipline side our Rule 2201 process. So maybe um, we could ask the Office of General Counsel to consider drafting a kind of parallel process for um, use by the committee of our examiners, um, perhaps a modified version. Obviously, it doesn't have to be uh, reflected in state bar rules, but because I think there's some legitimacy to this concern, and we do have a parallel process on the discipline side. 
for staff, board members, et cetera, to identify their conflicts. It might make some sense to try to adopt a modified policy for the So can I get a motion? May, may I? Yeah, please, please. Less than 30 seconds? Please. Are we getting a table? Are we getting a table assembly? Yeah. Well, no, I just would like to. It's hard, actually, frankly, after 37 years of never have been the subject of a complaint in a disciplinary proceeding to have to sit here and listen to lie after lie after lie. So that's really difficult. But I want to clear up something. This campus is not going to be on one of National University's campuses. It's on John F. Kennedy University's campus in San Jose. And number two, I was not on the RAC committee when the rules and guidelines were uh, were developed. I just got on the RAC committee, and I think yesterday was either my first or second RAC meeting. Thank you. So we're going to table this item. I'm going to table it. It doesn't matter anyway. We're going to vote on it. We're going to table it. What? 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 I'm sorry. I thought that you were not going to. I thought that you were going to vote today and then send it to the it, no because this was on the this was on the agenda for today the whole committee it's not on that on that so I don't know what precludes the committee the, the subcommittee from voting on the proposal today because it's on it's on it's been properly agendized on the subcommittee yes on the subcommittee. But it sounds like, is, a, is anybody on the subcommittee ready to make a motion? Is there a motion from the committee? I was not going to make a motion on anything else yeah. moving forward because I, it's just because why? Because yeah, it's going to be on our, committee. it's going to be on our subcommittee meeting in so, March. So and we, our, if you made a motion and you approved it, it could just go on the full yes. CDE agenda for the March meeting. Uh, so no one is making a motion. Or at least no one has enough information. I think I'll agree with uh, uh, Mr. Chair. At this point, I would move the table of motion until uh, March. Uh, well, uh, there was talk of an earlier meeting. Is that even possible? Uh, should we um, at least keep that open if we do have an earlier meeting? Yeah, well, we do that. I'm trying to do that. Um, the problem is also we have the bar Oh, sorry. Hear you. So um, the challenge will be trying to find a date between now and March 23rd when we have the bar exam at the end of this month. But um, you know, we could uh, probably make that one. You know, okay. So just to be clear, though, it might be earlier, but otherwise it would be March 23rd. Exactly. Do you have a recommendation, Mr. Paul? Well, I'll second your motion to table it until our next meeting. Uh, 6.6 D uh, that limits the amount of academic credit students may be granted for work completed outside of the classroom. George, want to provide any context? Well, first, this is an annual renewal, a, a, a major change request. I'm sorry. Can you hear my This is an annual request from the law school. Um, when they get a, a waiver from the committee, they have to renew it every so every year we get an annual request and we put it on the agenda. Um, the current limitation for uh, putting credit outside the classroom is uh, eight units, um, and it's 10 percent of the 80 units it takes to earn a JD degree. And um, they, uh, San Joaquin College of Law has a very successful um, and well-regarded clinic uh, providing much-needed immigration services in the Central Valley, particularly very timely with uh, the DACA issues. And uh, so they have asked now, I think, for four years running to get an exception for the 10 unit, uh, for the eight unit restriction to go and allow them to offer up to students convert to 14 units. 
um, in working at the clinic or some other non-classroom endeavor. And as the committee has uh, each year previously, um, the recommendation is to, to grant a, a, continue, a further waiver of that limitation to allow the students in Santa Cruz to earn up to 14 units of um, credit um, outside the classroom. Mr. Taylor, I will move to accept the recommendation. I have a question now. Um, the rule you cite that authorizes the waiver refers to waivers as being temporary. Um, so this is starting to look to be a little bit more than that. So tell me about um, the consistency of this with the grant. Uh, point well taken. Uh, I guess you're right. Um, there is a question of how many years a temporary waiver is appropriate. Uh, we haven't uh, had the um, time and the inclination to, uh, and perhaps that's um, uh, our, our, my mistake, to go in and um, seek uh, an amendment to the guideline, going through the RAC process and all that, and then perhaps we'll end up the RAC agenda. Um, there's, they're the only school that's done this um, that consistently, um, and so um, I'll be frank, we have not thought about that. Uh, it's a very worthy program. Um, Certainly, in light of the waivers given that uh, the cows are getting now, and uh, and had we seen for the limitation on distance learning education, I um, I don't see much difference. But um, your point is taken, and, and I'll speak to um, Dean Brandis and, and probably with, um, the agenda because it's probably time that we allow all the cows to offer uh, more than 10% of their JD curriculum in their own classroom. We are trying to encourage people to uh, to have more hands-on training, so I don't see that as inconsistent. So I'm willing, in my mind, to interpret the temporary uh, that that word to apply to the length of the grant and um, offer a friendly amendment because it's not in the draft motion that this waiver be for a one-year period. Before we voted, I did have a comment about the motion. Yeah, no, I, I, I was gonna ask a similar question, exactly how many times can you renew the temporary um, waiver? Because the program seems good, so I was wondering if there was a mechanism for them to have a permanent like waiver, so that way, because what's the plan of having a temporary waiver over and over and over again? Well, well it, it's a, it just highlights the, um, the inadequacies of the current rules uh, that provide for these temporary waivers, and, and there just isn't anything other than what they've done. I think the guideline refers to that they need to be requested, and so it, it's, it highlights a, 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 a small but important deficiency in the current process. A school should do and has done what they, the current rules require, which is annually requested, and I think it's four years now, I think they first got it in 2014, 15, 16. So this would be the fourth year that they received, requested uh, the, the, the waiver. So uh, in response to, to the other question, um, it's, it's, it's a good point uh, that there ought to be a mechanism to make a, a waiver permanent or change the guideline and, and, and perhaps increase the number of units to 15 or 20%. And you could also add this to your um, the, uh, the goals. Okay, that's what I was yeah, going right. to yeah. because I think that we should address ways to allow students to get more hands-on experience, because I know that's a huge criticism of a lot of people coming out of law school, is that there's no actual life experience. So, a dollar to the amendment made by, uh, by Mr. Kramer, and yes, this is an excellent program. I've worked with their immigration clinic in the past. You do a wonderful job, and as well as uh, some of the other programs that they have. So you're saying, do, do we not want to table this as well then and ask staff to come back? To review the guideline? Yeah. Well, well, that won't happen quick enough. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have students that I mean, will be graduating um, in May, and it would put their, you know, the, the school technically wouldn't compliantly be able to hand them their JD after four years if that were to be the case. Uh, and yeah, and would, hello, I get it. Right. I'm thinking. And, and this being a rule, this would have to go through the formal process of it getting the board approval. So it's, it's a it's a lengthy process, and it's, it's a good one. It's just um, I, I think more appropriate to to grant it as, as uh, Mr. Kramer has indicated for one year, and then that certainly sets a time limit in between now and uh, next year. This time, uh, hopefully, we will we will have that change uh, in place. Okay. But we're also making recommendations. We're not just tabling. Is that the consensus? Take the motion. 
As I understand it, we take the motion that's in the um, the staff report, but we just add that uh, the waiver is for a one-year period. Because that's, that's what George said um, was the recommendation, but that was not actually incorporated into the motion. Right. Can I get a second? I'll second. I'll have a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Moving on to item 0406, news of changes in law school administrators. And this is just a notice uh, by uh, Abraham Lincoln University and School of Law. Uh, if I can, I'd uh, yeah. like to address this out by me. There's a typographical error. Uh, this, uh, you'll see the, it's uh, relating to uh, Abraham Lincoln University School. Uh, that should be McMillan Avenue Law. Uh, there is uh, Mr. McMillan sent notice that uh, he's now acting as a registered school. So I, I, I apologize for that, it, uh, for that confusion. So it relates to McMillan Academy Law, not Abraham Lincoln University School. And, and it's saying uh, effective as of December 11, yes. um, that Dean McMill was in the role of register of the law school. Uh, well, it, it's not an action item. It's just it's not, it, the yeah. guideline just requires notification of change of personnel. And that's what we do to more accurately off the law. Just trying to do this. Sorry. <laughs> so the last thing are the goals. And I think <coughs> Just looking at them, they seem all ongoing from the previous year, except um, we did have uh, what we just discussed looking at that guideline. What rule is that, George? To extend the rule that this big to five votes. The rule that extends a waiver. Oh, um, guideline, the guideline 6.6. 6.6. Yeah, guideline 6.6. Did that one regarding the request for a petition? Uh, rule 6.6. That's correct. That's 6.6 delta D. Oh, oh, it's a guideline. No, it's a guideline. Uh, it's 6.6. Uh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I have it here. You want to review it? No, no, no. Where? Oh, add oh, oh, I, I might add one more. I, I don't know if it falls here, um, but I think it is. We had our RAC meeting. Uh, there were some guidelines that were and a redlining of our current uh, structure of uh, RAP. Uh, and I think I need George, I think we need George to, to address that in writing and talk to the committee about and, and develop a draft. I, I believe we were, we were looking at structure for the law school council. Um, actually rules and procedures for law school council because of the recommendation that they have some kind of formal rules in place. And so that's what they were working on today. And, uh, and the idea was they were going to be revived and then uh, put in front of the entire committee once the uh, council decides that it's the way they want. Once it's revised by because I don't, I think we're stuck with the red line that we have because we don't have George to put together a, a, another version. Are you talking about the law school council? Or? Mm -hmm. Because we're essentially, it's just business, business as usual. I mean, the, the red line matters for things like um, how, how to select the numbers, how long the terms are being. Well, it went beyond that. Well, but, but either way, we still need the next version. And we left it with that version. No, we had said, I, well, if, uh, And again, if, I, just because we're. If, yeah. So you can clarify. <coughs> we're close to them. <laughs> uh, we're, I think the idea was to we'll submit it out to the assembly for additional yeah. guidelines. Then we'll bring it back to the council. Then we'll bring it back to you guys. Okay. So we're probably. Two meetings uh, from now. Away. Okay. Yeah. So George is going to have on it until one more meeting. Probably after the next meeting if okay. we get all the changes. All right. Okay. I believe that's it. Yes. Thank you. Good work. Great. <laughs> Careful what you wish for. Yes. Um, 
Process, which is pretty uh, clear in terms of this, this committee would review and then propose to the Board of Trustees, and the Board of Trustees would then review and propose to the court and then work its way through the legislature. Um, the, the thought was that that should remain as is, but there, that there would be benefit in reviewing appropriate scenarios because clearly, as has already come up a couple times today, there are, there are cases of misunderstanding um, and uh, con confusion about making decisions about certain things that may be policy without forming the board or the board going ahead and making changes where the um, committee is not understanding or aligned with what the board is recommending. So that was that proposal. And as far as financial oversight, um, there's still a lot of work that's done by the CBE um, in terms of overseeing collection of finances and that, that um, the CBE does with new fees. There was a observations that um, as the as the responsibilities have changed, that um, CBE has a lot of, gets a lot involved in a lot of financial detail and that the regulatory framework has changed so that you're not, you're no longer accountable for the admissions department in the way that you were in the past so that budget reviews by this entity are not really something that needs to be done by the entity. So the proposal there for consideration was to reallocate or delegate the financial oversight to accountable staff, so that would be the executive director and the CFO. And so there would be not be budget reviews done by the, um, the subcommittee out of financial and operations, but that would be done by the staff. You would still, however, review the fees annually and recommend to the Board of Trustees if any changes or approval. Thanks. Comments? Yeah, um, never really felt like we got into the weeds on finances. <laughs> um, and um, blissfully not aware of what some kind of operational reorganization has done to relieve us of that not tremendous burden. But also, um, there's one thing I think we speak to, and that's, or we should speak to, and that's that the fees, the amount of the fees that we are collecting from, from our constituents, or customers, whatever you want to call them, should be no more than our costs. And to the extent we are disconnected from that, I have this fear 
that um, we are going to become more of a cash cow for the rest of the operation than perhaps we are already. I'll second that. It, the history has shown that um, uh, we've managed to finance this uh, quite effectively, a, uh, that there have been no, no difficulties. Uh, we get into the weeds where it's important for public protection when we look at the applicants and their fees, which fully sustains our operation. Where we run into difficulty is where administratively uh, the bar has taken those fees, millions of dollars, uh, and, um, and given us zero accountability for where applicants' fees are going. So I'd have to, I'd have to thoroughly disagree and, and with uh, how that was presented, and I don't know where that, again, where that one's coming from. Um, but I think that's, it's, an, it's important that we're involved in that process for, for public protection. So I would just say that, I mean, that I, the idea that we're not going to be involved at all in the finances of admissions at the big picture, I think is pretty disturbing. Um, that may be decisions that it is, uh, certainly I know there's been a lot of reorganization, but obviously we do make, want to make sure that the, the fees that we charge relate directly to the services we provide to those that are applying for the bar. And that, I think, is a critical component. So um, I don't have any intention of conducting any audit of anything other uh, it's outside of what I do. But I, I would disagree. This conclusion that CBE is overly involved in financial innovation did not come from any committee. So it is not based on, as we say in the world of trial lawyers, evidence. Um, and so to a conclusion then, that we're going to not be involved at all, I think would not be an appropriate. I would be very concerned about those functions at least being taken away from us. As I said, maybe the horse is already out of the barn. We didn't know about it. I know there's been a lot of changes that really are not something that we as volunteers are privy to, but the admissions department, the monies that we're getting should go to our applicants and supporting the admission process. So that's what I would say on the subject. I, I would also add one more thing. When we, when we do get into it, I, I'll look at Greg, I, there are many times where we, uh, we're going to try and build a better uh, uh, test, whether there's a center or, or anything else. And we will try and look at financial ways that we can better serve applicants and keep those costs low. And, and no one knows it better than this committee, um, all the things that we're doing. And so the financial aspect is one way that we that we do that. And it's not excessive, but we constantly are looking for cost savings in other areas um, that are appropriate uh, and that, again, offers something better you know, for the applicant. So, okay. Yeah, I think another reason we want to have a role in this is <clears throat> we want to be able to always monitor the uh, the cost of applying and um, because we don't want uh, fees to become a barrier to entry into the profession. Right. And in fact, I, building on that point, I think there's some consideration that you might even want subsidized fees. So I'm, I'm not sure that the, the financial model of the fees are commensurate with the value delivered is the exact model you want to strive for. And further, you know, if there was, as there are in some other states, uh, a, an independent CBE with its own staff, then yes, you would have a fiduciary accountability for managing that staff to the budget that you were assigned. Um, but in this case, um, now admissions is part of the full bar, and a lot of the services that they provide to the CBE are not necessarily in that department. So you're accessing L LAP, you're accessing ARIA, and so it's not like there's a really one for one you know, cost spend of what you're overseeing to what you're, the value you're receiving. And so that's where I think that thought came from. I think that there is a policy. I mean, I don't think that the working group is suggesting that there's no policy role for you in terms of making it affordable and other issues that, you know, 
uh, enabling capabilities that might not have been put in the budget. And so I think the goal is rather than review a fiscal statement, you would be focused on the policies and the, the, the capabilities that you were providing to the, the students. So please, we have, we have four minutes left. Yeah, we have four minutes left, but I do th think that this might be one of those areas that we probably have to have more discussion and put it down as a conference. So, but I, I know, we should take a second to stop. <laughs> so, okay. three minutes on cooperation among uh, the law school deans and the, the cooperation and the, um, the Jewish judiciary. So, um, the, the law school council should facilitate, uh, obviously, the relationship between the law school deans broadly and the um, and the CBE, and that there's there are still some ad hoc meetings between. Um, or trustee members, staff, and judiciary that allow to that help create alignment and help create understanding. And actually, may have just seen some of that, both understanding and perhaps misunderstanding. Um, so there, there was uh, I, it was unclear whether there was consistent or sufficient engagement with the law school council, whether they were always as fully informed. And like looking at last year, there were some critical incidents where it seemed that there, there might have been better engagement with the full set of law school deans, if not just the law school council. Um, and then there's not necessarily consistent communication, um, so that that could, that could um, undermine a lot of action. And then um, there was some question about the overlap and redundancy between LSC and Iraq. So uh, there were a variety of suggestions for consideration, um, including an annual meeting of all parties, not just LSC and RAC, but also inviting all law school teams. Um, to do a work study with the deans and the LSD to try to design a robust partnership and the idea of maybe a pilot year of changing up some of the relationships so that you can learn how to create more um, alignment and understanding with the LSD as well as the broader group. Um, and institutionalized points when all law school deans can weigh in on um, those key issues that they uh, want to engage interest early on to avoid like duplicating some of the current dynamics. I have to do a webcast with a call for public comments. Um, there was a at admissions day, as it was just cited, and there was a thought that maybe that could be extended and um, shared with the law school deans. Um, and so I wanted to ask uh, Mitch and Greg how they, they thought that would, uh, whether that would be useful to the law school deans. Um, and that there is a committee being formed to discuss the bar exam review, and they're going to engage the deans and oversee the job analysis, and that's going to be reviewed at the planning committee planning meeting. Um, so, and that, that will be also, I think, reported to this group ultimately. Um, and the, um, there's a pending study on, uh, there's, the, the idea was to try to understand why there is both an LSC and an RIC, and whether there's any benefit or value to contribute combining them. Sorry, Anna. Uh, I think, first of all, we kind of do have one of those annual meetings. It's the law school yeah. assembly, which mm -hmm. we're going to be having um, June, June 21st. Um, and, and as far as the RAC and the LSC are concerned, I did consult with some of our more senior members of RAC, and it appears that the LSC was created because of um, a, a change that the committee had implemented without any consultation with the law schools and it caused a big problem and therefore they had legislatively, they had it they, uh, created that they would have a say and that is the um, LSC. LSC includes both private and public uh, ADA schools, as well as the CALs. But the, the CALs are then over, they're overrided, they're overridden by the ADA schools. So the RAC was created so that the CALs could by themselves, since they also have different rules and different uh, concerns, that they could that the, address those matters in their own group. That's that's what I uh, understand anyway. Well, perhaps I just find a little detail. Uh, historically, the LSC, the Law School Council, it, it, it was um, it came into existence uh, with regard, as Eric mentioned, over issues relating to the bar exam. And it's, it's been historically uh, more focused, if not exclusively focused, on the bar content, uh, 
and and now we operate where it changes the bar. There needs to be a two-year notice period. So the focus was very different. It was uh, to all law schools operating in California, ABA approved, Carol Credit, and the undergraduate schools. Um, it's starting to change a little with regard to what it's talking about and, and making recommendations, but um, that's a, a fairly, I mean, been involved with this process for these eight years, so this is new to me that the LSC has gotten as active and as organized, and, and it appears it will continue to go down that road. Uh, the RAC is very different in the sense that um, it has nothing to do with the bar exam. Um, it has everything to do with the committee's role as an accreditor of the Cal accredited schools, and so we have rules and guidelines, which are right here, and it's a very um, it has worked out well. Um, to act as a uh, uh, sounding board and as a mechanism um, to bring changes to the rules and guidelines related to accreditation. So there's very different matters. There's some crossover with regards to some issues, uh, but that's that's the the purpose and uh, and the goal uh, and the benefit of it. Thank you, George. Um, Jeff, you have a question. Uh, this uh, working group is in fact a work in progress. We have a lot, a long ways to go. So um, all of you should have my email address, Erica's, as well as Larry Kaplan. When you live here, you're probably going to think about certain questions you should have asked, or perhaps during the week, and you're probably going to think of certain questions that you might have. <coughs> if you don't have anything else to do, you probably want to go over this. So um, if you if you have a get some time and uh, we want to go over this uh, list that we've gone over the, throughout the day. Just uh, go ahead and send us some questions. If you have any concerns, go ahead and email them to us. And, we, and, and we'll go ahead and convey that to Elisa and Amy uh, during the course of our meetings. And uh, we, 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 this is, like I said, a work in progress. And we do want to convey all of your concerns. And we want to make sure that the end product ends up being a part of what we all intended as a group. Thanks. And if there does end up being informal conferences where there's a lot of really detailed discussion and you want to be a part of it, please let us know because we'll, we, we want to make sure that everybody's opinion is heard. And I, and I think that might help to have, you know, a little bit more open transparency on this process as we try and do that all over the place. Um, and if we can get this more than the day before, you know, and, and it, it will end up being more thoughtful discussion and, and then others with different agendas will, I think, make your life easier as you, so you don't kind of get broadside, you know, the day of. You, you know, though, I, I think, though, I, we, a lot of us have talked prior to this, and I think a lot of the, the concerns that many of us have had, we have conveyed them to uh, uh, Elise and Amy and everybody else, and, and I personally thought that this meeting was going to last two to three, maybe four hours. So I was kind of shocked that it didn't last as long as it did. So that shows that, that we are, in fact, conveying some of the uh, concerns that we had in the beginning. So we are working, and, and I would appreciate it if there are some questions that you folks have so that we can continue this work and we can work towards a positive uh, uh, end game. And to work real quick, um, what we'll do is update this with a lot of the comments that were made, so different perspectives. So not all the bullet points will necessarily agree with each other because the person might have one perspective that you'll see reflected in a different one. But that will be helpful in the ultimate item because you'll be able to reflect the, kind of the perspectives considered and um, the, uh, trail the logic for the ultimate recommendation. But I think that was a wonderful summary, and with that, I think <laughs> call it. Call it so we will adjourn at uh, 5.20, and tomorrow we're uh, resuming at 9 a.m. We'll see you all tomorrow. Good meeting. Very good. We got one item on moral character. If we want to cover that or not cover that. Not tonight. Not tonight. Not tonight. Not tonight. Not tonight. Not tonight.